Soundcheck two, planning committee meeting, January 17th, soundcheck two.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the City of Hamilton Planning Committee. Today is January the 17th, 2023. I'm your chair, Maureen Wilson. You're stuck with me for the day. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and archived on the City's website. And the presentations and reports considered at this meeting are available on the City's website and that members of the public can contact the clerk's office to acquire documents in a different form. A reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function. Members of committee are reminded of the five limit time uh, of the five minute time limit, which will be adhered to. Members of the public have five minutes to address the committee. Um, also, if my, I could ask members of staff who are speaking today, if you could kindly introduce yourself in advance of um, your speaking time. Uh, today, the planning committee is being run as a hybrid meeting, councillors councillors who are attending in person, and there are some attending virtually, I, I believe. I'm going to um, do a roll call. I recognize Councillor Beatty, Councillor Kassar, Councillor Clark, Councillor Danko, Councillor Francis, Councillor Wang, Councillor Kretsch, Councillor Nan, Councillor Spadafora, Councillor Tattison, and Councillor Alex Wilson. And joining us virtually, beg your pardon, is Councillor Esther Pauls. Thank you. Uh, in the circle today, helping me do the heavy lifting is LC, which stands for Legislative Coordinator, Lisa Kelsey, and uh, assisting her is LC Tamara Bates. Thank you, one and all. Uh, LC, Kelsey, are there any changes to today's agenda? Yes, Chair Wilson, there are changes. Under delegation requests, we have added requests. Uh, well, first uh, item number four has been withdrawn, Lily Jones. And then we have added requests from Kwasi Obeng, Cliff Lloyd, Nora McIntyre, Hamza Patel, Ben Obirota, Adam Wayland with the Ontario Short-Term Rental Host Association, Brian and Natasha DeFrancesco, John Thistlewaite, Bob Tyrell, Scott Ramsey, Melina Trindale, Sally Lloyd, James Buren, Emily Power, Kevin Marksey, Andrew Robertson, Shannon Roberts, and Samira Prema Talaik. Under public hearings for the amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw and draft plan of subdivision for lands at 15 Ridgeview Drive, Stony Creek, we have an added written submission from Ravo Ukuivi. Under discussion items for the licensing short-term rental accommodations, item 11.1, .1, we have added written submissions from Lou Piriano with the Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington, Stephen Deviser, Mark Crikey, Gabrielle Marchez, Hamza Patel, Omo Asosa Igbor, Ryan Adlam, Shailene Ritchie, Kirby Wilkins, Alex Poliakov, Matthew Farrow, Adam Oldfield, Paul Bellavia, Holly Jesperson, Jillian Fletcher, Brian DeFrancesco, Monica Fox, Scott Ramsey, Connie Kidd, Tani Deramolo, Lynn Mackey, Kale McKenna, Mark Westman, Samira Prematalake, and Helene LeDuceur. Under notices of motion, added 13.1 demolition permit for 820 Rymel Road East. And two private and confidential items, 15.1 appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal for lack of decision on zoning bylaw amendment for lands at 1019 Wilson Street East. And item 15.2 appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal for official plan and zoning bylaw amendments for lands located at 405 James Street North. So just a few changes, thank you. Moved by Councillor Danko and seconded by Councillor Wang that the agenda be approved as amended. Any discussion on the changed agenda? Councillor Danko. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Just before we approve the agenda, I, I noticed that there's a number of associations, the Realtors Association, Short-Term Rentals Association. I've been receiving emails from Airbnb directly and a number of uh, uh, delegate requests and written communications for people that uh, may not live in the ward which they're um, um, advocating for changes for policy for. So could I just get an overview of the lobbyist policy for the city of Hamilton and how that m has any impact on today's uh, deliberation? Thank you. I'm going to look to Elsie Kelsey to walk us through. This is a good, um, it's a good overview for the start of a new council as well. Would you be able to take that on or should I uh, 
It is not my area of expertise. I did have a, a look at it yesterday and forwarded it on to the staff member who takes care of the lobbyist uh, register for more information, which I have not received back. I feel the the direct contact with counselors is beyond me that that would go to the, the lobbyist register staff, but in terms of them being here as public delegations, uh, I feel that's entirely appropriate. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering if I could, uh, with your, your indulgence, if perhaps this is something for a notation for a future meeting um, that we can have that staff person come and present and provide that overview. And I'm wondering, Councillor Danko, if in the meantime, if you wish to secure the assurance from these individuals, whether they have in fact registered, but I'll leave that in your hands to speak to it. I think it more applies to the, the behind the scenes lobbying. This is a public meeting and they have a right to be here and to delegate. So I don't have a problem with that, but I just think in future, uh, that's something that we as a committee, um, as a whole, I think need to uh, be consider a little closer. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments on the um, agenda that has been amended? It's been duly moved and seconded. If you could vote on it, please. Councillor Pauls, are you able to vote? Yep, I see a thumbs up. That vote carries 12 to nothing. Members of committee, are there any declarations of interest this morning? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, may I have a mover and a seconder to approve the minutes of the November 29th meeting, moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Kazar. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none. The vote is up. Councillor Pauls has given a thumbs up. Thank you, that carries 12 to nothing. Um, as Elsie Kelsey uh, read out a long list of, of delegate requests today, may I have a mover and a seconder to approve these dele a delegate delegation requests for the dates that are provided, moved by Councillor Denko and seconded by Councillor Wang. Any discussion? Sorry. And just that, that we are approving 6.1 and there's also as item 6.2 that we're approving for the January 31st. Oh, thank uh, you. Frank Lennon Lenarduzzi respecting expansion of permitted uses for P4 zoning. Oh, thank you very much for the catch. Uh, Councillor Danko and Councillor Wayne. The vote is up. Carries 12 nothing. Thank you, members. Uh, we're on to 6.1 on your agenda, delegation requests respecting short-term rental licensing, which is item 11.1 on your agenda. Um, to our members and to those who are watching, uh, we will be watching the pre-recorded videos after all the in-person delegations have had their opportunity to speak. So in that order, uh, if I could call on, is it my apologies in advance to everyone, if I pronounce your name incorrectly, Laura Cousin, Cousin, Laura, would you like to come down to the, the podium and introduce yourself? <laughs> Thank you. And just a reminder again, we have a five minute time limit. And questions, if you have a question of the delegate is to seek clarification, it is not to debate. Thank you. So just here. I'm Laura Cusen. I If you could put the microphone right. Sure. Thank you very much. Sorry. No I'm Laura Cusen. I operate a short-term rental in Hamilton up on the mountain. Uh, it's in the basement of my home. And I understand that that's one of the um, 
like part of the new rules that could be passed that basements may no longer be op an option for short-term rentals. So here's my story. First, thank you for the opportunity to speak today as well. <clears throat> I definitely overpaid for my little house on the mountain. I'm sure you've all heard similar stories. The housing market has gone crazy, interest rates are climbing, and we are paying for the excess spending that happened during the pandemic. All of us are going to struggle financially over the next little while. While I appreciate and support the need for licensing to ensure safety and fire regulations are met, I can't help but question if the stricter, regula rec sorry, stricter regulations are the right choice for Hamilton. None of the cities who have implemented rules like nightcaps or not allowing secondary suites to be run as an STR have solved their affordable housing crisis. In fact, those changes haven't made a dent and some of those restrictions have been in place for more than two years. I've read the reasons why experts think that SDR is affecting housing affordability, and that may be true, but it seems like the solution is one of those situations where the idea sounds great in theory, but fails in execution. I know a lot of work went into the study in 2018 uh, about this situation, but we're now in 2023 and the results are in. Those restrictions didn't work. I implore you to consider and investigate more before deciding to take income away from Hamilton homeowners who are responsibly operating their STRs. Uh, because what if you go forward with these restrictions and you do take away that income from homeowners like me who need it to survive and you still don't solve the housing crisis? Now you have a few more hundred families in Hamilton that were doing okay, that will no longer do okay. And the people who need affordable housing might have increased instead of decreased. I ask again, please take a very close look at those cities who've imp implemented the strict regulations. Let's also consider the people who are staying in short-term rentals. What is the plan to accommodate them when the inventory is reduced? They're the single women who are leaving an abusive relationship and need somewhere to stay for six months while they put their life back together. That was my first guest. What about the people who are having their house rebuilt and construction is taking much longer than planned? Where else can they go with their two dogs that need a backyard to run in for at least six months? That's my current guest. I could go on and on with more examples, but if you drastically cut back the number of SDRs that are, allowed, that are allowed to operate, which are currently mostly occupied, where will these people with nowhere to live go? Are these temporarily displaced people any less important to the city than those who need affordable housing? What about the homeowners who are now forced to become landlords because they can't afford to take such a drastic income cut? Can they afford to make renovations or whatever other changes might be required to make sure they're following long-term rental rules and stipulations? What do they do when their tenant can no longer pay rent because they lost their job or contracted an illness or to depression and they can't work? They now have to navigate the court system, which is completely bogged down, pay a lawyer, and they're not getting that rental income anymore. A situation like that could cripple someone like me, who is a single woman on a single income, and I need that STR income to live. The thought of being a landlord and taking that kind of risk, frankly, terrifies me. Let's focus on the positives. These temporarily displaced people are spending a lot of money in the Hamilton economy, local shops and restaurants. Do we really wanna take that money away from the economy? Regardless of the positives, I understand the city still has a housing crisis to solve, and it seems like inventory and pricing are the main issues. What about running an, educa an education campaign that helps homeowners understand the benefits of having a long-term rental? Imagine how much inventory is out there that isn't being offered because they don't know what the benefits are or don't even realize it's an op opportunity. You could even convince some short-term operators to switch over. Maybe there's a tax incentive that could be offered. After all, you attract more flies with honey than vinegar. What about working with the apartment management companies and subsidizing more buildings? There are so many other options to consider that could solve this problem and don't involve taking income away from responsible SDR operators. I think the reason for allowing STRs to operate under a license are clear and justified, but are we sure that the other stricter restrictions uh, 
are going to make a change for the positive. Because if you're not sure, many Hamilton homeowners are going to have much more difficult lives in the future. Thank you. Beg your, beg your pardon. Are there any questions for the delegate? Um, if the delegate could return to the mic, uh, I, I forgot to notify you that, that there might be questions of clarification. Thank you. My apologies. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nan. Sorry to make you go up the stairs. And no, back no, no, my no. apologies through the chair. Uh, thank you for coming in to delegate. I just have one question, sure. for, and then I'll be asking the same question to anyone who's currently running an STR. Um, in terms of your um, your current unit, was it at any time used as a monthly rental? No, I actually bought my house with the intention of operating an STR. So you, you solely created the unit yes. in your home to operate as STR. Yeah. Thank you. That's my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nan. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you again for your time. Um, just so uh, I don't interrupt the delegates, I'll, I'll try and uh, wave my hand when you have one minute left um, in your five minute delegation. Thank you. Up next, we have Kaylee Stevenson. Oh, that's virtual, beg your pardon. Mark Crickle. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Kaylee Stevenson, are you with us? Virtually. I'm calling on uh, Delegate Kaylee Stevenson. This is the Planning Committee, and it's your turn to delegate. Are you with us today at this time? I don't see, so perhaps we could move on. Yep. If you're listening or having some challenges joining us, we'll we'll come back to you. Mark Crickle, Crick, beg your pardon. Good morning. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Just going to uh, start the uh, clock here. Be hard to limit myself to five minutes, but thank you, uh, staff and councillors, for uh, for the work you've done and for your attention in this matter, um, and just for the work that you generally do keeping the city running. No, it's not always uh, easy, especially when you have citizens coming after you with pitchforks. Um, I left my pitchfork in the hall today, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, I have a written submission as well, which uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read. I'm not going to rehash that because you know it's written; you can read it. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few key points. Um, quick introduction myself. So along with my wife, um, uh, we, sorry, we live in Hamilton. My wife, Kirsten, and I, we have lived, I've lived here for probably 25 years or so. Um, I love this city. I've played Australian rules football with the Hamilton Wildcats since about 95. I don't anymore because I'm getting too old, but uh, up in Tom Jackson's ward at uh, Mohawk Sports Park. I attend church at Mercy Christian Church in uh, McQueston. We minister to the community there. So, um, and yeah, we're raising four young children in the city So, uh, who attend school here. So we have a heart for the city. We love it. We are short-term rental operators as well, which I know may seem contradictory, but... Um, but we do, uh, we do enjoy the hospitality that short-term rentals uh, offer. So uh, we've probably operated since 2014 out of our basement. We don't anymore because of our growing family. Um, but we do actually operate a business. You know, spare me the pitchforks this time. But we do manage uh, short-term rentals for other people in the city. So just have a few, um, a few notes. And um, I know one of the... The issues around short-term rentals is affordable housing. So my submission to you, and this is also echoed in my written submission, is that there's a lot of large macroeconomic forces at play that are causing the affordability uh, issue and that short-term rentals really don't play into that so much. I'm not saying that there's zero effect, but very little. So if we look at um, cheap and easy credit that's happened for the last at least decade, has uh, really contributed to the commoditization of housing. And we've seen 
not just small landlords anymore, but uh, also larger companies like BlackRock, Canada Pension Plan even, is investing in single family housing. So this is an issue, and I realize this is beyond your control, but this is a, a large issue that is causing issues with affordability. Uh, two and a half minutes, I gotta, I gotta move on here. Uh, we've got international students, uh, which is unaccounted for in most planning, something I would encourage you as well. Um, let's get a handle on where they're staying, where they're living. Um, talk about tourism benefits. So uh, in, in my report, we talked about Norfolk County has done a, uh, done a study which I referenced. They estimate overnight visitors contribute about $151 per day uh, to the local economy. So if you multiply that by, I just picked 500 stays per day, a conservative number, roughly $30 million in economic benefit to the city of Hamilton. Let's not throw that out. I think we can work together um, to, to do things for the benefit of Hamilton. I know we need housing, but we also need tourism. We need economic engines in the city and short-term rentals can and are uh, be one of those. We've talked about um, the Toronto experiment, which is, uh, from what I understand, the, um, the report is largely based on Toronto um, policies. And uh, I'm sure you're going to hear this more, but we feel that really hasn't worked. The number of SDRs in, in Toronto is almost at 2017 levels. So they haven't diminished the number of short-term rentals and housing is not uh, also not as affordable. Um, just a quick note on, on long-term rentals. I talked to a lot of landlords who simply don't want to do long-term rentals anymore because the LTV, Landlord Tenant Board, is effectively broken. It takes up to a year just to get a hearing. All right, we've got a minute left. Um, so it's, it's, you know, short-term rentals are, are appealing. So I have a couple suggestions that we could look at that other municipalities across North America have done. So license STRs, if you did, um, let's say we have 1,000 listings at $100 a year, that's $100,000 of income. Multiply that however you want. Um, ban one-night stays if you want to avoid the parties. Hotel will be happy with that as well. Most short-term rental operators do not want to do one-night stays either. Um, and possibly look at, you know, not a fan of this, but you could look at capping short-term rentals in the city. A lot of cities do this. And they say we'll have a maximum of X amount. Once we reach that amount, until there's turnover, there's no more um, short-term rentals and uh, manage it that way. So thank you for the time today. I wish I had more time, but um, open to any questions you may have. Thank you. Great timing. I uh, appreciate you joining us this morning. Are there any questions of the delegate? Uh, I see Councillor Pauls, please. She's just right behind you in case you're... Hi, thank you for coming in. Um, I was wondering, you said you do not have short-term rental. You help others have them? Are you a manager or something? Or I'm, did I misunderstand? You used to have them, but not now. Yeah, so we, we had three units. We've uh, we've stopped uh, renting our basement out. I don't know where I should look. Over there, hopefully. <laughs> um, and we just recently sold a, uh, a unit that had two, uh, or a house that had two units in it. So yes, we do manage for other people exclusively uh, in the Hamilton area. And can I ask you, do you have quite a few that you manage? No, so uh, about half a dozen. We also do long-term rentals, but... Um, you know, for the purposes of this uh, meeting, we got uh, about six in the Hamilton area. Your questions through the chair, please. Through the, oh, sorry, through the chair. <laughs> Thank you. That's all I needed to know. Thank you, chair. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call for Kaylee Stevenson once more. Kaylee Stevenson, virtually. Okay. Cliff Lloyd. Bear with me, I just had both knees replaced six months ago. So, if I'm a little slow, I apologize. Not at all, thank you for um, I run an Airbnb, and unfortunately, my history is, my background is in history, and I've had the advantage of growing up in an academic family. I have stayed in short-term rentals significant portions of my life. 
The academic profession has historically used short-term rentals and houses to house professors who are visiting, graduate students who have no residence, students who are there for a semester, people who are interned. All of these people have been in short-term housing for a significant amount of time. I would note that during the Second World War, they billeted, again, short-term rentals. So what has changed? Airbnb exists. Airbnb has opened an opportunity that I had the advantage of having as a young man. We could find places to live and find places to vacation because we had a large social network. Now everyone can. If you restrict short-term rental, I seriously doubt you will impact the network that exists within academia and within medical profession, because that is all off book. That will be through contacts, it will be through friends. It will essentially be unenforceable. So what has Airbnb done? It has opened it up to the public. It has made it safer because there's accountability. There's a way of tracking. You can get reports on the people. There is a transparency within the system which has made it safer for everyone involved. It has allowed people who, as my guest earlier speaker said, are facing housing crisis, which we are now going to see in excess, generate income from their homes. I would suggest, as my family did after a divorce and had trouble with housing, we rented to students. When I acquired my house, it is a large house. And I knew 20 years ago that I could rent to students and afford to pay for it. This is an advantage that is now available to all. This is an advantage that can save families' homes. This is an advantage that does not impact noise because they are within your house. You police them, you have a network. Our Airbnb has gotten Ratings, again, it is within my house. They have to go through my house. They associate with me. I've had people come to me after staying at Airbnb and say, you know, I come from a city, I think it was London, where we are called the city of forests. You should be called the city of forests. We are not. I have had people come from Boston and Washington, D.C. and tell me they prefer this city to theirs because of the advantages we offer and the exposure we can get and the contacts they can have. You would preclude this. You would stop this. You would say 28 days, the good day, it actually means that after under 30 days, everybody's going to be paying GST and PST. Over 30 days, they won't. They will move. They will have restrictions. It will be more inefficient. People will go off book. It'll be harder to track. It will be more dangerous. It'll be harder to police. I do not see the advantage of forcing individuals to act outside a framework which benefits all. We'll say there are noise issues. I live across the street from a 500 unit apartment building. I live in a house. Shall we discuss noise issues? I have more noise coming from them every day, every minute, than ever came from my house. So, we'll then discuss affordable housing. I live in a house where I cannot rent the apartments. I have rooms that are within my house. There is an apartment within my house. You go through my office upstairs. That will be withdrawn from the market. I am not the only one who will be drawing things from the market. Your availability will decrease or, again, go off book. So, I would suggest that the appropriate thing for the city to do would be to perhaps encourage Airbnb, help people with assistance, train them. And if you say this is not an issue, I took the liberty of looking it up this morning. There are 60,000 university students between McMaster and Mohawk. There are accommodations for 3,400 of them. That leaves a shortfall of in excess of 50,000 people. Where will they go? I 
I read a newspaper article saying Airbnb gentrifies. I would point out the alternative to Airbnb is not rental accommodations. It is hotels. Delegate Lloyd, um, your five minutes are up. Are you? Sorry. If I can just finish this. Your alternatives are hotels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of the delegate? Seeing none, thank you for sharing. Oh, I'm, I beg your pardon. I'm continuing to miss Councillor Pauls. I apologize, Councillor Pauls. No problem. And through the chair, I was very intrigued uh, in your talk this morning, uh, especially when you said that people would rather come to Hamilton than other places. And um, your thought with these people coming in for short term rentals, uh, would that help our business people and the surrounding uh, uh, for economics of the city of Hamilton? Let me put it to you this way. People who have come to visit me have actually specifically stated they will come back because of their visits here. And they eat out, they go out. I point out that I'm within a five block walk of Lock Street. They can walk down Tays. Fair number of them shop at Nations. Mm -hmm. They go to the theater. I. As a note, I am also the chair of the Board of the Hamilton Conservatory of Arts. Some of the people who come and stay, a dance theater correction, some of these people who come and stay, in fact, are opera singers who come and stay and take our reputation around the world. And we wish to preclude them. What sort of, we spend fortunes on tourism. What are we doing? We have a tourist board. I'm sorry, I prophesize and I do apologize. <laughs> it's it, it sounds fantastic. I actually was thinking about with the LRT uh, LRT coming as well. Uh, it really uh, promotes uh, economics, promote people coming to Hamilton. We are known to be a great city, and I agree with you, uh, Holston. So thank you for uh, bringing those points up. Can I actually add to that? Sure. Not only... uh, through the chair, through the chair, yeah, if that's okay. Make, just make sure that um, when we're engaged with the delegate, uh, we have, we're asking questions. Thank okay. You. If I could add to her comment, I would note that people choose to come here rather than go to Toronto, given our location, given the ease of access. I have had people prefer Hamilton. And yet, again, this is something we want to stop. If you can, I'm sorry. Thank you, delegate. And thank no. you. Thank you, chair. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I see no further questions. Thank you. I can call on Delegate Nora McIntyre. Delegate Nora McIntyre. Oh. Just a reminder that, uh, good morning. Uh, we have five minutes for your delegation. I'll put my hand up when you have one minute remainder, just a remi reminder. And there is a belt. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'm a resident of Hamilton and chose to retire to the Hamilton Beach about 12 years ago. Uh, I chose this community because it indeed is a community. It's a community that I feel safe in. It's a community that supports each other. I. Uh, I have, uh, as a retiree, chosen to renovate a suite in my room, in my home, and operate this on the main floor of my home. I, too, get guests that are coming from Hamilton because they're temporarily out of their own homes for renovation purposes. They're going through a transition through their divorce. Um, they're looking to buy a new home and I offer them that opportunity. I never have more than two people stay in my residence. I've never had any issues with my neighbors complaining about noise. Obviously, these people are in my home. I operate also through Airbnb, and the reason I do that is for security. All guests are screened through Airbnb, excuse me, <clears throat> and and I know for a fact that if, I, if they don't pay through Airbnb, Airbnb will compensate me. I had an experience um, about five years ago where I rented to someone who, who found me on Airbnb for a month. 
and uh, they rented for a month and I was in Europe and they wanted to rent for the entire school year for their children. So I agreed, created a lease agreement with them and they promptly stopped paying me. So for seven months, I didn't get paid. Airbnb does not allow that to happen. Um, so I do feel a sense of security and all of that. As a retiree, and I was called last night by another a retiree who said, are you going to speak? Because we need to, someone to speak out for us. We have a, an income that's reliant on perhaps investments or a pension that isn't keeping up with inflation. And we rely on this additional income to assure that we can um, ex have expenses for overheads. I have a $2,900 front window going in in this month. Um, where would that money come from? It comes from me being able to rent that space. So I, I encourage um, the council to consider that Airbnbs are a supplement to retirees' incomes, <clears throat> excuse me, and to not restrict the numbers of days that one would be able to rent. It, the current recommendation would mean that I could have two months of rental, as I understood it, and there's 12 months in the year. So clearly I would be dropping my income considerably for that time frame. That being said, I know this will be a controversial statement on my part, but I have an Airbnb next door to me, and I have one two doors down from that that have sprung up over COVID. I have another house across the street from me that remains empty and has been for over 10 years that is being sat on by investors. The beach is, is an area that does attract tourists, and increasingly so with the recreation trail, with its proximity to Niagara and Toronto, it's ideal. But my problem is that the homes that have been recently sold and renovated for the purposes of Airbnbs house 12 to 14 people. And that's a different environment altogether than the ones that we've been talking about in, in, within people's homes. Now we have people that are taking up large homes, purchasing large homes for the sole purpose of investment, having people come there on the weekends and sometimes through the week who are there strictly for enjoyment. I get that. I have balls bouncing into my, my own yard from multiple layers of families that are coming because they can house them in these large groups. But the, the problem is, is that they don't go down to the beach and pick up the garbage. They're not the ones that you know are your neighbors, and they're not the ones that you can rely on if you have a problem, if you have trouble on your street. They're not the ones you see walking by regularly. They're total strangers, and that makes me feel at risk. So I know that's a controversial statement for those of you who are investors, and I appreciate that you choose to have investments, but for me as a neighbor, it's just it, dysfunctional and I'm losing my community, I'm losing my sense of community, and um, I don't support the oversized Airbnbs that can accommodate that many people. So I appreciate the time you gave me to speak today, and thank you for your considerations. Thank you for joining us. If you could stay at the mic, just in the event there, there are questions. Um, any questions? I'll recognize Councillor Pauls, then Councillor Francis. Just a reminder, uh, your ta exchange with the delegates, please keep it to questions. Thank you. And thank you. And just one quick question, and through the chair, um, you said something about your neighbors. They're oversized and they're causing problems. Uh, have you ever reported them? No, they're, they're not a noise level that one would say they're partying. They're just, if you put 12 people in a backyard, there's noise. Um, I had a group of uh, construction workers there in the summer. There were at least 10 men. As a single woman walking up to my deck in my bathing suit, I felt a little uncomfortable. I don't know these people. Um, so it's just the size of the groups, and it doesn't matter who it is. If you have 12 people together, having conversation or playing games in the backyard, it's noise. And again, I ask because, um, you know, how do we manage that? People are complaining about these ARMB and uh, the short-term rental. So if you do not um, report it, then other people get upset and that's where we're at this stage. So um, 
I know you said it, it you know you didn't but uh, that's the problem is trying to find Counselor? how to manage it we'll keep so, our comments you. Uh, when thank we get you. to the report thank you thank you Councillor Francis Thank you, and uh, through the chair, thank you for coming out today and uh, articulating. I mean, this is particularly particularly important to the Hamilton Beach community because, I mean, it's it's a beach. It's it's become a, a uh, kind of a, a target for these short term rentals. Um, just a question: You moved in um, twelve years ago. You said, could you tell me twelve years ago how many of your neighbors had these short term rentals as compared to today? None of my neighbors that I was aware of were um, buying for the sole purpose of using that property for an Airbnb. This is a, a new phenomena for these large homes. I mean, Airbnbs go back a long ways. I've traveled and used Airbnbs f extensively, but it's usually within someone's apartment or home. And so you're looking at two people staying there, maybe a family of four, but not typically having large groups of 12, 14 people. Thanks. And, um... and if I might add, I mean, these are homes that are no longer available for someone to come along and purchase as a family. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, could you just touch on uh, or elaborate on the part too where you, you talked about, um, you know, the type of community that Hamilton Beach is now becoming. Do you, could you elaborate on that for us, please, through the chair? Well, I think we only have to look to Niagara-on-the-Lake to see um, that we have many homes there. Almost every other home has turned into an Airbnb. Is that the vision we have for the Hamilton Beach, that it's a strip of Airbnbs? Because literally in the last three, four years, I've seen homes purchased, renovated for the sole purpose of running them as Airbnbs. So it's changing the nature of the community, as I said, and changing my neighborhood. I no longer have neighbor, neighbors that I can rely upon. And uh, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but how many of these neighbors that are, are, are taking up these places are actually living in these places as their primary residence? How many of those would you say? None of them. None of them. None of them. And in fact, the investor who purchased the property next to me doesn't even live within the city of Hamilton. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you coming out. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to finding a solution for not only the Hamilton Beach community, uh, which is greatly impacted by this, but the uh, city of Hamilton. Thank you. One more question of you, Delegate McIntyre. Councillor Nam. Thank you. Nope. Uh, through you, Chair, no, I withdraw the last question that I had and had Councillor Francis already covered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. We have an in-person delegation, in Councillor, or uh, Delegate Hamza Patel. Patel, are you present here today? You're here, but you're not speaking, so you're withdrawing your delegation. Thank you. It's been withdrawn. Um, we have a delegate, Ben Ober Oberota. Virtually, are you with us, delegate? Okay, we'll, we'll return. Um, In-person delegation in the form of Adam Whalen from the Ontario Short-Term Rental Hosts Association. I'm present. I'm actually doing a virtual. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I represent hosts from every corner of Ontario. We're a passionate group of hosts who want to show the real story of short-term rental accommodations, the real story of improving the fabric of communities and sharing our love for the cities, towns and regions we all call home. First, I want to ask this committee and in turn your fellow uh, council members who will vote to implement these overreaching regulations. Have you done your due diligence? Do you know the source and details of the data these decisions and recommendations have been concluded from? Have you explored the economic impacts these regulations will have on your citizens and local businesses? Do you agree that this is the best set of regulations that could be made? I would argue that you have doubts in more than one area. I would also point out municipalities that have enacted strict and overreaching regulations are now 12 months into these regulations revisiting or lacking enforcement and need to take a closer look. 
London, for example, directors of businesses, investors, business owners, and local business, small business owners are now speaking out to city council about the lack of housing flexibility, the decrease in customers being referred to their small businesses by short-term rent rental accommodations, and small landlords and investors who've spent their own money and time to redevelop their properties, only to be backdoor expropriated without any form of compensation. Is this a made in Hamilton set of regulations or a rubber stamp of something else from elsewhere for problems that aren't in Hamilton? Housing and rent affordability is a key driver uh, for these regulations based on my knowledge and research. Have you consulted other municipal partners to see if the outcomes desired have been achieved in their attempt to over-regulating over short-term rental accommodations? In our association, there are many small landlords who have just a handful of properties or one additional property. Over 80% of those landlords have a mix of short and long-term spaces. There are many reasons for this, primarily to insulate themselves from the landlord tenant board and non-paying tenants, who to say the least have, the landlord tenant board to say the least has failed small landlords completely and in many cases tenants alike. Uh, an example is Frank, a host from London, who's turned a natural attrition of a long-term unit uh, into a short-term rental unit. This allows Frank to offset the other three units in his building who have great tenants for the last 12 years and pay well below market rent. Over-regulating over the STR market in Hamilton also goes against some of the very goals Hamilton has been aggressively spending millions of dollars to transition the waterfront and attract new citizens and travelers alike. Hamilton has made tremendous improvements and has achieved amazing infill development since I was a student in urban planning at Mohawk many moons ago. Does this regulation support your goals? Do these regulations assist in achieving your goals? I would argue that they don't. Let's take a look, closer look at the economics of it all. A recent release of data from Airbnb in 2021 stays has some sobering uh, details to ponder. Airbnb guests spend on average $142 per night per guest in the neighborhood of the listing, not downtown. And that doesn't include their accommodation. With the current financial climate, hosts were asked, were asked why they share their home. 35% said to earn extra money to cover rising costs of living. 40% said hosts want to earn money to make ends meet. And 42% said they needed a little bit of extra spending money. Does Hamilton want to attract the new world of remote work? Do you want bloggers, influencers, digital nomads to come boost the art scene and the music scene or spotlight the beautiful Niagara Scarp and trails and water, waterfalls that we all enjoy as locals? Then you need housing flexibility and you need to decline the regulations as they stand. Creating a fair, honest and made in Hamilton set of regulations is what's required engage with actual stakeholders, engage with our organization, but most importantly, focus on building and enacting fair and reasonable regulations that support Hamiltonians, support Hamilton's goals, and leaves the hotel lobby painted picture where it belongs, in the musty hotel, downtown hotel room that doesn't meet the needs of the new traveler, the new worker, the newcomer, and the digital nomads. The Corporation of the City of Hamilton is a municipal extension of the province of Ontario. Do these regulations support the provincial housing goals? Do they support and encourage newcomers to stay in the city and find the best neighborhood that suits their needs? Do these regulations allow newcomers to be connected uh, to important community and social supports through hosts while they search for their permanent home? Do these regulations support the provincial government's requirement and goal of housing flexibility? Or do these regulations look great political optics for shifting blame for a lack of successful housing policy for over three decades in Ontario? Thank you, Delegate Welland. That is your time. Are there any questions of the delegate? I recognize Councillor Wang. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whelan, for your presentation. My question is about your association. What are, what's the makeup of your association? Like who's, who's allowed to be in your association? So we're very new. We actually are still in the process of becoming incorporated um, as a not-for-profit. We're not fully not-for-profit status yet. We're still going through the process. Um, I'll give you a quick background on me. I'm from London. I'm just a short-term rental host, um, and I've slowly been forced into the political light. Um, 
uh, and and we're just trying to where any host in Ontario can join um, our association is the answer. So through you, Madam Chair, just another clarifying question. So I, I would like to understand the ideal host that you're trying to attract. The ideal host or guest? The ideal host, um, just so that I can get a better understanding of the clientele that you're trying to service um, through your association, through you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I would say uh, any host. Uh, we have lots of hosts who rent out a single home in their room. We have hosts who have multiple properties, uh, like Frank. Um, but, you know, and we, any host. And, and we want to advocate for fair, good regulations that bolster the the city that that those hosts are, are hosting in, bolster the, the goals and responsibilities of the city, but also uh, provide uh, good regulations for the host to, to continue to make money. My last question then, Madam Chair, is through your association, what would you consider is the ideal relationship between the host and the city? Um, a partnership. And, and, and I think that's the, the biggest key driver housing affordability is a big is a big issue and i think that you can you know there we represent lots of cities right so say grand bend is not tobermory and tobermory is not toronto and toronto is not hamilton so everyone has their own issues and their own uh, you know like the beaches an, ex an example for hamilton they have a, obviously a short-term rental problem um, we want to be able to partner and create um, good regulations that support the, the city's goals and this and and the responsibilities of hosts as well as the responsibility of of property owners sorry i do have one more question if you if i may madam chair of course councillor please proceed uh to you uh mr wayland could you name a city that has the ideal level of rules and regulations and restrictions that potentially hamilton can model itself off of calgary okay thank you um, and I, I, I encourage anyone to reach out to me. Um, I'll, I'll send you all an email after, um, but I, I have definitely some good recommendations. Um, and I am a volunteer uh, community leader in my community. Um, so I, I have a lot of uh, experience and background in, in dealing with, um, you know, bylaw issues and, and other things. So um, I welcome the opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you. That is all for me. Thank you, Councillor. I see no further. Oh, I recognize Councillor Kazar. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Adam. And through the Chair, I just wanted to build on what Councillor Wang was asking there. Uh, you mentioned Calgary as a model for ideal regulations. At a high level, not to put you on the spot, but could you just give a sense of what you think uh, those regulations should be, if you could just take a few seconds? Yeah, that was actually the end of my before I got just my five minutes got cut there. But uh, basically, like we're we're we want licensing, we want fire inspections, we want safe places, um, we want to people hosts want to pay the mat tax. What what should be implemented is licensing of some kind. Um, fire inspections for safety. Um, the demerit point system is probably the best system. If you have a licensing system um, and someone breaks the rules three times, there's going to be those people that do that. And and that's the people that you want out of your community. You don't want operating short-term rentals in your community. And a demerit point system is the way to do that. Um, that way you're penalizing the people that need to be penalized. Um, th that's the best system. Councillor? Conclusion? Yes, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Moving on to uh, Delegate John Thesselwaite. Delegate John Thesselwaite. We'll move on then to Delegate Bob Tyrell. Good morning. morning. Uh, my wife and I operate uh, an Airbnb. I think it's got bad, uh, bad press. They've looked after us. Uh, they made sure that we were uh, competent and did a good job. And uh, all our guests are five-star guests. We're super hosts. We're doing it uh, partially for income, mostly for fun. 
You know, we get to meet a lot of people. People come from out of town. They um, they come from, um, well, they come for um, people. They have the, boy, I'd rather not be here doing this, I'm telling you. They come because uh, their uh, family is in the hospital. They come for courses. We've met uh, medical students, nurses from up north. It's been uh, some, it's very private, it's neat and clean, and it's, uh, we call it the lower suite. I think some people call it the basement. It's got two bedrooms and it's private. Some people come and go, we never see them. But we are often the first introduction to Hamilton. Some people, they, they know Hamilton because they drive over the uh, high level bridge. But in fact, we get them, uh, we live in the Lock Street area, we show them where the restaurants are, where the forests are, and um, like other people have said, they come back because they're impressed with Hamilton. So last week, my wife turned to me and said, we're out of business. If this legislation goes through, we will be out of business. She's, uh, we've run a business in our uh, house for 10 years. We had a, a business teaching. We had as many as 15 people down in our lower suite. And uh, having nothing to do, we converted it to an Airbnb. I was still painting when my wife rushed down and said, hurry up, we've got a guest. It's been like that ever since. We have as many people as we want and as few as we need. Some, it seems to me this legislation is like a farmer's field with only one weed in it and a bulldozer's coming in to take care of it. I guess we're doing it mostly because uh, we're retired, we're invested in, um, in Hamilton and we want to uh, keep busy. You know, we're having a lot of fun doing this and if this legislation goes through, we'll be out of business and uh, that's too bad. So I appreciate the chance to speak to you guys today and I uh, also am impressed with my other colleagues who've done a lot more research than I have and I think they presented the case very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyrell. We have one, some questions from the floor, if you could hold up. Thank Good. you. I recognize Councillor Alex Wilson. Thank you. Just one question. You said if this um, bylaw went forward, this licensing bylaw went forward through the chair, um, you would no longer be able to operate your business. Could you just elaborate why? Uh, one, of the, one of the requirements is that uh, there can't be a lower suite or a basement, and that's ours. And um, you're all invited over for coffee one day and have a look. I think you'll like it. Okay, Councillor. Thank you. One more question. Oh, no, asked and answered. Thank you very much for joining us today. Further questions? Uh, Delegate Scott Ramsey. Scott Ramsey, Delegate Scott Ramsey. Not present at the moment, Delegate Melina Trindell. Delegate Melina Trindell. Hi, I'm online. Thank you, pardon. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity of speaking to this committee as I share my st story as an STR host. So my husband and I moved to Hamilton around two years ago while I was working at Mohawk College. Even though nowadays I'm working for an education and company based in Toronto, we decided to continue living here and call this community our home. We have bought our house with a basement apartment with a separate entrance, looking to create some revenue that would help us to offset some of our mortgage payment, as well as general housing maintenance. We explore a variety of options from long-term rental to homestay. And for us, as we have our parents and family visiting quite regularly from abroad and staying in our basement for about three months per year, the short-term rental option was the most suitable one for us. During this past 10 months, we have rented our unit and we were able to create every little detail of this short-term rental process the way that we like. From the description of our place, vetting who we want to host, welcoming our guests personally when they arrive and saying our goodbyes when they leave. We have hosted so many different people from different parts of Ontario, Canada and the world. 
and they all made their own mark on our lives, the same way that we made our contributions to their time spent in our beautiful city, by referring them to our favorite local restaurants, stores, and landmarks. Other than contributing to the local economy and tourism, we participated actively in the life of new immigrants arriving to our city. So we hosted a McMaster postdoc student for six weeks while they were searching for a long-term rental. A Mexican living in the US who moved to our city to work at v VJ Meats and needed a comfortable place while finding a long-term accommodation. We have also hosted a couple from South Africa who just landed in Canada to work and contribute to our community. We offer them support from our own experience in small and simple things at the beginning of their journey that allow them to get their feet on the ground. We're still communicating to today and we became great friends. We also had the opportunity to support and be part of our visitors' families. When, for example, we welcome a Hamiltonian and her daughters who currently lives in Germany for a month while they were visiting her father that was living in a nursing home. We're also looking forward to hosting a soon to be grandparents that will spend some time in our city to support their daughter in their first weeks off with the new baby. And to add to the concerns that we might have about the impact on our neighborhood, my neighbor from across the street is renting our unit to her brother that will come with his family for a wedding in town. Not even to mention the number of people that we have welcomed to our place that was visiting the city for work, um, participating in Congress, events, concerts, among others. My partner and I truly believe that a regulation is needed, but one that protects our community and our visitors, and not one that punishes homeowners and take our free will inside our own homes. We also believe that this restrict by law we have a negative impact in our community, limiting our visitors' options to choose what is the most appropriate place for them to stay. Uh, as for the negative impact in our community, I, all, I would also like to share a few things that come to my mind. Based on, based on the latest data available from the Hamilton Immigration Partnership Council, there were 4,470 new permanent residents at emissions in Hamilton from January to October 2022. Approximately 4,500 McMaster students are international students while Mohawk College has an overall annual enrollment of 3,000 international students. How is the city of Hamilton planning on accommodating these newly arriving international students and immigrants in our community, as we all understand that it's extremely difficult for them to land in a long-term accommodation as soon as they arrive? With such a restrictive bylaw, I believe you'll be creating such competition in the STR business that would detract visitors. STR operators will have to increase their nightly price to offset the heavy hates and the prejudice of only having 120 days to rent per year, which will make the STR supply lower. I would like again to reinforce that this proposal is putting a strain on us, citizens of the city and taxpayers, during the most difficult time that we have been through, coming out of a pandemic with the current recession, interest rates being so high, I would expect the city of Hamilton to be our partner in that business and not the contrary. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I hope to see a more fair and equitable STR regulation coming through. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, are there any questions of the delegate? Is, is Councillor Danko on for this delegate or was that the previous? Okay, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you. Um, moving on to Delegate Sally Lloyd. Delegate Sally Lloyd. Oh, yes, thank you. Good morning. Excuse me, delegate, if I could just ensure that the light is on your mic and if yep, you're right in front of it, particularly if you have a sore throat. Uh, is that better? Thank, Thank you. you. 
Good morning, and, and thank you for uh, having me um, being able to, to speak to you um, this morning. I'm addressing this council as a resident of Hamilton, a homeowner here for the past 20 years, and a business owner. And that's right, <clears throat> I am a business owner because I run an STR in my home. This business allows me to stay in my home. It allows me to add to the community by paying taxes, spending money in local stores, and encouraging tourism and staying close to friends and most importantly, family. As a retiree, my only income is the government pensions. It's not a lot. To depend upon these pensions alone, it is impossible for me to survive and keep my home. By questioning the impact of STR in our community, I assure you it is a positive one. My guests spend money in the community. They go to restaurants, they rent cars, they shop in the malls, they rent bikes, they go to theaters and museums, they buy food and liquor, they ride the buses, and most importantly, they talk to their friends, their business associates, and their relatives about Hamilton. And they encourage visitors and boost tourism. I've had more than one visitor come back many times because they love Hamilton. Let's think about the dollar value each visitor is worth on a daily basis. Let's think about the restaurants, the shops, the colleges, the tourism, where money is being invested into the city by these visitors. Please think about my situation, and I am sure I am not unique in this. I cannot afford to stay in my home without my STR business. If you think by limiting the number of light nights or restricting STRs in the city, you will be fixing the housing crisis, you are wrong. A Band-Aid fix on a much larger wound will not solve Hamilton's housing problem. In fact, you will be creating yet another problem by forcing residents, long-time residents, and taxpayers, like myself, to sell, and I would move elsewhere. Is this your goal? Are you seriously telling me that being an entrepreneur and finding a way to exist financially is frowned upon by the city of Hamilton, my home? Explain that to me, how that works. Unlike the spec article that implies I am getting rich from Airbnb, I assure you I am not. It simply allows me to stay in my home, welcome guests from abroad, from Ontario, from Mexico, from wherever. I have wonderful, wonderful guests. We enjoy their company. I've never had a bad moment. I enjoy what I'm doing. And I love Hamilton, I love my home, and I want to stay in it. Thank you. Thank you, delegate. Are there any questions for the delegate this morning? Seeing none, oh, beg your pardon. One question, Councillor Nan, I'll recognize. Thank you through you, Chair. I um, just wanted to thank you for coming in and just clarify at any time whether or not your suite was a long-term rental in your home. No. Okay, thank you. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you. I call on Delegate James Burren. Delegate James Burren, good morning. <clears throat> um, I apologize. I was unaware of the five-minute uh, limit. I have pared my comments down, and I may speak rather quickly, but I trust we can all follow. And you, uh, you're recognizing the bell gives you a notation of one minute left? I understand. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So uh, <laughs> I don't know when the five minutes starts, but I didn't want to dispense with pleasantries. Okay. Um, hello, I'm James Buren. I have a degree in economic development and environmental studies from the University of Guelph. I'm also the product of a Dutch immigrant family that built their wealth in the construction industry. My life experience directed me into the home inspection profession. I'm a registered home inspector in private practice for 25 years, and I'm currently a director of the Ontario Association of Home Inspectors. <sighs> I'm also a 10-year Airbnb host, first in Uxbridge, Ontario, and for the past three years in Hamilton. 
Airbnb is an intermediary in the real estate industry. It has grown organically and fills a neglected market niche at no cost to the government and taxpayers. It provides a safe and reliable means for many homeowners to increase the number of rooms available to visitors and residents. I would not have turned my home into a traditional B&B, and I wouldn't want to have a one-year or longer obligation to rent out one of my rooms in my home. Regardless, I wouldn't be able to advertise beyond our city's borders, and the people who need our type of space would not have been able to find us. Hamilton clearly needs short-term rentals. Between the oft-times neglected, overcrowded rooming houses and the apparently unregulated homes that I have inspected around McMaster University and 12-month leases and overpriced flats and apartment buildings, there are few options for temporary residents. The mechanisms supposedly in place for rooming houses, zoning enforcement and occupant safety seem inadequate based on my direct experience. On a personal note, I've been dealing with a bylaw issue for three years. Three years of emails and phone calls and the issue still has not been corrected. I believe that the city could look inward to its existing staff and departments before it establishes a new and possibly redundant licensing office. We pay taxes on the income generated by our rooms. Airbnb collects and remits the tax. Use those tax dollars to support existing legislation and the staff to do their jobs better. Airbnb can be compelled to assist the city with the quantitative measurements required to understand the economics and demographics of this issue. Have operators register their spaces, if you must, but I beg you not to interfere with the market mechanisms that can work, along with existing government infrastructure, such as the planning committee, to correct for our housing needs in the long run. Market distortions generated by the global economy, such as foreign home buyers, have affected my home inspection business for many years. A long-term inability to build as many homes as we need and in an environmentally sensitive fashion has also contributed to a seller's market, which it seems only inflation will correct. My business began to contract many years ago to the high, due to the high market demand for real estate, so renting unused space in my home became a part-time job that, along with my home inspections and renovation work on my home, funded by the Airbnb revenue, kept my business viable and me fully employed. As a self-employed professional with no, prof with no pension, our home is our retirement fund. My wife, self-employed as a stained glass artist, started our Airbnb 10 years ago to support her business. Our home is the primary source of capital which we have accumulated during our lifetimes. That capital, along with our skills, our love of people, and our desire and enjoyment in helping them at their time of need, is what we are counting on to sustain us. We have unused space in our home, and renting those rooms is a job for both of us. We are small-scale entrepreneurs, and this bylaw will reduce our number of nights available by over 240 per room, perhaps. It will also reduce our Airbnb income by 70% or more. Airbnb is so much more than a job. It's a lifestyle that we enjoy immensely, and in which we are eminently suited to participate. We have developed what will be lifelong friendships with many people. These relationships transcend the more narrow national, cultural, gender, class, and age categories to which we would normally be exposed. We continue to socialize with these friends after our business arrangement is over. One of those new friends was even able to attend our wedding last summer. The way I interpret the recommendations, you will potentially reduce the number of locations and intentionally reduce the number of nights available for those persons who need short-term rentals. You will reduce the revenue earned by the existing landlords and homeowners who are utilizing the Airbnb platform. And in the long run, the long-term economic benefits of our increased global prosperity will accrue to the more powerful economic players in the real estate market. Those who should already be investing their money to take advantage of the real demand and potential economic returns that clearly exist in this city. Already, there is a trend in the U.S. where large capital firms such as uh, it's actually Blackstone and Invitation Homes are buying up single-family fam homes en masse in some cases, entire subdivisions, and then renting them out to the growing number of consumers who cannot afford to finance a traditional mortgage. Has our planning department begun to research how this type of trend can be devastating to housing affordability, to community building, and to our society as a whole? Mr. Byrne, that is your time. Are you almost done? Yeah, almost. These large capital investors currently benefiting from a well-documented and growing wealth gap will continue to concentrate their wealth and influence. Citizens will be turned into tenants with no personal investment in their homes and communities. What then? 
A new licensing regime will not create a new short-term rental spaces. It will not increase the amount of housing in Hamilton. The proposed new arm of, gover arm of government oversight will further tax micro-entrepreneurs like ourselves and stifle individual initiative at a time when it is sorely needed. Both local and global market conditions will continue to evolve, and if this legislation is put in place, it will accentuate the problems it is purported to correct rather than ameliorate them. Thank, One thank, thank you. Are you almost done? Yes. Please. I, I just want to be fair in Very how close. I treat yeah, yeah. every delegate. Airbnb is Please. a private virtual community of homeowners and already self-regulating enterprise that increases the amount of housing we can offer those in need, contributes to employment and wealth redistribution, and which requires little government expense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, are there any questions for the delegate? Seeing none, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a virtual delegate calling Delegate Emily Power. Are you able to hear me, Delegate Power? I'm, I'm not able to hear you. You're muted. Hi, Councillor Wilson. Can you hear uh, me hello. now? I can hear you now, Delegate Power. Uh, thank you for joining us. I notice um, on the screen you, you have a, a slide presentation. You'll be walking us through that then? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Power, and I'm speaking today in support of the regulations proposed by city staff. I'm a tenant in the Duran neighborhood and previously volunteered uh, as a tenant organizer with the Hamilton Tenant Solidarity Network. I'm a graduate student in urban planning at the University of Toronto, uh, and I have done some research on the effects of short-term rentals in Hamilton on apartment conversions, loss of the local uh, rental stock, rent increases, and evictions. Uh, and I wanted to briefly summarize some of my key findings from this research which draws upon data provided to me by David Walksmith, a professor of urban planning at McGill University and the foremost scholar on short-term rentals in Canada. There are currently 1,300 active short-term rentals in Hamilton, the majority listed on Airbnb. Most are concentrated in the downtown 80% of listings are for entire homes rather than shared spaces. There are a large number of two, three, and four bedroom entire home listings. And my research suggests the city's proposed regulations could return upwards of 650 family-sized apartments to the local rental stock for local families. Half of listings in Hamilton are operated by casual home sharers, that is hosts with one listing. The other half are controlled by commercial operators with multiple listings. Last year, the Hamilton short-term rental market generated close to $19 million. Uh, while the median annual revenue for Hamilton hosts was approximately 14,000, a small number of commercial operators running Airbnbs like professional landlord investment companies uh, are generating the bulk of the revenue. And the most successful 10% of hosts generated 52% of all revenue, uh, and these hosts are generating more than $100,000 per year from these units. In some neighborhoods, Airbnb has removed more than 4% of the housing stock from the local market. This is uh, particularly alarming in downtown neighborhoods of Kirkendall, Beasley, and Crown Point, as well as uh, the, the Beach Strip. The rise of Airbnb in Hamilton has coincided with rising rents and an increase, increasing number of evictions. This chart compares the growth of full-time entire home Airbnb units with uh, no-fault eviction filings by Hamilton landlords. I believe the regulations proposed for Hamilton are strong and in keeping with progressive policy frameworks adopted by other Canadian cities like Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal that have proven to be effective. Uh, currently, the majority of listings in Hamilton are available to book more than 120 days or four months of the year. 
Uh, this suggests uh, many hosts are renting a secondary residence as an investment property rather than their primary residence. And the city's proposed regulations would cap rentals at 120 days per year. There are currently 680 units in Hamilton in violation of this rule. And these hosts would need to significantly curb their Airbnb activity or return units to the local housing market. So you can see on this uh, slide, uh, those in red, uh, more than 600 units uh, could be returned to the local uh, rental market to serve uh, local families if the regulations pass. I would urge councillors to adopt the regulations as drafted, including the principal residence requirement. Uh, I believe secondary suites, including basement apartments and laneway homes, should be added to the local housing stock uh, for use by long-term uh, rentals for locals rather than as tourist accommodation. Uh, this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Delegate Power. Um, looking to the floor and the screen for questions, I'll recognize Councillor Beattie, Councillor Nan, and Councillor Wayne. Councillor Beattie. Thank you, Chair Wilson, and through you, uh, Emily, thank you for the presentation. Um, lots of uh, Lots of effort evidently went into it, and I, I do appreciate effort. Um, my question, you made mention of uh, an approximate 650 homes that would be returned to other markets if, uh, in your opinion, this uh, legislation were to be passed as written. Um, and I'm trying to understand, uh, and, and this isn't a front-loaded question, but I, I, I am curious, Knowing and, and so far having seen some presentations from uh, people in the in the gallery, the mindset of a short-term rental investor versus a long-term rental investor. Um, do you have any evidence uh, or suggestion on how um, how successful we would be in converting these STR properties into either LTR properties or owner occupied? Properties, and I'm hopeful that uh, that you're understanding the, the gist of the question. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Um, Delegate Power, question clear? Yes. Um, through the chair to the councillor, uh, I, I don't have any firm numbers, but I know this was certainly the case in Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal when their regulations were introduced. Uh, so it it um, financially makes more sense. Uh, in, in many cases for these landlords to return these units uh, to the local rental stock and advertise them as, as long-term rentals, uh, then continue to operate them as short-term rentals on Airbnb. Thank you, uh, and through the chair, um, you spoke to um, the experience in some other jurisdictions. I'm wondering, are there uh, any numbers that that may be available for the benefit of this committee uh, that that would support in terms of uh, a ten percent conversion, a five percent conversion, twenty five percent? I'm just wondering if you can uh, delve into that uh, a little deeper uh, for the benefit of this group. Thank you, Delegate Power. Uh, through the chair, I'm I'm not sure. I'm I'm sorry. My focus has mostly been on um, researching the Hamilton market. Uh, but I imagine studies like that will be coming out soon. Uh, I know Toronto only introduced their regulations uh, this earlier this year, so it probably remains to be seen uh, what those rates are, uh, but I imagine they are quite high. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. Thank you. I recognize Councillor Nan. Thank you, through you, Chair. Thank you, Delegate Powers, for coming in and sharing your research. I uh, found it very uh, useful and a couple of days leading up to this uh, meeting, I took a cursory look for myself on Airbnb to look at the difference of what was available in Ward 3 compared to just a couple of years ago. So I appreciate seeing the visual citywide. Um, question for you is if um, the 120 day cap was not part of this regulatory framework, how would that impact or what, what um, how would your findings change? Delegate? Um, 
based on my discussions with David Walksmith, uh, who is the planning professor at McGill, who studied short-term rentals across Canada, in his view, um, the 120-day or month cap uh, is, is not as meaningful as the principal residence requirement. Uh, it's, it's quite hard to enforce that cap at, um, and monitor the compliance. Um, so in terms of if, if the goal is protecting the local, um, con conserving the housing stock for, for local renters, I think the, the most important uh, uh, element of this policy should be the principal principal residence requirement. Thank you for that. Through you, Chair. Um, Delegate Powers, would it be possible for you to bring back your slide? Uh, I had. To, I just wanted to take a look at slide number five, I believe, which was illustrating in your delegation the number of um, current STRs that would have to be returned or potentially no longer operated STRs and potentially be units that would come back into long-term rental housing. So uh, if I could through you, Chair, just to clarify, violation of regulation, can you um, let this committee know what's the definition of violation of regulation? Was that the 120 days or uh, other pieces of the regulations? Thank you. Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Sorry if that wasn't clear. Yes, uh, this this those dots in red are those that are currently available to rent more than 120 days in the last year. Um, it, it's impossible for a researcher to know yeah. uh, if the the unit being listed on Airbnb is their their principal residence, uh, you'd have to <laughs> have access yeah. to the um, property ownership record to, to prove that, which uh, the business license framework that's being proposed will allow uh, city staff and bylaw officers to do. Um, so yeah, this was kind of a <laughs> the best metric I, I had, um, I appreciate this 120 that. day availability. Thank you so much, those are my questions. Thank you. We have Councillor Wang followed by Councillor Alex Wilson. Councillor Wang. Thank you. And through you, Chair, to Delegate Power, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate the data. I'd like to understand what is the historical rate of growth of Airbnbs here in Hamilton? I don't know if you have a time zero or if there was, like, I know you were doing everything currently as of today, but do you have a sense of a rate of growth? Delegate? Um, through the chair to the councillor, sorry, I don't have a firm number. Um, I, I know that uh, it, it started around 2016 uh, and, and the growth was uh, very rapid in uh, 2019. Uh, there was a dip during the pandemic as we would expect, but we're currently um, up to the pre-pandemic numbers in terms of uh, number of listings available and actively being booked. Thank you. Through you, Chair, I think the question I'm really trying to get at is uh, to Delegate Power, in your research, what do you expect current rate of growth to look like? So should we not have a regulation in place, what does that look like in the future? Delegate. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, I understand. Um, I showed on the, the one slide um, the total proportion of the housing stock that had been converted to Airbnb in some neighborhoods as much as 4% of, of all the rental stock. Um, in, in some neighborhoods in Toronto and Vancouver, uh, we've seen that you know as high as 50% of the rental stock. Um, and, and I think it's very important that Hamilton uh, introduced progressive regulations now to prevent uh, a similar situation um, happening here. Of course, you know, we're not a major uh, tourist center like Toronto, but um, the same, you know, housing pressures can, can apply, especially if there's that large uh, rent gap between the, the current market rents that locals are paying and, and the potential revenues uh, from renting on Airbnb full time. Councillor? My last question then through you, Chair. Um, in your research, which municipality had the most ideal 
set of regulations that benefited both the city and the hosts and the Airbnb marketplace. Thank you. Delegate Power. Um, through the chair, I, I think that uh, both um, Vancouver is, is a model that is uh, worth following. Um, both they, they have a principal residence requirement. Uh, they have the same uh, business license uh, and fee structure that we're proposing in Hamilton, but they also have a uh, agreement with Airbnb as a broker uh, that ensures um, uh, cooperation in terms of um, monitoring and compliance. So any uh, host that attempts to list on the Airbnb website without a business license number, uh, the listing is automatically removed by Airbnb. Uh, so that that's something I think uh, which would be important to emulate in, in Hamilton. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Councillor Wang. I recognize Councillor Alex Wilson followed by Councillor Kretsch. Uh, thank you. And through the chair, thank you so much, Emily, for both your research on this and all that you're doing um, with tenants in the city. I just wanted to go back because I think the, there are so many things that were helpful in your presentation. But one of the ones that I found really, really helpful was when you did a demographic overview of who are STR operators within our city um, and the different types. Would you just be able to refresh? I think there were some numbers about 50%, 50%, and then there was the income from the top 10% of operators. Could you just walk us through again some of, you know, what does this kind of demographic look like based on your research or where? Yeah, I think that's the question. Thank you. Happy to clarify, though. Delegate Power, do you need clarification? Uh, no, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, I went through that rather quickly. Um, so uh, I think the most important number is that um, half of hosts in Hamilton are what we would call casual home sharers. Uh, so those hosts with only one listing. Um, but the other half are commercial operators, those that have uh, two or more entire home listings that are rented for the majority of the year, or uh, those who operate um, uh, kind of like a rooming house conversion, so multiple rooms uh, all out of the same property rented for the majority of the year. Um, and uh, as I said, yeah, 80% of listings overall are entire home rentals. Um, and uh, there's that top percent of hosts, these commercial operators that are um, operating, you know, a very professional, highly profitable uh, landlord investment um, business, and, and they're capturing mo more than half of, of the total revenue from short-term rentals in the city, um, most, you know, uh, bringing in more than $100,000 a year for listing. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate um, Councillor Wilson. Thank you so much through the chair. I really appreciate that clarification. Um, my last question is just about um, protecting tenants. And so what I've heard a lot today is that um, short-term rentals, particularly those on a multi-month, um, which would not be a short-term as defined in the proposed bylaw, but you know, multi-month rentals have great utility to folks who are in situations that are precarious, whether that's coming to a new city, whether that's home renovations, maybe in between tenancies, um, folks who are made vulnerable because of this transition. Could you speak to the impact of having um, so many vulnerable tenants relying on these types of systems and what does that mean for tenant protection in our city? Delegate Power. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, thanks very much for the thoughtful question. Um, I actually organized a, a work community workshop on this topic uh, this weekend, and there were many tenants in attendance who were talking about their own experiences uh, facing eviction pressure for um, Airbnb conversion or other forms of rent eviction. Uh, you know, constant. Um, harassment in, in terms of uh, withholding repairs, withholding pest treatment, um, badgering tenants with cash for keys, buyout offers to sign a lease termination. 
um, all, all in an effort to remove uh, these longstanding tenants from their homes and jack up the rents on turnover. Um, and uh, I think that um, while it may be true that, uh, unfortunately, people are relying on um, these kinds of Airbnb units as a uh, temporary stopgap uh, while they're, you know, if they've been evicted from one place and they're, they're um, having a hard time being accepted into another unit, uh, I think that just speaks to um, the housing crisis in our city and, and the need for uh, protecting our housing stock for locals to ensure that we have you know, a greater supply, a higher vacancy rate, uh, lower market rents, um, uh, social housing, um, more funding for, you know, our, our shelters uh, and, and for, um, you know, support staff to assist people in these situations. They, they shouldn't have to be <laughs> driven to this point uh, where they're paying, you know, $150, $200 a night to stay in an Airbnb because they're just waiting and uh, hoping to get accepted into an apartment. Councillor. Uh, just really appreciative of the research you've done and for sharing it with us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Councillor Critch. Hi, Delegate Power. Uh, really good to see you here. And thanks so much for the research you've done. I had two questions for you. One was um, following on Councillor Nan's questions. Uh, Councillor Nan talked about the 120 day rental period. There's also in this bylaw a definition of short term rental that says um, that it's a dwelling unit. Um, for a period that's less than 28 consecutive days. And so I just want to get you to weigh in on that if you could a little bit in terms of whether you think that's effective. And, and again, speaking to what you talked about earlier in terms of enforcing that um, and its importance in, in the shape of, shaping of this bylaw. Delegate Power. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, um, I believe that that 28 day uh, mark is included because uh, Anything beyond that, the tenant and the landlord are then automatically subject to uh, the Residential Tenancies Act. It becomes a month-to-month, longer-term rental. Uh, even if no agreement is signed, uh, that is, in effect, what the regulation that um, governs the relationship. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, it's, it's an instructive uh, lesson that... Uh, when Toronto, after, you know, two years of uh, litigation at the Ontario Municipal Board over uh, Toronto's short-term rental policy, uh, when it finally came into effect, Airbnb Inc. automatically converted all of the listings on their website to be 28-day listings in order to kind of um, skirt the regulation. Um, so this is dangerous, and I, I think that um, we, we need to have a better monitoring and, and compliance system in Hamilton to ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, more than answers my question. Thank you very much, the chair. Second question was about a little bit of a gray area here in the data. So you spoke to the casual users and you talked about um, when you respond to Councillor Wilson's question, so I'm following up on that. You said that um, casual units were folks, users were folks who had one unit um, in a house that was their primary residence. Um, but I know anecdotally speaking, there are sometimes situations where um, folks who have a principal residence have more than one unit, right? So like w in your data, where, how, how much of a minority of folks is that? Because you talked about um, corporate users um, who may have um, that kind of setup with multiple rooms, but did you find your data anywhere like a preponderance or an, an amount, of, amount of users um, where their principal residence was renting out more than one unit? Delegate Power. Um, through the chair to the councillor, uh, I, I didn't have that kind of breakdown. Uh, it's, I think, 52% uh, are hosts with one listing and 48% are uh, hosts with multiple listings. That's as, as drilled down as I was able to get. Okay, so thank I you. Through the chair, it, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Delegate. Sorry, delegate. Please clarify. Do you have something to add, Delegate Power, on that? I'd just say quickly, um, I, I know that at the previous debate on this issue in back in July, uh, there was some contention around uh, 
you know, secondary suites, basement units, laneway homes, uh, you know, a, a house that's a duplex or a triplex, if, if it is the principal residence of the property owner and they're wishing to rent out this secondary suite on a full-time basis on Airbnb, uh, should that be permitted? Um, personally, I would argue against this. I, I think that, um, you know, one of the main intentions of, of that policy to encourage secondary suites in Hamilton was to add to the rental stock for locals. Uh, and it would be very sad if, um, you know, most of these uh, landlords that are, are building these secondary suites uh, rented them immediately on Airbnb. Thank you, Councillor. Do you have any additional questions? Yeah, I just wanted a point of clarification here just to make sure I fully understand. Sorry, I may have just a bit slow on the uptake today. But what you're saying is that the data you have shows uh, individuals who have one unit, and then it shows individuals who have more than one unit. And if I understand what a unit could be, it could be a situation where some of that data is contained where there's a, a person who has, for instance, a five bedroom house, as an example, right? Um, it's their principal residence, and they rent out two units in that home. They would get captured in the more than one unit data that you have. Can you clarify for the councillor delegate? Yes, that's correct. Thank you so much, Delegate Power. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Beatty, did you have a question? I see your name on the... Thank you. Thank you. And through you, Chair, I, um, second time speaker uh, on this. Um, there's a term that, um, that the delegate was using uh, with regards to what, what was being referred to as a commercial operator. And I'm wondering, uh, for the benefit of uh, all, all listening, there's a particular connotation, I think, when we think commercial corporate um, as opposed to uh, the casual user. And I'm wondering if you have that or if you're able to unpack a little further um, through your research what the composition actually looks like. Are we talking about physical corporations, uh, companies that are uh, in this group, or uh, is there a definition in which somebody may be a retiree, they may be a family that may own more than one uh, property. Uh, do they also fit into this group if you have definitions uh, that you might be able to share? Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Power. Uh, thank you to the, through the chair to the councillor. Um, so uh, commercial operators are, I define as uh, those that uh, have two or more entire home listings. So that's 340 uh, listings in Hamilton, um, or a host with three or more private room listings. So they're renting out multiple rooms from the same location. And there are 117 of these uh, in Hamilton. Um, and uh, I did come across some larger uh, property management companies that uh, control dozens of short-term rentals. For example, uh, there's one called Simply Comfort, which has 42 listings in Hamilton and 360 listings across Canada. Uh, it's not clear to me if they are a property investment company and they own these listings themselves or if they are, um, you know, providing a property management service on behalf of other individual owners. Um, I hope that answers your question. Councillor Beatty. Thank you. And uh, through the chair, then, just uh, to see clarity that uh, when we are making the reference uh, through through your presentation of a, a quote-unquote commercial operator, corporate operator, um, that there is the potential that a, a number of these um, operators in this group that you've grouped together could still be um, individuals, family ownership, uh, that they're not necessarily uh, all composed um, of uh, corporate entities. Thank you. Delegate Power. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, I, I think the term is useful just to indicate that they have um, two or more entire home listings and, um, you know, they're likely in a, in terms of revenue and uh, far more profitable and kind of in a different bracket than the casual home sharer who's renting out their home, you know, when they go away for work or vacation themselves, just to supplement their rent or their mortgage payments in a, in a small way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Beattie. 
There are no further questions. Thank you to Delegate Power for joining us this morning. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, is Delegate Kevin Marzi here? My apologies if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Delegate Kevin Marzi. Okay, we'll move on. It does say in person on my roadmap, but yeah, given the weather, yeah. <laughs> Is there a virtual delegate here by the name of Kevin Marcy or Kevin? Okay, we'll move on. Okay. Uh, delegate Andrew Robertson, are you present today? Yes, okay. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> oh, hi, uh, councillors. Uh, nice to see you all in the fresh faces here. I know a lot of uh, people in Hamilton are very enthusiastic about uh, the potential for this new council. Councillor Clark, great to see you again. The, the, the survivor of uh, all these years, you're still here. <laughs> this is great. Um, yeah, my name is Andrew Robertson. I am a real estate broker. I am an investor. I do operate an SDR as well as a number of other apartments. In fact, Emily, nice to see you. She's one of my tenants there here in the Duran neighborhood. Uh, obviously, that building is not an SDR. I have one unit that falls into that category. It's just evolved that way. Uh, I actually was in the spectator back in August when this came out and featured my story there. So they asked me about this regulation. I don't call it a regulation, I call it annihilation. It, it sets the bar so high, it's going to basically eliminate almost all of the operators. You know, a 120 day limit, it's not enough to operate. It costs money to operate these places. But the main reason I'm here is to kind of save my part-time job for my wife. I mean, this has worked out really well for us. That's not a lot of money, maybe eight to $10,000 a year, but otherwise you'd have to pay somebody to go in and clean the units after every stay. We take great pride in our units. In fact, I encourage you to take a look. You can Google the Durander, it'll come right up. It's a lovely unit. It was it's a studio, there's no bedroom in it. You know, it just is a bachelor suite that I had always problems when it was a long-term rental. And this opportunity came up and it, it just works so well and we have such great reviews. You know, I really want to compliment the other speakers. Like, listen, counselors, I really encourage you to listen to what the uh, operators are saying because they have some really great insights and, and they all do. And so I know you've got a tough job ahead of you. You really do because as an operator, and it was said earlier, we want the good operators, right? We, we're okay with regulation. And there is something, like for example, HST. So it came to us that we weren't collecting, you know, I didn't think rentals even were, uh, you know, you have to pay HST, but it came out that, okay, good corporate citizen, Airbnb, we're collecting HST. Now, I don't know, I've asked Airbnb, Airbnb people if they can give me a number, how much we have remitted to the government of Canada, and also, well, that's the extension, the government of Ontario. But it's a lot of money, a 13% on every rental. Why aren't you getting part of that money, Hamilton? That's money out of our community that's going. And we're okay with paying that tax if we have to. We're okay with regulation, but it's gotta be you know, more precise, okay? Because this legislation, the way it's written is, to me, we can do better. And I, I wanna hold the council, you know, that you guys get this right. There also is something called the MAT. You're probably all familiar with that, right? Have you looked at that? There is an opportunity here to generate some income that you can target specifically to real housing needs. I'm thinking of the Housing Help Center. That great organization I know has saved at least two or three of my tenants from being on the street. They're always underfunded. Could we not come up with a way that we could, you know, blend, you know, the, the established market of STRs, you know, able to access some of that revenue and then focus it toward effective programs that actually start addressing part of our housing problem. And the low hanging fruit, it's easy to get the headline and saying, hey, we're doing this, we're doing that. But again, listen to the other speakers. I don't think it's gonna make any difference in the big picture of solving you know, the problems we have with our, with our housing. So I'm happy to take any questions and I thank you for your time. Good luck, counselors. Thank you very much. Well, within your time, are there any questions for the delegate? 
Councillor Beatty, please. Thank you, Chair Wilson, and through you, um, and I probably should have been asking this question of other delegates, but you get to be the first, Andrew, so I apologize. Um, and it's based on the outcome, I think, of our last presenter, trying to understand the mindset of the uh, STR operator versus the mindset of the LTR, long-term rental operator, okay. uh, because I, I truly have no experience in this at all. Um, not a user of the, the STR system. Mm -hmm. um, what led you to go to, sorry, first question, just to clarify, you have one unit. Correct. I have one SDR and 26 uh, LTRs. So you're, you're a good uh, test case then, Andrew. What led you to make that one particular unit, an SDR unit versus an LTR unit? Um, it was a, a long tribunal hearing where the tenant stopped paying rent, trashed the place, and I had lost rent for, I don't know, five, six months by the time we finally resolved the issue, and I got the unit back. And that hadn't been the first time. I just think that that unit is, was not ideal for long-term rental. It's a studio. It's a bachelor. It does not have a separate bedroom. And, you know, so who's going to effectively live long-term in 350 square feet? So I can't speak for other operators, but for me, that was the natural evolution. I was hesitant at first because I'm not sure the extra work, if it's worthwhile. And the only way I've been able to do it is because my, my, my wife, Josie, has said, yeah, I'll step up and do it. And so as a team, we've been able to do it. I have no intention of converting any other of my, uh, of my uh, other units because they're proper one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms into STR. It's too much work. I like LTR, but in this case here, it was just the right product. Councillor? Uh, is the uh, STR unit in uh, your principal residence? No, no. I lived in that house originally uh, through the council. I lived in that. I lived in um, in that house originally when we moved from Toronto to Hamilton. But it, it's a, it's a legal four unit building with an extra unit, and um, so that's the way it's been operating. And but no, that's not my principal residence, and that's one of my uh, reasons why I pose the the proposal. That's why I think I call it not a regulation. I call it annihilation. I think we can be way more precise. I think it takes a bit more work, and I, I encourage counselor to tell staff, let's work a little bit harder. Let's find that right balance, because we can do better. We can find that balance where we can have the operators you know, provide a great service, and you ask them, they're okay, bring on the regulation. Thank you, counselor. My uh, final question then, uh, if the regulation were to proceed as written, mm -hmm. um, it would prohibit you from continuing to operate that STR unit at that location yeah. legally. Yeah. Um, what um, what would be your outcome? And this is merely yeah. just a speculative question, right. but I'm, I'm curious again as to the mindset. Yeah, yeah, me too. I haven't quite formulated. I have some ideas. There, there always is a workaround, you know. There could be other workarounds. You could put it on Airbnb for a 30-day 30, 30 rental, right, minimum, with like a free cancellation policy. Like, there are ways that people can get around regulations. Very, very hard to enforce. Now, in this case here, would I go back into long-term rental? Well, maybe. You know, I spent thousands, of, like, I think fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 by the time we renovated the apartment, put in really nice furnishings, you know, with um, the uh, beautiful bed and the TV and the couch and all that stuff. So that would have to go into storage or someplace else, or I just put it on a different platform and call it a 30-day um, you know, or, or a furnished rental. Like when I was growing up, there always was ads in the paper for furnished rentals. This is not something new that was always available. So I would probably just try and find the balance of just putting it out there for a 30-day furnished rental. Thank you. Councillor Beatty has concluded his questions. I appreciate your time. I don't thank see you. any other questions on the docket. So thank you again. Okay, thank you. We're going next to Delegate Samira Pramatalek. Samira Pramatalek. I don't see the delegate at the time. That is, uh, I'm going to go to the top of my list again, uh, Elsie Kelsey. Um, calling Delegate Kaylee Stevenson, who is to join us virtually. Kaylee Stevenson. Okay, moving on to Delegate John Thistlewaite. Okay, 
And I believe I we didn't hear from Delegate Scott Ramsey joining us virtually. Seeing none, okay. And then I'll, again, if I could call out for Delegate Samira Permatalake. Hi, present. Hello. Excuse me, sir, or ma'am, or delegate rather. I'm not able to see you visually. So if you can Okay, yeah. Or do you have your camera off or on? Yeah, I just I just shared it. Thank you. I can see and hear you. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. You have five yes. minutes for your delegation. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I'm a citizen. Uh, I'm a, sorry, resident of Hamilton. Uh, I moved to Hamilton back in 2006. I went to high school. I went to McMaster. Um, so I have uh, quite a lot of uh, back, um, history in Hamilton. Um, Hamilton is a great place uh, to, uh, um, you know, study uh, as well as um, um, learn um, uh, and also pursue certain careers that uh, paths that uh, you may not have option to um, in other other areas, uh, other areas of GTA. Um, so, and uh, luckily I. Um, was able to find an affordable house in Hamilton and uh, moved in in 2020. Um, and um, we have this space in our house that um, we, we didn't really need it until maybe a kid or two in the in the future, right? So we decided that hey, maybe it's a t as a temporary measure, we can we can let people use it. So what's the best solution? Short term rental, right? Um, <clears throat> so. So this is uh, this is what we uh, what we uh, what we decided to do, and um, it, you know it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's not that bad. Um, yeah, it is through the Airbnb, but um, I mean it, it can be it can be through whatever means. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that it gives us flexibility in terms of <clears throat> um, if you want to let's say have your have your uh, parents over um, you know in the short term rental for a couple of days uh, so you, you don't you know you you're not you're not completely uh, rent, uh, renting it for long term uh, that that short term area uh, you know uh, so that way the homeowners gives gives uh, some fun flexibility in in that regard at the same time it's not a waste of space and in, in City of Hamilton, uh, where people are need uh, places to to, to live, uh, and uh, the other thing is um, um, the um, the the one of the uh, one of the sections was mentioning something about two person per sleeping area, uh, which makes uh, kind of sense. But at the same time, I know for sure that we had families of a kid or two that's older than two years uh, uh, have uh, have come over. Uh, sleep in that uh, studio suite um, with no issues. Um, you know, they enjoyed it. Um, they enjoyed the comfort, they enjoyed the safety, they enjoyed the affordability uh, and the home feel, right? So they don't feel like they're kind of in like some kind of weird motel or, you know, some kind of a place that they're not sort of used to. Um, um, they feel safe. Um, so uh, I would highly recommend looking at that one, that section 4.9, I think. Um, uh, what else? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I guess everybody mentioned the 120 day <laughs> night limit, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, so those are the things uh, I don't want to delay you guys any longer uh, than you have to. Uh, thank you so much for uh, keeping a city of Hamilton uh, open for business as well as uh, play. Um, uh, enjoyment and uh, safe um, for the citizens and uh, visitors alike. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for your delegation this morning. Yep. Uh, I will. Rec there's a question uh, from a, a member of the committee. I'll recognize Councillor Beatty. Thank you, and through you, Chair, I just want to clarify for the benefit of my colleagues that I didn't wake up this morning intending to ask this many questions at this particular <laughs> meeting. Uh, I I. 
up until about two days ago, had very little knowledge of the STR space. Uh, so I am uh, I'm asking a series of questions, and it's going to start to sound repetitive, but I'm trying to understand the profile of someone who participates in the STR space. Um, and I think that's beneficial to me in order to be able to formulate my decision on, on how we proceed. So Samir, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is similar to those that I offered to Andrew a moment ago. Um, just to clarify, uh, you have one unit and it is within your principal residence, yes? Yes, it's just a separate, uh, not separate, but it's just, it's kind of like a, has its own ba uh, washroom. Uh, it's kind of like a kitchenette, just a separate entrance, just same house, exact same house, yeah. Thank you, and through you, Chair Wilson. Um, my, my question again, uh, Samira, why a short-term rental versus a long-term rental on this particular unit? And mm -hmm. then my follow-up question will be what happens um, if we were to proceed with uh, the regulations as proposed. Through you, Chair. Thank you. Delegate? Uh, yeah, like I said, um, um, I guess the first thing is the, um, the you know, we, 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 the first question was, the, why is it not a long-term rental, right? Um, so there's two answers, I guess. One is the flexibility, and the other one is it's not quite ready. I need to do some more retrofitting to make it long-term uh, rental. Um, and also, I'm kind of scared about, you know, people not paying rent. Like, I heard that a lot in Hamilton. I'm, I'm not, like... I don't know, maybe I'm just wrong, but this is what I heard. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the three reasons why I still haven't gone into the long term, but I would love to do that because I, it's why, why waste space, right? When when you're safe and uh, rentable. <clears throat> and the second question, I think uh, was, uh, <clears throat> uh, what's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, in the event, um, you didn't have it available for short-term rental, what would the consequence be? Is that the question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What happens next if the, if the regulation proceeds? Sorry, Chair. No, no, thank you. For, in, in, my, in my view, uh, for, for my, from my side, I, don't, I only see that uh, obviously um, uh, the, the extra income because I'm the only Earner in the house, and uh, sorry, only income earner in the house at the point, as well as um, what was it? Uh, um, yeah, like uh, in terms of like let's say housing uh, capability. Like I know a lot of people that are probably in the middle of uh, finding a place, uh, and you know would like to rent. Uh, you know, short-term rental, and uh, they would like to kind of like come into a place like this uh, uh, until they find their, their long-term rental. So those kind of people, uh, uh, you know, w when they land from their plane or whether they uh, are, are just kind of getting out of a lease of, of a rental or, or whatever it is, they wouldn't have a place uh, to kind of crash, um, you know, that, that would really put a lot of um, uh, uh, people sort of in the in the issues of like uh, not able to uh, you know facilitate their uh, their moving from dif Samira, different I'm cities. Wanna, sorry, yeah. I don't I don't want to cut yeah. you off. And I'm I'm actually more curious as to your what happens to your unit you personally um, mm -hmm. if uh, if the STR option wasn't available. Thank Through the chair, the chair, please. Thank you. To the delegate. Okay. Yeah, so obviously it's it wouldn't be able to rent for more than uh, more than half a year, right? That's one one point, and the other one is uh, um, it would only be rented for uh, people of like two people uh, per 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 night. So uh, uh, that would mean that no no families will be able to come. Uh, so obviously less revenue again. Uh, uh, yeah, those are the only two I can think of right now. Um, obviously, uh, there's also some fees involved. Um, you know, just three hundred dollars just to start up, uh, and me, my my particular place being very affordable. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's an it is a, still an investment. Uh, you know, 
that's that's also uh, so taking away from the revenue. Yeah. So it doesn't make it so um, exciting or, or, or exciting. It doesn't make it worthwhile your your time and effort in making a safe place for for travelers and visitors. Thank you very much, Councillor. Yep. Thank you. My final question. Um, I would just wanted to tease out from your presentation, Samira, that um, you made mention your eventual goal is to actually move into the long term rental market. Um, I'm going to make an assumption, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the the current STR um, may be a vehicle to help you fund the eventual conversion into an LTR. Yes. And Sorry. I'm, yes. <laughs> you're kind of using the funding from one to get to that place. Uh, exactly. If, sure. If there were restrictions placed on your current operation, what does that do for your timeline? Um, I'm wondering if you can just give a quick estimation on mm. any change of timeline for you to eventually move to that LTR market. Yeah, so I, I got a quotation for a um, uh, put it, putting in a um, better washroom. So with the full shower, uh, you know, um, like basically what I have there is kind of like a powder room. So it's just a washroom and a sink. So I want to put like an actual shower if you want to rent it long term and also the kitchenette has to be more like a kitchen like uh you know you probably want to make it more like fireproof so the quotation i got for a, a, just putting a shower was six thousand dollars and being me as, as just a new homeowner i i don't have that kind of cash to put in to to reinvest that part of that unused house for better use if you if that's that's your question Thank you, Councillor. Yes, thank you. Um, no further questions. Thank you, Samira. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Beatty. There are no further question, no further councillors asking questions to the delegates. So thank you for being here uh, today. If you thank can you. exit and you can watch the remainder of the meeting on YouTube or something. Okay. Um, we have uh, some pre-recorded delegations that we're going to be going to, and I'll be leaning on Elsie Kelsey to do that. So uh, we did not receive the pre-recorded video from the delegate Quasi Obeng, which means we're moving on to number 11, Brian and Natasha DeFrancesco. The video is 16 minutes long. Is uh... the, the video is 16.16? Yes, and I understand there's a counselor who's going to uh, move a motion to extend the time for that delegate. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a counselor uh, stepping up to move an extension of time? Yes, Councillor Beattie? Me again. Um, Frequent flyer. <laughs> boy, oh boy, I tell you, this isn't how I planned my day. Um, thank you. And through you, Chair Wilson, uh, I would move for uh, the allowance of an extension. Uh, my reasoning is twofold. Um, this is a constituent uh, that did reach out with regards to the issue. Um, there was some kind of miscommunication. He did not understand the time limit, number one. And number two, uh, given that uh, the process of the question answer period sometimes does extend beyond the five minute mark, sometimes we could be into that 15 or 16 minute mark to allow a full exchange. Uh, I think that this would be uh, consistent with the general theme of the, the question and answer period in terms of timeline. So I'm uh, moving for the allowance of this extension and I'm hoping uh, for a seconder. Is there a seconder for that extension? Councillor Francis is willing to uh to back you on that. Uh, we'll have to vote on it, please. So this is uh, to enable an extension from five to 16 uh, minutes on the basis that there was some misunderstanding that there in fact was a time limit. Do I have that right? The vote is up. Thank you. Uh, that carries seven to four. Okay. I'm in your hands to play it, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to, if I could hand the chair over to Councillor Denko for a moment. Thank you.
seven to four. Okay. I'm in your hands to play it, please. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Horvath and councilors of the city of Hamilton. My name is Brian. I've been um, wanting to delegate uh, for this short-term bylaw uh, uh, topic for quite some time, and I understand that the time is now. Uh, so also want to uh, say hello to the councillors, specifically Jeff Beatty, who's the councillor of, of my area in Stony Creek, and also Matt Francis, who I had the pleasure of meeting during his campaigning. Um, our story is that uh, my wife and, and children during COVID uh, expect, um, experienced some difficulty in our lives with our children's education and their, um, their athletic pursuits. And that led to us moving uh, partially to British Columbia so the children can continue with their schooling and their ski uh, endeavors. Um, and so that's left our home partially used and partially uh, uh, lived in and partially vacant. Uh, we are not in a position where we want to rent it long term. So the idea that uh, uh, short term rentals would be a benefit was very attractive to us. Um, so far, we've had some great tenants uh, through our rentals. Um, you know, these are people from all over the world that have come to enjoy Hamilton and contribute to our economy and our new citizens of our city. Uh, and uh, our home has been very welcoming to them as we have also been Airbnb guests and we've gone around uh, to different parts of the world and, and have enjoyed Airbnbs. Uh, frankly, um, I believe in the approach of regulation. Uh, I believe in bylaws uh, set up to protect uh, the citizens of our community. But the current proposal, I feel, has drastically has an overreach and will have a negative effect ultimately on our community and on the coffers of our uh, strained city. Um, I will let you know that you know over the Christmas holidays we hosted a family uh, um, uh, uh, with with the primary host named Aaron, who are local Canadians that work in the tech sector in the West Coast and in the music sector, and they came here to enjoy time with their family, specifically their their two mothers that are both in nursing homes. Last year, she relayed the story that they came, stayed at a different Airbnb, and for the first 10 days, they were randomly selected to be quarantined so they couldn't stay with their family. And for the next 10 days, her, her mother had COVID, so she couldn't see her uh, for the two weeks at the hospital or at the old age home. Um, so a home like ours was, was so meaningful and so impactful, and they left us such a, a glowing uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, thank you letter uh, that we could be a part of their Christmas holidays. Another client uh, um, uh, guest named Dortman uh, is renovating his house and uh, needed a place to stay when the when the dust became too much and has been staying with us and 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 um, been been healthy and safe. Uh, the, the 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 contractor like typical things go longer, uh, so here he is extending and and being well taken care of. Another client Joshua uh, travels here for school at Mohawk College and doesn't want to stay in a hotel room for, for a couple of months. So he has been staying with us. I think of, uh, of guests in the summer that had sold their house and they were moving back to Africa uh, and they needed a place to live before they wound up their careers. Um, they are Canadians, they hope to come back, but we provide them with temporary housing. Um, another one was during COVID. Uh, um, uh, Short-term rentals became an essential service during the lockdowns. We hosted people that had come back from, from travel and didn't want to move in with their family and having Airbnbs and short-term rentals in our community made it safe for them that they could live uh, in a self-contained space away from their family. I know that we all think that's in the past, but again, this is what short-term rentals give our community. I'm currently working with two bridal parties from out of town, both local Hamiltonians that are having their wedding here and would like something more than a nondescript hotel to uh, do their, their makeup and their, and their, uh, their photos. Um, and you know, we, I've talked to them. They're not hosting a party. This isn't going to be a frat house. Uh, these are things that I think it's important that someone at City Hall puts into this um, um, proposal for you to consider, so you can understand that uh, you know we're talking about a vast quantity of travelers to Hamilton with a minority of issues. You just don't hear about the issues. I've never seen them. 
Um, you know, we have a new Canadian coming in the future named Youssef coming from Abu Dhabi. I would have never met Youssef had it not been for short-term rentals. Um, I just want to bring up my concern as a taxpayer and a ratepayer. Uh, you know, proposal of $286,400, including a $42,000 vehicle, um, generating future uh, 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 interest from this internal loan. I don't see the benefit, and I think you need to be fiscally responsible at this time when we're dealing with leaks uh, in our in our city infrastructure. We're dealing with a potential lawsuit on the on the Red Hill Creek. Our 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 city, like all cities, is a business, and there's only so much bandwidth that you can process as councillors that the that the workers can process, and we 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 need to get back to the business of running a city. Again, I'm going to come back to it. I recommend that we go forward with some type of regulation so that the, the operators are known, there are rules in place, uh, but the rules um, are very concerning for me, especially when we're, uh, it, it's clearly documented that this document was was written on behalf of, the, uh, on the back of the City of Toronto's um, uh, um, recent changes. City of Toronto is a major Canadian city with high density. It's not Hamilton. Hamilton's a beautiful, vibrant community with both high and low density uh, and, and applying and wagging the City of Toronto stick at our own city doesn't make sense. Uh, I have a friend in Calgary who once asked me about my Airbnbs and I looked into it with them. You know, use the city of Calgary as an example where um, there are rules in place. They're, you know, they're about safety and public concern, uh, but they're not about restriction and limiting the freedoms that homeowners should have in their own home and, and, and to do with it what they will. Um, you know, one short-term rental unit in a principal residence on the face of it makes sense, but different things come up for different people. Someone might have um, a, a, a rental property with a long-term tenant that moves out and they decide they want to rent it short-term until the next tenant comes in. They can't do that. Someone may have a, a basement suite. They can't rent that. Someone may put in a laneway um, uh, suite. Um, they can't rent that. Uh, the, the restrictions in this bylaw, I think, are overreaching and frankly unfair to your constituents, to your taxpayers that are paying their money uh, uh, month after month to our, our government to be told what they can and can't do in their house. The issue is public decency. The issue is garbage. The issue um, is parking. Um, the issue is safety. Those are all issues I want to talk about with you at, at, at this time. Uh, and also that uh, uh, limiting commercial or multi-listing operators, um, frankly, also that doesn't make sense. We need to have a vibrant housing stock that's used in different creative ways that allows for the future to continue. And if a, um, an investor wants to have multi, multiple properties and it makes financial sense, it's good for our community to have healthy short-term rentals and have a healthy short-term rental stock. Um, personal accountability is there with whoever is being licensed because they have the risk of the license being revoked. So it doesn't matter to me how many units that they have. Um, and, uh, it, you know, coming back to regulation, I'd just like to touch upon frat house type ideas or these mini hotels. These are few and far between. I have met so many uh, Airbnb hosts that are just like me and my family that are using this for secondary income. To, and to benefit uh, um, not only the fa our family, but our community. Uh, I, I regularly share my favorite go-to restaurants, my, you know, my favorite supermarket, uh, some unique things about our city and places to go for hike. You don't get that at a hotel. Um, and so these are our homes um, that benefit, uh, again, travelers and people paying money to our community, not just to me, but to our extended community because these people need to eat, they need to drink, they need to have entertainment, they need to go to, you know, um, watch the Thai cats, whatever it may be. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about this bylaw only being for, that you can only rent short term less than 28 days. I, I routinely like to rent long term to develop relationships uh, with new people in our city or again, the client that's renovating their house. It makes my life easier, not having as much turnover. So I'd like to see that struck down. Uh, the 120 days a year is arbitrary. It makes no sense. Um, some years I might want to rent more than that. Some days, years I might want to rent less than that. Let us decide, it's our homes. You collect our taxes. I wouldn't want to see my taxes decreased 
because of how many days I get to rent. It just, it makes a problem out of nothing. I don't understand number of days whatsoever. It's about the quality of, of, of the renter. I've also had the misfortune of having a long-term renter um, in, a, in, in a standard lease for 12 months. Uh, you know, it, it, those ended in disaster, lack of payment, um, you know, water bills that went unpaid that got added to my taxes after the fact, and I had to, had to pay someone's water. We've all heard the, heard the stories. Um, you know, I, I, I now want to move to um, to this idea about housing supply that was indicated quite a bit in the in the planning committee documents. Um, you know, how many homes are you actually talking about adding back to the housing supply? How many are currently being um, um, being rented short term? And of those, if this restrictive policy came in, how many would actually go back and provide homes to other Hamiltonians? That's out of the purview of bylaws. This shouldn't be a bylaw to determine what someone does and doesn't do with their house with the sole goal or one of the sole goals of increasing housing stock. I find that very upsetting that, that, that this is even being mentioned. Housing supply needs to be addressed. It doesn't need to be addressed with short-term rentals or long-term rentals. It needs to be addressed at a grassroots level uh, perhaps with with Acorn or, or those types of um, those types of, of organizations, or with the local builders, um, with the pr provincial government, with the federal government, it shouldn't be on the backs of private citizens who want to rent their house for periods less than or greater than 28 days, which again is an arbitrary number. Um, affordability was also mentioned. You know, you got to ask the question: If these homes all got got put back on the market, are we really going to see a decrease in the cost of the average home in Hamilton? We're talking about a pittance of homes relative to the thousands and thousands and thousands of homes. I, I can't even guess how many homes exist uh, in our rental pool and, or so, sorry, in our in our city, and how many would, could be potentially in this short-term rental pool. I'm trying to move quickly here because I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I find the fees exorbitant, you know, $72 one-time fee, sure, for administration, $6 fee, sure, uh, and then talking up to $390 fee for per year and another $320 fee per year. Um, these things to me just don't make sense. Uh, finally, I think I'm getting towards the end of my list here, um, uh, talking about noise complaints. How do we deal with noise complaints right now with long-term tenants, with homeowners? We have bylaw and we have police. If there's noise complaints, let's do an education campaign that if a short-term rental has a noise complaint, call bylaw, call police, let's deal with it. We, we don't want this in our community. How do, how do we deal with garbage? We have bylaw for that. How much complaints of bylaw, how much complaints of noise are specifically attributable to short-term rentals? If the staff would have indicated this, this would make our lives much easier because we're, we're trying to fix an undocumented problem. There is nothing in here documenting the number of complaints, the, qual the, the quality of the complaints, um, parking. Again, we have bylaw uh, uh, to cover that. Whether a long-term tenant or a homeowner decides to have a massive uh, party on the weekend and have all kinds of cars on the street. What does that mean for um, uh, um, uh, the other uh, neighbors? They call bylaw, they call the police. At the end of the day, this is what we already have in place and this is all that we need. Um, safety and negative behaviors was, all, was also uh, mentioned, agreed. But most, of all, if not all travelers are not coming to cause a disturbance. People don't want trouble. Uh, and there are ways to potentially vet this out through the Airbnb platform. Um, and I'm, I'm all about all of these concerns. I just don't want to have um, multiple levels of government overreach stepping on us private citizens. Again, rate paying private citizens, voters in our community. Uh, I, and by the way, I, I'm born and raised in this community. I, I, I've been here for, for my entire life other than my education. Um, I want to thank you at this time, and I specifically want to mention two things, and that is, I mentioned at the start, Jeff Beatty. Uh, I'm sure that you're listening. Uh, we spoke on the phone uh, during um, uh, your campaigning, and I asked you about short-term rentals, and if just to jog your memory uh, and perhaps a memory of, and to let your fellow counselors know, your comment was you walked almost every street in, in, your di in our district, you knocked on almost every door, and you met a lot of of people answering the door that were short-term tenants that were here on an, staying on an Airbnb and how pleasantly surprised you told me you were of these people being nice people, being cordial, having an interest in politics, having an interest in, in the election. 
um, and just wanting to be good people. And that's the people that I like to host and, and that's the people that you met. So, uh, you know, I ask for your vote here to help help strike down this bylaw and send it back to staff uh, and ask them to um, to address real issues and not, not frankly make believe ones. The other councillor, Matt Francis, uh, we met uh, as well. You may remember me and, and, and we discussed this. Obviously you weren't up to speed in this yet. I hope by now that you are. And I hope you remember that you said that, you know, government doesn't need to interfere in everything that private citizens do and that we should have limits to, 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 to how many issues need to get solved. Let's focus on, on the big issues here. Um, in conclusion, that's what I would like to say. Uh, let's regulate, let's make it smart, let's not make it restrictive, let's not make it punishing, uh, let's make it successful for everyone. Um, so let's eliminate um, um, the 120 days, let's eliminate uh, principal residence only, that you can do it in secondary suites. Let's allow for multiple um, listing operators if they choose. And again, you can tie all of those multiple listings to one operator, and if one goes down, they all go down. There are ways to make this make this effective without just saying no. I think putting a big no in front of all of us is just upsetting and it's ill-timed, especially given we're just recovering from uh, the COVID uh, uh, um, problems we're having and the recession that we're in. Uh, I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm available uh, through um, the Legislative Coordinator, Lisa. If you have any further questions for me or wanna hear my experience, uh, she has my contact details. I'm happy to sit down with any of you and 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 inform you as to what the real uh, world is like in the short-term rental business, short-term rental, um, I shouldn't call it a business, uh, hosting world. Thank you again, good, good night. Thank you. We have one additional pre-recorded uh, delegation in the form of Shannon Roberts. I, I trust we're setting that up. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Westman. I'm an owner of two homes in Hamilton, and I currently offer uh, a second dwelling on one home as an Airbnb, and the other dwelling is right beside the Hamilton General Hospital, and rent it short term to mostly patients that are coming in for surgeries and family that want to be with them during that time. Uh, I just wanted to make this video uh, to express uh, some of my concerns about the ch upcoming changes and wanted to point out the value that uh, the incoming visitors have had using my service, uh, the little or no impact to my neighbors. In fact, that they have used the service many times for when they have vis Hamilton visiting, understands that there has to be some regulation, but I'd like to point out that uh, minimal 120 days and uh, not allowing a second dwelling on the same property to be used as an Airbnb would impact that. And I would uh, would shut both down and I would not entertain putting a tenant in any of those properties uh, or selling it. Um, I would just use it with well, the way I am currently and just offering the, where I was offering a small portion of that to Airbnb, we'll close that part down. Uh, with the Landlord Tenancy Act the way it is, uh, I could not, risk my family or risk my revenue by having a tenant in there and uh, the troubles that that could happen. So uh, thanks again for your time and I appreciate you allowing us to add input. Thank you. Um, that was a pre-recorded video, but um, as the chair of this committee, I feel obliged to note that I, it is against the law to be driving and um, video providing a videotape like that. It's uh, and as a local government who is uh, our first and foremost responsibility is the safety of all residents. I would counsel and encourage um, every single individual who is watching: don't do that. Okay. Um,
That's the conclusion, I believe, of all of our, our delegates. I will look to Elsie Kelsey to see if she has been advised of anybody who, when I called out earlier, happens to be here now. No? Okay. Thank you very much. So um, I need a mover and a seconder to receive the delegations. Moved by Councillor Alex Wilson, seconded by Councillor Tammy Wang. Councillor Pauls? Got it. Thank you. That carries 12 to 0. Um, I'd like to thank all the delegates who participated um, in today's uh, deliberations thus far. I appreciate we, as a committee, appreciate your time. Um, and your uh, civility and your delegation. Uh, thank you for your participation and sharing your information with us. Uh, members of the committee, uh, we're now to slide into the consent portion. I would like to uh, test the will of the committee. If you would like to break for, for lunch after the consent item, or if you have any thoughts. After 9.1, uh, we will. I will look uh, to committee for your consent then to, to break for 30 minutes for uh, lunch and also to enable our uh, good staff to have a break as well. So if we can go on to 9.1, which is to extend to extend and open a portion of lands as public highway being Nashville Circle by bylaw um, by bylaw, and this is PED 23025. I need a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendations. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. Is there any discussion on this consent item? I don't see any, so if we can um, have, a, have a vote on that, please. Is that... That carries 12 to 0. Okay, um, I'm going to formally ask for your uh, approval and support for a 30-minute uh, lunch break and um, moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Pattison. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there something I said? The vote is up. Councillor Kretsch and Councillor Francis. Thank you very much. We will reconvene at uh, 1232. Thank you.
Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, we have reconvened as a planning committee after a, a short uh, lunch break. Um, it is January the 17th, 2023. Order, please. Um, we are now entering the public, uh, public hearing portion and the public has been advised of how to pre-register to delegate at the public meetings on today's agenda. Members of the public, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council makes a decision regarding the development applications before us today, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal, unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. We're on to item 10.1, applications for the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 3250 and 3260 Homestead Drive, report PED 23002. Would the committee like to see the staff presentation? I'm seeing nods. If staff are present who would be able to assist us. Good afternoon. Test, test. Okay, yeah, very good. Just a reminder, if you could introduce yourself, thank you. Sorry, Lisa, I'm just trying to find them. Let's all rate Councillor Paul's room. Chair, members of the committee, um, and staff and public in attendance. My name is James Van Roy. I'm a senior planner with our uh, development planning division. And today I'm going to be discussing a Urban Hamilton official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment applications uh, for lands located at 3250 Homestead Drive and 3260 Homestead Drive in Mount Hope. Um, staff are recommending approval uh, for these applications. Uh, and it would effectively permit a three-story, 40-unit uh, multiple dwelling on the subject lands. Um, in a moment, I'll just provide you a bit of the, the context of the site and provide you a bit of its location. Go ahead to share. So um, here we have our site. Again, this is 3250 and 3260 Homestead Drive at the corner of uh, Longview Drive. It's on the west side of Homestead Drive and the south side of Longview. Um, here we have our subject lands and uh, an aerial of the surrounding area. Uh, so to the north, we have a, uh, uh, a manufacturing use. To the east, we, you can see a bit of land that's slated for development. Uh, those will be uh, townhouses. And we also have a single detached dwelling to the east. Uh, to the south, we have single detached dwellings. And to the west of the site, we also have single detached dwellings. 
Again, just to go over what we're uh, looking at today, this is a 40 unit multiple dwelling. Uh, it's accompanied by 50 parking spaces. Um, and the applicant is looking for a site specific modification to move the principal entrance. Uh, so it's located uh, facing the, the parking lot rather than what we would typically require, which is at the street. And here we have our elevation drawings. Uh, again, it's a three story, 40 unit multiple dwelling. The north elevation would be as if you're looking at the site uh, from Longview Drive and the south elevation would be if you're looking at the site from the parking lot. And just to take you on a quick photo tour, uh, this is the subject site, uh, 3250 Homestead Drive is on the right hand side of the photo and 3260 Homestead Drive is on the left side of the photo here. Both would be demolished uh, following a site plan application if this application was approved. This is looking north on Homestead Drive, so towards, if you're looking to, going towards the city of Hamilton. And here we have a view looking south on Homestead Drive. You can see those townhouses that are uh, currently under development on the left-hand side of the picture. And on the immediate right-hand side of the picture would be the subject site. Here we have the neighboring property to the south of the site. It's a single detached dwelling. Here we have the property that's north of the site. Again, this is the manufacturing use or steelworks, uh, fa steel fabrication uh, building. And here we have uh, the lands that are slated for townhouse development that are directly east of the site. Again, this is just a, a view of what the townhouse development would be look, look like eventually uh, east of this subject property. Um, here we have a view of the single detached dwelling that uh, neighbors the property on the west side of the site. And here we have two uh, single detached dwellings that are on the west side of the site as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, and here we are, are back to the site. This is the view of the site from Longview Drive. In terms of our circulation process, the application was circulated to property owners within 120 meters of the subject lands. And just to provide a high level overview of the concerns that we heard, uh, the concerns were with regards to parking, density, drainage, separation and buffering, um, shadowing and garbage. And I can briefly touch on those concerns uh, if you have any questions regarding them. Um, but in closing, we find that the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment can be supported as they're consistent with the uh, provincial policy statement and conform to a place to grow growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And they will comply with the general intent of the official um, Urban Hamilton official plan and uh, uh, the Mount Hope secondary plan upon approval of this amendment. Um, the proposal represents good planning by increasing the supply of housing units, making efficient use of land and the existing infrastructure within the urban boundary and supporting public transit. This concludes, concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senior Planner Roy. Are there any questions for Senior Planner Roy? I recognize Councillor Tadison. Through the chair, um, did the developers include comp, not, did they consider some of those um, issues that came forward from the residents? Uh, yeah, through the chair, if you would like, I can speak to a few of the concerns that we heard. So uh, we did hear a concern with respect to parking. Um, this development would only be required to meet 31 parking spaces. They are providing 50 parking spaces. Um, with regards to density, they are, uh, there is a, a unit count. It would be 100 units per hectare is what they're providing, which meets our official plan policies. They're not exceeding. Um, they're not being excessive in that amount. Um, it would, through the site plan process, with respect to drainage concerns, we would be requiring a, an updated grading plan. Um, those are the few that I have. Uh, also with respect to the garbage concern, that, that's also something that's dealt through our site plan approval process. I just wanna say that I do agree that this is good planning and thank you for the efforts that went in to do it. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Councillor Beatty, please. Thank you, and through you, Chair. In terms of the parking uh, allocation per unit, I'm wondering if you could uh, offer what that what that number looks like. It's merely uh, a curiosity of mine. Is it 1.15 or what, what's the number? Uh, through the Chair, it's uh, so it's our it's our zoning bylaw 05200 standard that we use. We base the parking on the um, size of the units whether they're over 50 square meters or um, under uh, 50 square meters. 
So uh, these are all units that are, will be over that 50 square meter. So we apply the, uh, the there's a standard, um, I can't recall off the top of my head what that range is, but it, it could upwards, 1.25 would be the maximum. And they're, they're going over. So then through the chair, thank you. The, uh, the finished product then with 50 parking stalls allocated uh, will be, would be above the threshold of 1.25? It would meet. It would meet that threshold. That it would meet that threshold, but uh, sorry, it would meet or exceed. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it's not less than the minimum, and it's not over the maximum. That okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So thank you. Falls within the threshold through the chair. So to to summarize, it does not exceed the maximum threshold. Correct. But it exceeds the minimum. Yeah. Okay. Which is permitted. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you again. If I can have a mover and a seconder to receive this presentation, moved by Councillor Tattison and seconded by Councillor Spedafora. carries 12 to nothing thank you um mr matt johnston of urban solutions is in attendance today are you in support of the staff recommendation Good afternoon members of committee and the public staff matt johnston urban solutions uh yes in full support of the staff recommendation as prepared so i thank um staff for their hard work there I do have a presentation that's available. I can walk through um, a few details um, or happy to just make myself available for questions. Eddie, what say you? Would you like to see the agent's presentation? I don't see an, I don't see an uptick. So thank you very much for uh, being present and for noting in the public record of your support for the staff recommendation. Thank you, and I, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge Mr. Dave Alvasari, the proponent, and all the, the good work that they do, and uh, look forward to bringing the on stream in Mount Hope. Thank, thank you. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation from the agent, moved by Councillor Tattison Tadis and seconded by Councillor Francis. Our vote is up. Carries 12 to nothing. According to the Planning Act, I have to um, make this public, uh, ask this public question three times. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this matter at this public meeting? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this public meeting? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this public meeting? Please note that there, uh, there is no one. I need a mover and a seconder that the written submissions in the staff report were received and considered by the committee and that the public meeting be closed. It's moved by Councillor Tattison, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. Is that? Thank you. That carries 12 to nothing, and I need a mover and a seconder to approve this, the report recommendations. Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Tadison. Is that? Thank you, that carries 12 to nothing. We're moving on to 
Item 10.2, application for amendments to the Urban Hamilton Official Plan Stony Creek Zoning Bylaw Number 3692-92 and Hamilton Zoning Bylaw Number 05200 and draft plan of sub subdivision for lands located at 15 Ridgeview Drive, Stony Creek. The report number is PED 23003. It is in Ward 9. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? Yes, please. Thank you. So good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of committee, fellow staff and members of the public in attendance this afternoon. I'm Michael Fiorino, planner with the City of Hamilton's Planning Division, uh, sorry, Development Planning Division. Before you today is an application for an amendment to the Urban Hamilton Official Plan, zoning bylaw amendments to the Stony Creek Zoning Bylaw 3692-92, Hamilton Zoning Bylaw 05200, and draft plan a subdivision for lands located at 15 Ridgeview Drive, Stony Creek. The proposal will implement uh, well, the proposal will implement the development of 25 lots for single detached dwellings, 29 street townhouse dwellings, 51 townhouse dwellings, one block for parkland for the connection to future neighborhood park, along with the extension of public roads and the dedication of future stormwater management blocks to the city. Subject land is approximately 5.6 hectares in size and lo is located along the escarpment brow between First Road West and Bradshaw Drive. As mentioned, to the north is the escarpment. To the east is uh, vacant lands zoned for single detached dwellings. And to the south and west are vacant lands currently subject to, or currently being reviewed under separate development proposals. The purpose of the official plan amendment will amend the Nash Neighborhood Secondary Plan to modify the boundaries of the low density two and low density two resident, sorry, low density residential 2H utility and neighborhood park designations to permit the redesignation of lands along the escarpment brow from low density two to natural open space to permit a site specific policy area for decrease in density for the low density residential 2H designation for block 28 and to permit the removal of the hedgerow identification. In this image uh, in the top right hand corner, these are the modification and realignment. And on the next slide, you'll see this is what it will look like. Uh, and this is the subject lands in this area here. The zoning bylaw amendment will permit a change in zoning from the neighborhood development zone to the single residential R4 zone the single residential R4 modified, multiple residential RM2 modified, and multiple residential RM3 modified with a holding. Modification to the R4 single detached residential zone is for a reduced side yard setback for the corner lot. Modifications to the RM2 zone for multiple residential include reduced minimum side yard for end units and a maximum height. Uh, so these, the R4 and the RM2 are the, the lands located uh, along the street A, the extension of street A, blocks 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, and 34, as well as the lots uh, 1 to 25. Modifications to the RM3 zone, uh, located shown as blocks 28 and 27, uh, are for reduced minimum side yard, 
uh, sorry, lot size, frontage, front, rear, and side yard setbacks, as well as lot coverage and the inclusion of visitor parking. Staff are supportive of these modifications. As mentioned, a holding provision has been recommended for the two blocks for a multiple residential RM3 zone, uh, and this will ensure the completion and conveyance of the land for stormwater management, ensuring the top of grade elevation for your rear yard catch basins, and until such time as the ultimate stormwater managed pond is approved by all agencies. As well, the neighborhood or the zoning bylaw amendment is for a change in zoning from the neighborhood development to the conservation hazard land P5 zone and neighborhood park P1 zone in Hamilton zoning bylaw 05200. As I mentioned, the subject lands are located along the escarpment brow and have been designated escarpment urban area within the Niagara escarpment plan with a portion within, falling within the escarpment natural area designation. To permit the proposed development, a Niagara escarpment commission development permit, including the review of visual impact assessment was required. On November 24th, 2022, the Niagara escarpment issued a development permit for the proposal. However, uh, the development permit has since been appealed and is subject to an Ontario Land Tribunal appeal. Staff have amended the recommendation B and C of the report and revised the zoning bylaws to include additional holding over the subject lands. The holding may be lifted once the Niagara Government Commission development permit becomes final and binding and conditions are cleared. Uh, discussions with the applicant uh, are in agreement with, with these uh, revisions. Public notice was provided in accordance with the Planning Act to property owners within 120 metres of the subject lands. As well, the applicant has provided additional consultation by way of a public information letter uh, in which they described the, the proposal, purpose effect, and provided additional contact information. Just going to provide some context. So this, and I'll just go back for a second. So the first picture is going to be from Bradshaw Drive that's along the east side of the subject lands. That's facing north, uh, northwest. And the tree line at the, at the back there is the escarpment brow. So now this is located along Ridgeview Drive, the existing Ridgeview Drive. Uh, we're still facing north. This is now northeast. Looking at the tree line escarpment, you can kind of see the, the middle of the um, the subject lands. Uh, continuing to look uh, east, this is southeast. Uh, there's in the background, you can see some of the existing uh, single detached and street townhouse dwellings. Now we're just uh, facing southwest, uh, facing first, street, first road west. This is the existing Ridgeview Drive, uh, just called a sac uh, a little bit in. And that's facing uh, west again. And this is from the same location along Ridgeview Drive, and they're now facing west uh, to war along First Road. So this is First Road West, and we're facing south, and you can see the uh, subject lands on the left, as well as uh, vacant lands. And that's one of the properties that are also under uh, development proposal at this time. Based on the foregoing, the proposal has merit and can be supported as it is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms with the growth plan for the greater growth of Horseshoe, and complies with the general intent of the Urban Hamilton official plan. In particular, the function, scale, design, function and scale and design of low density residential policies as they relate to residential intensification and complete communities in the neighborhood's designation and the National Neighborhood Secondary Plan. This concludes my presentation. Be glad to answer any questions of committee. Thank you, Planner, for your reno. Um, are there any questions of the planner? Recognize Councillor Danko. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I guess, first of all, just uh, this application is in the name of 146769 Ontario, Inc. Um, I'm setting a personal policy for this term that I want to know who the actual applicants are. So do we know specifically who that is? Sorry, yeah, yes, we do know who the, the owners are. Uh, they're actually in attendance today. Uh, okay. Their name is Pia and, and uh, Fabio. 
Okay, so it's the care of Fabio and Pia uh, Neri, is it? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, how many units are in this development? Uh, I understand there are a mix of singles and towns, but how many units in total? Uh, so 54, uh, 105 ish. Sorry, my math's not uh, the greatest, but 105 around there. Thank you. And if I understand from the report that the, the total density is 32.9 units per hectare? Uh, yes, around there. The, there's a little bit of fluctuation between the, the low density 2 and the low density 2H, but yes. But overall, yep. we're looking at about 32.9 units per hectare. Um, so it, it's funny, we were just having a discussion yesterday about minimum densities, and I had said in the entire last term of council, I don't remember a single application coming forward that had a density less than at least 70 or 80 units per hectare. So can you help me to understand why this particular application is so low? Yeah, so there's a, there's a, a couple, through the chair, sorry. Uh, there's a couple of factors. Um, you do have some regulation from the Niagara Escarpment Commission, so you have setbacks in, uh, that cater um, needing to provide uh, push a little bit further. So what that has had a little bit of effect on the design uh, of the subject lands. Um, and just to point out uh, the, the one amendment for the decrease, it's due to um, the shape of the, the block. Um, and part of that is due to servicing constraints uh, where piping and, and services will need to be uh, provided uh, along that. And then the other component too is there is Ridgeview Drive. And sorry, I'll, I can. I'm sorry, Planner, could you just um, maybe speak um, up a little bit and into the mic? Thank you. Sorry. And, and then the other factor would be Ridgeview Drive is part of it is existing. So you have to, to work with that uh, design and extension of that roadway. Okay. Um, can you help me? The Urban Hamilton official plan that was passed by the previous term of council, uh, I'm just trying to remember what the minimum density requirement was that was approved as part of that plan. I think it was 80 units per hectare, but I'm, I can't quite recall. I, I can't quite recall, but I'm, uh, the, the densities that were that are refined through the secondary plan, they're looking from the 20, for the low density to 20 to 39 and then 30 to 49 uh, for, for, the, for this area. So that was what was anticipated um, for, for the, the National Neighborhood Secondary Plan. Okay, so I guess, Madam Chairman, I have some comments on this uh, when we get to debate, uh, but those are all the questions I have for, uh, for planning staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Planner. Any further questions? Councillor Kazar, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just picking up on Councillor Danko's question uh, through the Chair, um, just on the density. So over 75 last term of Council is what Councillor Danko recalls, and this is 32-ish, you said. So can you just elaborate on some of the concessions you're talking about because of uh, the location? It just seems a significant drop in density, and I didn't get that fully explained to me from your answer. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, sorry. So um, maybe... Oh, sorry. Yeah, visual would be great. Uh, Would you like to put it back up on the screen? Might be helpful. Sorry, so the, the first part portion that I was speaking to was the, um, the setbacks from the escarpment. So minimum 30 meter setback sorry, is required. Uh, in addition to that, there's a 10 meter VPZ um, from the escarpment. So that's, that's speaking to, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, this is more northern portion. So you're having a portion of the, uh, the sites uh, cut off through there. Um, what that does is it kind of gives you a starting point uh, from there, as, uh, so that that's kind of cutting in. So you have that certain regulation. Um, with that, it kind of dictates some of the design um, for that. Um, we could, 
you know, there can be, there can always be different design, you know, smaller units in, in that regard. But with the road extension, uh, the two locations where it does need to meet from the extension of Ridgeview Drive, as well as Bradshaw Drive, uh, it is limiting. The, the existing or the uh, secondary plan as is uh, shown today, uh, did have a different road network. Uh, that would have actually been more of a hindrance for the density and would have or previously anticipated a little bit of a lower density. Uh, this has actually been an increase. Um, now, the, the other components to are um, that you have the block 2037 here. That's an, that is the uh, servicing that needs to be brought forward to the lands to the south. It kind of chops up the two blocks. So limiting the amount of um, units that could be or designed uh, comprehensively. Some of these lots um, as well for singles are a little bit larger, but that again is due to the curvature of the road and the extension of the road. That's, that's adding to some of the decrease in the density. So, yeah, as a follow up then on the north side, the blocks like block 29, 30, I think are the numbers there starting from the left. Are those individual residential lots? N no, no, sorry. Those are, those are blocks for street townhouses. I think there's about okay. eight units in each in each set of uh, blocks. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying. And then a second question on a different topic. You mentioned the el elimination of a hedgerow. I think in the report, could you just please describe that kind of from a basic level and what's happening and what the impacts are? Through yeah, the chair, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so uh, through the chair, uh, hedgerow has been um, identified to be removed. That is see it right here, the portion here to the to the south of these lands. Um, and an environmental impact study was completed, as well as a tree management plan, uh, identifying that uh, the quality uh, and the majority of the the trees or sorry, the vegetation uh, was of not great health and there were invasive species. Um, so preserving the, the hedgerow uh, wouldn't be the, the best option the, due to the, the quality. So that is gonna be, compensation will be provided and that's gonna be looked at through the, the vegetation protection zone uh, to the escarpment, uh, located at the escarpment. So building up that. So really looking at in, in ensuring better quality than just, just quality or qu quantity. Uh, for that location. Okay, thank you. Just one supplemental then. So the compensation plan and how that happens is in the future? Did yeah, I so you correctly? Tree management, a tree management plan uh, through the chair will be provided as a condition of draft plan. Um, the blocks, blocks 27 and 28, those for uh, block townhouses, those will be reviewed through site plan uh, at, a, at a later date. So any tree management that will be uh, reviewed at that point. But there is condition for compensation uh, for any trees that aren't provided. Uh, and, but most of the, the compensation and, and uh, management or addition will be within the, the, VP, the vegetation protection zone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's all. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any further questions uh, to our planner? Councillor Francis, please. I know it's pretty uh, an unusual question, but <clears throat> I was kind of wondering why you use such an old picture, um, slide 12 and 13 there. I mean, this is well before that, uh, that whole area has been. So is this, these were, I took these last. This is, yeah, sorry. This okay. was from the summer, yeah. or well, sorry, is, from the, the winter. This is from Pat, this? The, yeah, like a week or two ago. Okay, well, maybe you just, I guess with the, uh, you can't see further up the road, but there's been quite a bit of development in that area, uh, correct? Correct, yes. To, it, to the this, these pictures are facing uh, north towards the escarpment. The majority of the, the development uh, that has occurred, it would be south of this or behind this image. Could I get that back up real quick, just to take a look at that? Sorry, I think this is the one you're looking for. The, this is to the south. Oh, sorry. Sorry, so these lands, these are to the south. Those are right behind. Um, let's see if this one's... 
Okay, this this has kind of got the both images where you have the escarpment as well as the the existing to the south of the subject lands. And that's a little bit more general. You can kind of see. Sorry, house is all located over here as well. Just some dirt in the way. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I I, I guess I uh, need glasses. <laughs> The iPhone quality is, it's not that. <laughs> through, through the chair, please. And if I could ask you, Planner, just to speak directly into oh, the microphone. Thank you. Is that it? That, no, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, any further questions? Councillor Danko, could you take the chair for a moment? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, to the Planner, uh, how, uh, what, what will be the walking route to school, the anticipated um, route with this uh, development plan? So, through the chair. So th through the chair, the secondary plan uh, does have um, the urbanization. Now these, I think what you're seeing is uh, First Road West hasn't been fully urbanized and we're that will be part of uh, development and uh, Ridgeview Drive. That that'll be a fur, fully urbanized road uh, with with a sidewalk. The the first road west. I think you're you're referring to the the, the school located uh, kind of. I believe that's Green Mountain Road. Um, that would occur uh, along first road west. Uh, these other three blocks still uh, to the south of the subject land still haven't been developed. So the road network would still be a little bit to be determined at this point. So, sorry, Chair, I'm not, um, that is my route to the, the punch bowl pie place, but um, I'm not as familiar. So, just so I'm clear, you're stating that there are or there are not sidewalks en route to the present school? Uh, at this time, uh, when I went out to see the site, there are sidewalks till about, uh, forget this this name of the road but I believe it's Brad uh, Bradshaw uh, so, so about this area uh, but the rest is not urbanized uh, and that will occur as the developments proceed uh, the additional subdivision developments from to the south proceed they, they'll be responsible for urbanizing and adding sidewalks I see um, thank you through the chair uh, is this the development that impacts butternut trees uh, there is a butternut tree that is proposed to be removed. Uh, it has been identified as the, the or sorry, the the health has been identified that it's uh, declining. Um, any butternut uh, removal uh, is dealt with through the ministry, uh, through the Endangered Species Act. So they would need to be, in, or the applicant will need to be in compliance for any removal of that uh, type of species. That is a condition that has been included in the draft plan of conditions for the subdivision agreement. Thank you. I'll take the chair back. Thank you, Councillor Danko. Councillor Alex Wilson. Um, just a specific follow up from Councillor Wilson's question about the butternut tree. Um, under the MECP guidelines, there are specific categories. Uh, I heard mentioned through the chair that the health was declining. Could you specify, I forget whether it's category, what, what the word is, but there's pots essentially where the, the health is categorized. What designation does this tree have? I will I'll have to look that up. Uh, I'll have to uh, just double check. Um, but it was declining. I believe there was uh, not, and I, I can't, can't remember the, the technical term, uh, but I'll, I'll have that, uh, I'll look that up. Um, and then there, as part of that, uh, I believe it's five replacement uh, trees that are required uh, as a base, and uh, that'll be further reviewed through the subdivision condition. Thank you. Councillor? Thanks. Yeah, no further questions. I was just seeking some specific clarification as I believe there's multiple categories of declining health and just getting a sense of what specifically we're talking about would be helpful. Thank you. I see no further questions. Uh, thank you to the planner for your assistance uh, today. I uh, may have a mover and a seconder to receive this presentation. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Beatty.
Thank you. That carries 12 to nothing. Um, we have um, Mr. Franz Klobhofer, I beg your pardon if I've mispronounced that, um, with AJ Clarks and Associates in attendance today. Um, as per our last file, we need to hear a verbal report whether you are in support of the staff recommendation or not. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of committee. Just stand over here, John. Good uh, my name is Franz Kleipel from a registered professional planner with the AJ Clark and Associates. Uh, with me today is Jennifer Car Clark, professional engineer, also with the same firm. I'm the planner with Carriage of the File. Um, don't have a presentation today, but I'm going to speak to a couple of points and questions that were just raised. Um, one thing I'd like to note right off the bat is that the densities proposed on the site are compliant with the secondary plan overall. There is one amendment for one particular block. Simply because of the shape of the block, we end up with a slightly lower density range. But when you look at the overall proposal before you, it is meeting those requirements. I will note that density is on the lower end of the permitted range. The reason for that, to be very clear, is because we are on the escarpment brow. We have a 30 meter setback from the brow that is required. We're adding an additional 10 meter vegetation buffer beyond the existing drip line. When you factor in that amount of naturalized area that is being maintained through this application, that is how you end up on the lower range of the, density, of the densities that are permitted within this development. Um, to speak to the point regarding butternuts, it is on the lower end of the range that you have. It is riddled with cankers. It has been recommended that it be removed and that there be planting compensation provided within the buffer area that has been vetted by natural heritage staff. It has been discussed extensively and there will be a planting plan that will have to be approved by the ministry. That will be dealt with. Uh, beyond that, I do not have a presentation. Jen and I are both here to answer any questions you may have and I'd be open to uh, answering any that you, you would like to bring before me now. Thank you. Any, excuse me, are there any questions? Thank you very much for your attendance today. Thank you. May I have a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation from the agent? You, did you give your oral support? Apologies, I did miss that point. We have, we have certainly reviewed the staff report and we are supportive of staff's recommendation going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. A mover and a seconder, Councillor Tattison and Councillor Nan to receive the, um, the delegation from the agent. Thank you. Thank you, that carries 12 to nothing. Are there any members of the public that would wish to speak at this public meeting? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this public meeting? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this public meeting? Please record that there have been there's no members of the public here. May I have a mover and a seconder that the public submissions regarding this matter were received and considered by the committee and that the public meeting be closed. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Wayne. Is that? You. That carries 12 to nothing. Um, Kelsey, Kelsey now is where I'm looking for support for the amendments to clauses B, H1, and C dot dot. I need a mover and a seconder to amend the report recommendations to add those clauses, to add those clauses. I could have a mover and a seconder trolling Councillor Spatafora 
Councillor Wayne. Carries 12 to nothing. Okay. On the report recommendations as amended, uh, we have a question uh, in the Councillor Denko, please, on the report as amended. Thank you. Um, so just on, on the, the final recommendation that's before us, um, so, the city of Hamilton set our official plan density. There is a sub uh, plan, the, the Nash, Nash neighborhood secondary plan. What is the density, the minimum density in the Nash neighborhood secondary plan? Thank you. Who on staff can assist us on this question? Through the chair to the councillor, I don't have the overall secondary plan densities available. Um, as Mr. Fiorino explained, aside from that one block 28, which is that sort of, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a, a it's, it's irregular, thank you, it's an irregular shape lot. That is the only block where the densities are being proposed to be lowered. And that is, as Mr. Fiorino explained, a result of the location of Ridgeview, the stormwater management pond, and the infrastructure that's required. Everywhere else across the proposed lands, they are in compliance with the secondary plan and the secondary plan densities. If I could just uh, interject for a moment, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. My apologies. Anita Fabak, Director of Development Planning. Thank you. Councillor. Thank you. I guess what I'm struggling with is how to reconcile that this application is in fact consistent with the provincial policy statement. The minister uh, went out of his way to eliminate height restrictions and, and minimum density restrictions in the City of Hamilton secondary plans in their uh, imposition of the uh, solution to the Hamilton urban boundary. So was the Nash neighborhood secondary plan included in those 77 modifications made by the minister. Thank you, to staff. Uh, Steve Robichaud, Director of Planning and Chief Planner. The minister's modifications, there were no amendments proposed to the Nash Neighborhood Secondary Plan that was formed and in, incorporated into OPA 167. The minister's general text amendments to OPA 167 would be applicable um, to the Nash neighborhood as it relates to building heights. You may recall that the city's uh, staff had recommended and council adopted as part of OPA 167 a policy saying that no building should be taller than 30 stories or the height of the escarpment. That policy was sort of a citywide basis and was struck down. As it relates to OPA 167, one of the th changes that we did make was we removed density from the low, medium, and high uh, building height calculations for planning purposes because we were getting those technical amendments where every multiple dwelling was coming in at higher than the permitted density and to provide some clarification and to say that density would be used for the purposes of preparing secondary plans and or for the development of the infrastructure master plans. There is a general policy in the U in the urban Hamilton official plan that says where there's a conflict between the parent volume one and the secondary plan policies, the secondary plan policies prevail. This is a quote unquote legacy secondary plan that it was prepared prior to the adoption of the UHOP and it was migrated into the urban Hamilton official plan and it reflected at that time the densities that would have been in the former city of Stony Creek official plan, which are considerably less than the provincial policies or those other considerations. What we had within the overall Nash neighborhood, my recollection is there is a population target of plus or minus 3,600 units, but there is no overall density. I would have to go back and do that calculation. Part of the 
issue with this neighborhood is you have the two you have the former landfills in um, the quarrying operation so they do distort the density number if you include them because the PPS would not exclude the quarries or the landfills from the cal overall calculation of density at a provincial level you get an artificially low density um, and as staff had indicated this proposal was generally consistent with the uh, secondary plan density ranges except for the fact that we have the irregular shaped parcel of land and you have the constraint, you have the natural heritage constraints related to the escarpment and the uh, Niagara escarpment general plan policies that they do not like to see skylighting, or I think they refer to a skylighting, where you have buildings that from or break up the escarpment um, top top of brow of the escarpment, so they end up pushing, wanting to see taller buildings pushed back. We had that situation when Losani Homes was doing their development closer to Centennial Parkway. They had to do um, very low profile two-story townhouse units in order to satisfy the visual impact of the Niagara Escarpment. So I think when you bring together all of those constraints, you end up with a very unique situation as it's applicable to this property. The policy framework for the lands to the what is it, to the south, to the north, uh, going towards, I believe it's Bradshaw Drive, where we're seeing more densities that we've been consistent with what council has seen in the past three to five years, where they will be at those sort of higher ranges of the density range, whether it's the medium density, low density, being in that 50 to 60 units per hectare, or the medium density coming in at that 75 units to hectare, plus the uh, development between Empire and I think it's Red Hill Vista, which is a fairly dense community in terms of the form of development. So collectively, when you add in the Nash neighborhood within the broader West Hamilton or Heritage Green planning area, we're generally seeing those higher densities in that new form of urban development than traditionally seen. It's just the anomaly of this particular site in relation to the natural features and some of the other constraints, which is why we're sort of seeing that um, lower than anticipated density um, in terms of this location because of the irregular shape of the property we're essentially being a triangle and it is very hard to efficiently maximize the land use of a triangle and that was one of the issues that we worked with the applicant and still being very sensitive in designing with nature. Um, one of the considerations because of the proximity to the escarpment was we wanted to sort of have that designing with nature first approach to ensure that it would be compatible with the natural environment and some of the other constraints surrounding these properties. I apologize for the long answer but I just wanted to put it in a bit of a context what we were trying to achieve here and why in this situation, um, you know, during the conversations with the applicant, we did look at multiple reiterations. I think it was five or six submissions trying to look for an opportunity to achieve the density targets in the official plan, trying to look for where we can make the most efficient use of the land. And this was a compromise that balanced all of the considerations, the natural environment, civil engineering, stormwater management, and an effective development pattern, as well as having some the feedback from some of the abutting property owners in terms of some of the issues and concerns that they flagged, and then stepping back and looking at it holistically in terms of the overall secondary plan and the broader community within which it's situated. We felt comfortable recommending the application as it's currently before committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chief Planner Robichaud. Um, just a, a couple comments, Madam Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna be opposed to this application. Um, I understand the work that uh, that staff have put into this. I, I very much appreciate uh, Director Robichaud's explanation and, and from uh, the planner on the file. Uh, I appreciate the applicant and the careful consideration they've given into the proximity to the Niagara Escarpment Commission and the offset buffers for natural areas. I think those are all uh, well done and, and appreciated and obviously should be a part of the application. However, in the bigger picture, the province just increased the urban boundary by 2,200 hectares, 5,400 acres of land and added almost 800 hectares of greenbelt land specifically because we need as many homes as possible uh, to be built as quickly as possible. So. On this you know, specific property, we're utilizing 105 units. Even a modest greenfield density of 70 or 80 units per hectare would be you know, four times the amount of units. And I think when we're looking at our bigger picture uh, of a housing uh, crisis and trying to meet the province's goals of, uh, of increasing housing supply, uh, this property and others like it could be much higher utilized. Uh, it's right adjacent to uh, Centennial uh, Parkway. 
there's, I, I don't see any reason why, uh, you know, much higher density couldn't be applied here. That would still be reasonable and fit in with the neighborhood character. Um, it, ironically, the challenges of the developer development community to the Ontario Land Tribunal have been always more density. So if we were to deny this today, I think we would have a solid case before the tribunal on the basis that we are trying to maximize all available density within the current urban boundary. Um, so from a planning perspective, uh, uh, number one, I, I think we can do better. And number two, I think from a planning perspective, there are very good reasons why uh, this could be denied and supported on appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Critch, please. Thank you. Um, is this Nash secondary plan the same Nash secondary plan that was approved in 2009 and became effective in 2013? Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, to the Councillor, the, that secondary plan would have been the secondary plan into the Stony Creek official plan. And at the top, at time of adoption of the Urban Hamilton official plan, they were migrated into the Urban Hamilton official plan effectively as is. So for all intents and purposes, the short answer is yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is, as you described it, a legacy secondary plan. And I wonder how many other legacy secondary plans are there? Um, just off the top of your head, you don't have to have an exact figure, but approximately how many legacy secondary plans are there? Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, to the Councillor, there are probably approximately a 10 to 15 legacy, legacy secondary plans. They would include all of Stony Creek for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. portions of Mount Hope, um, portions of most of Ancaster would have these legacy secondary plans. And then there was, uh, Hamilton had a couple of legacy secondary plans as well. So I would say approximately 15 secondary plans that were migrated into the urban Hamilton official plan. We are currently in the process as part of the update to the completion of the low density zoning regulations doing a to bring them citywide as it relates to conversions and allowing for more housing opportunities, doing a review of all of those secondary plans and we'll be coming forward with a series of proposed amendments, both to those secondary plans and the zoning to harmonize the standards on a citywide basis and update those secondary plans. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's really helpful. That answered a couple other questions I had. And so the plan is to, um, I guess, deprioritize the legacy aspect here and move them into the um, Urban Hamilton official plan and to provide more density. Uh, my understanding too, in the different layers we're, we're playing with here, right, is we have like the official plan, secondary plan, and the site application process. And so I'd like to just linger here um, at this tier for a moment. Um, it's always been the policy as I understood that we look at things on a site-by-site -site basis, right? And so even though we may have a secondary plan in effect, um, you could of course make uh, recommendations or we can impose things um, at the site specific um, basis. So knowing that we're looking ahead to changing these and knowing that we're kind of moving the legacy piece behind, um, is there a reason why we didn't recommend something different in this specific site? Um, just curious. And then I have a couple questions. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, to the councillor. So you are correct. There is always a process for either the city or a proponent to look to amend the secondary plan. In this case, as the application was submitted, it was generally in conformity with secondary plan. And the task of the development planning section is to implement council's policy to the best of their abilities. And in that case would be through the implementation of a secondary plan. The other consideration what I forgot to mention was even though the province has amended OPA the official plan through OPA 167, applicants have the ability to um, utilize what's referred to as the clergy principle, where you are entitled to finish off under the policy framework under which you started. So had the city or through the province changed it to require either a different form of development or more density, the applicant could, could say, thank you, but that's not what I am interested in doing. And in accordance with clergy, I want to complete my application based on the policy framework that was in effect at the time of my application. That would not necessitate the need for an official plan amendment, but the applicant sort of gets the benefit of both worlds. They can either claim clergy and get all the good stuff under that, or they can look at the new policy framework and proceed with that if that works to their benefit. So we are sort of sometimes at a disadvantage when dealing with applicants in trying to um, 
change applications from the policy framework that was in effect when they evaluated their application or at the policy framework that's in effect at the time the application is coming forward to council. Thank you. Thank you. Crunch. Thank you to the chair. If I recall correctly from the, the it's low density one up to medium density two is kind of the range and there's different little shadings on the secondary plan that indicate where these densities would would be, I understand what is being said about the 30 meter setback and then the 10 meter additional setback um, for the drip line, how I get all that stuff. My question for you is like height wise, I know the Niagara Escarpment Commission usually has a feeling um, about the height of stuff, um, being that it's near on or adjacent to or friends with the escarpment. Um, in this situation, what would it look like, just like in a real, in a real like uh, short way if you could, like, what would it look like to make this denser on um, what's possible here in terms of additional density? Or is like it just absolutely impossible to make it denser? Mr. Robeshaw. Through the chair to the councillor. So there's a couple of things that would have to be considered. You mentioned the Niagara Scarman Commission. There are height uh, restrictions imposed. So that would be one of the factors that would have to be considered. And it is a, uh, I think it's about a three-story maximum. It's it's measured a little bit differently uh, for the Niagara Scarment Commission, but three stories. Um, and then we'd have to look at uh, the designations that are permitted within the secondary plan and the kinds of uses that are permitted. So there is a different category with a medium density generally that permits uh, townhouses and multiple dwellings. So there could be an opportunity to do something a multiple dwelling possibly in the range of three stories but again it is a it's a very unique site with uh limited opportunities and and some constraints so i'm not sure in terms of once you look at things like surface parking for a multiple dwelling the required landscape strips that come with that there are different standards that would have to be achieved and those would have to be addressed and at the, likely at the end of it all you'd probably be somewhere in the range of the same density range just maybe in a different built form. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, just to clarify, build on Ms. Fabeck's comments, as you will note in page three of Appendix C, it actually sets the height. It's 11 meters to, for the to peak of the roof to a maximum of 198.3 meters above sea level, which is a, we only we only use that MASL requirement, meters above sea level, when we're dealing with the Niagara Escarpment Commission, essentially, in terms of ensuring that buildings don't um, when you're looking at the skyline, the building doesn't become the predominant form. So given that constraint that you're essentially dealing with a two-story building to increase the density, it would either be smaller lots or that would be the only, that would be a suggestion maybe instead of to allow for single semis and street townhouses as opposed to just single detached dwellings within that R4 zone. And, and that would be a way of increasing within that low profile uh, restriction of the Niagara Escarpment Commission, you'd be looking at just broadening the planning permissions from a use perspective in terms of what could be permitted from that perspective. Mr. Critch. Thank you to the chair, very thorough response. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I just wanna make sure I understand from a real basic perspective. So um, the current heights you said were 11 meters, if I understood that correctly, and then um, what is the maximum permitted height from the, not from the sea, but just from the ground? Like, so 11 meters is where we are. What's the permitted max height that, it could, that you could achieve on the site? Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, to the council. So it's 11 meters as measured at the lot. So that would be from grade. So from finished yeah. grade to the peak of the roof would be 11 meters with an additional restriction though that the peak cannot be higher than that 98.3 meters above sea level. So they have to meet those two qualifications. So essentially it's an 11 meter dwelling oh. and that so that they will have to ensure that when they're engineering the site, that they don't raise the site and then it's 11 meters. It's you get 11 meters, but no case is it greater than 198.3 meters should as a result of the detailed engineering, they have to bring in fill. And then you suddenly realize that you have a raised dwelling, which would then break that, uh, max MASL requirement of the NEC to maintain that sort of natural view of the escarpment as currently enjoyed uh, by people looking up at the escarpment. And then the Niagara Escarpment also uses building setbacks further, so it almost becomes an angular plane where you push the building back and you keep it lower so that you don't uh, disrupt the current natural view of the escarpment. Thank you.
I think I have one, I have one yep. last question. Thank you. Thank you. And just to summarize now, yep. uh, for fun, um, so if I understand it correctly, let's just pretend that the secondary plan is off the table. Are, I, the sense I have from staff at this point in the chat is that um, staff's opinion that you don't really think that the density could be dramatically increased here, regardless of whether there was a secondary plan in play or not. Mr. Ropeshaw. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, it would have to be a very low profile form of density. So the, what I was suggesting was given those constraints, uh, given the fact that you already have a municipal street that's being contemplated in terms of Ridgeview to provide that east-west connectivity, then it would be looking at within a low, dense, low profile form of residential development um, mostly in it, fronting onto a public street, and that would, why I was suggesting, could be singles, semis, or street townhouses in terms of a planning permission subject to them. You know, those would be the options that could be considered. We don't normally see like a one-story apartment building being constructed. That's why um, I wasn't suggesting that a one-story apartment building would, could, would be an option, whereas something that's a ground-related re ground residential form of development would be a way of increasing the density and still trying to meet the other objectives as it related to the NEC, the natural environment, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand, because I still don't quite understand the, the answer to the question. So. What I thought I heard um, Director Fayback saying um, was that um, even in doing that, you wouldn't be able to really achieve an increased density on the site that would be much different than what we have right now. Um, and so just from a really at a basic way, because you understand all these things like low profile thing, dense, like you have a much better understanding than I do, in a real basic way, um, how much more could we increase the density above the 32.9 hectares, uh, sorry, 32.9 that's there right now if we were to change the um, kind of development we're doing. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, we would have to go back and complete that analysis, but I was just suggesting that if you, you take two singles and you can, can easily probably in two singles get three street townhouses, you know, based on the same linear frontage, we would have to go back and do a lot by lot analysis and come back on that. So I would anticipate that if you either go to a very small lot, single form of development, or by allowing single detached dwellings or possibly street townhouses, you'd probably be looking maybe a 25 to 33% increase in density overall. Um, but that would be a, using that form of development. The other consideration to remember is that these lands would be within the new, um, you could expand the, also the options to ensure that accessory apartments are permitted, as well as laneway housing, which also provides, we don't normally include those when we're calculating density to avoid some of these mathematical issues we get into, but that is also that other form of allowing for an increase in unit numbers uh, while maintaining the same low profile residential form of development. Thank you. Thank you for my Sorry, questions, but um, just to comment, um, um, should I wait till later? If you could wait, yeah, and I'm we'll happy to wait. Our questions. Thank you. Are there any further questions, Councillor Beatty, and then Councillor Francis? Thank you, Chair. And through you, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase the question. Um, for the, I'll start off with. Uh, some clarification on the area. Um, I was uh, at one point responsible for the area through my previous uh, work as the school board trustee for Ward 9. Um, so I am I'm quite familiar with the, the location of the area for the benefit of those sitting around the table that may be less so. Um, this, this neighborhood is a bit of an island. Uh, it is isolated to the east by Centennial Parkway. It's isolated to the left by the Felker Falls Conservation Area. Uh, and then it is cut off uh, at the south uh, by the for former Taro uh, dump lands, the east dump and the, la and the west dump, now the uh, GFL uh, landfill sites. Um, there is a school site identified. Um, Chair, you made note of uh, walkability issues. Uh, it is as of yet not constructed, um, but uh, the plan would be that it, it would be at some point in the near future. I believe that the uh, School board has made an application as such. Um, currently, all students attending are bussed out of the area. Uh, there are two streets that are the sole access routes in and out of this uh, neighborhood. Um, and there is no ability to uh, do any more than those two streets, Green Mountain Road and First Road West. My question to staff would be, what would the impact on an increase of density be um, on those 
existing infrastructure pieces, knowing that the planning that's been done thus far has been predicated on a certain level of density. If we were to change that, uh, what would we do in terms of additional services, uh, sewer, water, road, et cetera? And um, as a secondary question, and it may be outside the, uh, the expertise of, of our planning staff, but the effect on the local school that is planned for there, if we increase the density, um, I don't know if they'd be able to offer any comment on to what the impact on that particular school, knowing that it is in, the, I believe, the mid-design process could be in terms of uh, student overcrowding, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my two questions to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Who can assist with those two questions? To the Chair, to the Councillor, I can try and tackle the second question, but in terms of infrastructure capacity, I would defer to my colleagues in growth management to speak to that. In terms of schools and, and density, um, if we're talking about these specific lands in particular, I think we've indicated that it wouldn't be that much of a significant increase in, in density. Um, so I'm, I, I can't speak for the school board and their requirements, but I would, I would not expect that there would, it would lead to overcrowding of existing facilities. I don't think it would be that uh, significant of an increase. And um, I'll defer to either um, uh, Mr. Hanna or uh, Mr. Cora for the capacity question. Thank you. Ashraf Hanna, Director of uh, Growth Management and Chief Development Engineer, um, through the chair. Um, in terms of additional uh, density for this site, uh, the site, the applicant will have to submit a revised uh, FSR, Functional Servicing Report, to uh, account for data density and, and uh, um, demonstrate that there's a sufficient capacity in the system to accommodate that. Councillor Beatty, does that answer your question? I think it does, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I'm trying to understand when I can go from a question to a comment. <laughs> um, I think once uh, I'll just uh, canvas the room and ensure that your colleagues have exhausted their questions of staff. And then I, if I could come to everyone respectfully for their comments, is that okay? That's okay. But I do have one final question. Uh, Please. The uh, broadcast tower that is located in the center of the neighborhood, are there any uh, restrictions in terms of uh, height? for buildings surrounding that, that broadcast tower, assuming that it is uh, there for long term. Thank you. To the chair to the council, we're not aware of any height restrictions as a result of that tower. Thumbs up, okay. Any further questions? I have, um, is yours, sorry, Councillor Francis. I, is yours a question or comments? I just have a comment. Okay, would you mind holding if I could ask a question? Thank you. Councillor Denko, could you take the chair? Go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, pardon my thickness. I'm just, um, I'm trying to understand um, a couple of things here. Uh, my colleague, Councillor Beatty, asked a question on servicing and whether that was going to have any impact or where they would have to go back to scratch if we were to change the density. If I could just understand the answer, because I thought I heard uh, Chief Planner Robichaud say that this was an area that was going to be prioritized for us to enable uh, triplex, et cetera, which could conceivably, in a best case scenario, move us in that density direction. So I'm assuming that has been calibrated in the servicing um, possibility, if I could through the chair. Uh, through you, actually the chair, sorry, I apologize, through the chair <laughs> to the ward councillor. Uh, there's sort of two uh, uh, matters. As it relates to this development proposal, as my colleagues in growth management said, is should they dis council change, or approve something that would allow for another form of development through their engineering submissions prior to registration of their subdivision, they would have to resubmit to demonstrate that stormwater, sanitary, and water can be are sufficient or planned to accommodate that new form of development that would be as it relating to the specific development proposal. So the onus would be on the applicant if they wanted to say go from singles 
to semis, which would increase the impervious surface or may create additional demands on water service, their engineering submissions would have to be updated to reflect that new form of development prior to them being able to register the subdivision and apply for building permits. That is a separate level of review than what the planning staff are currently undertaking, looking at each of the secondary plans, saying what are the uses that are permitted citywide, and where we do have some secondary plans that only permit single detached dwellings at a very low density. We're saying consistent with the approach that we've done for the low density residential areas, when the exclusionary zoning work that, or ending exclusionary zoning work, we now need to go and identify what amendments are necessary to all of the existing secondary plans to allow for whether it be accessory apartments, laneway housing, semis or street townhouses as of right to harmonize the zoning. And then that information through that planning review gets translated into the small area traffic zone forecasts that get handed over to our public works colleagues for the purpose of updating the water and wastewater and stormwater master plans. When a development proposal comes in as part of the engineering review, and correct me if I'm wrong, they will require that the proponent demonstrate that based on that infrastructure master plan and what is being proposed, how do those two fit? And if there's going to be deficiencies identified in the city's infrastructure, then the proponent will be responsible for what upgrades are required to allow for that development to proceed. So they're sort of moving on two different tracks. So as the applicant would be having to update their FS, their engineering studies in support of their development proposal, that would be a sort of a different process than when, um, or be, that would have to be done any, they have to update their engineering work anyway prior to registering their subdivision just to confirm that everything aligns. But as we update the zoning regulations and the planning permissions, we need to, we make sure that the infrastructure models contemplate that. And then at the future development stages, like for the lands to the south of this, if they were coming in to do all townhouses, street townhouses, they would have to be able to demonstrate how the infrastructure, can the infrastructure support it or not after we change the planning framework. So I think that's the difference as to, under the question that um, growth management answered was for the proponent's perspective is they will have to update their work to reflect whatever the ultimate approvals that are granted for their development. And then we're saying going forward, as people start coming in for development approvals, they will have to update their engineering work to ensure that everything aligns prior to them getting planning approvals to advance their applications. So they're both sort of happening in parallel, but they're just different um, at different stages at this point in time. Thank you. So thank you. I just, I want to make sure I understand in terms of um, your work plan, if I've heard you correctly. Obviously, um, you're getting a sense that there are those who, um, those of us who are um, committed to enabling people of all means and incomes to live in all parts of this city and the provision of different forms of housing um, to combat what has been an exclusive intentional nature of planning. Um, it's, is there a distinction without a difference um, when it comes to density versus the form? So is there a way in which, um, to Councillor Danko's point, let me just backtrack for a minute. Is it your intent that you're prioritizing those legacy secondary plans? Your intent is to enable those secondary suites, lane by houses. Is that the intent as opposed to redoing the entire secondary plan to, to, an out, to allow density even much greater than that? Through the chair, yes, we're not proposing at this point in time land use redesignations. The intent will be to broaden the planning permissions and then come forward with the implementing zoning so that if somebody um, will ultimately be able to just go straight to a building permit to add additional dwelling units within a, an existing house or to do it as a purpose built to give them more flexibility without necessarily having to go from low density to a high density redesignation. It would just be within that low density designation to allow those full range of housing opportunities 
and then to zone them accordingly, as opposed to saying suddenly now this entire neighborhood is going to be redesignated to medium density. Mm -hmm. And that, sorry, part of that is because we recognize we want to keep the ground related low density residential from a built form neighborhood character perspective, from a design perspective, by maintaining that sort of those forms of housing would be permitted and then facilitating the conversion or gentle intensification of those forms of housing, whether it's new build or an existing homeowner, an existing dwelling seeking to convert it over time. Thank you. Councillor? Thank you, those, those are my questions. I take the chair back. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, uh, I believe we have second uh, time speakers that wish to comment on the report. Is that uh, correct? In the form of Councillor Beatty? Is it from top to bottom? Uh, Councillor Kretsch, Councillor, but I, I do, Councillor Francis, I believe. Uh, yeah, so Councillor Francis, Councillor Kretsch, and then Councillor Beatty, and no, okay. Councillor Francis. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, just wanted to, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but uh, part of the reason why I wanted to show the picture on the slide there was just to show that uh, this, the current proposal is not out of line with the community that's existing up there. Uh, I think I'm in full support of this and uh, I'm willing to vote yes on this. And um, I appreciate uh, the time to debate this, but I'm in full support. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kretsch. Thanks. I just feel a little awkward about this, um, supporting this, just because I feel like there is a potential for more density here um, as someone who's in a very dense part of the city and who represents residents in a very dense part of the city. Um, really pulls on me that uh, we're not doing everything we can to maximize it. Also, having heard, though, two things which stand out to me as kind of problems for me to oppose this, which are number one, that even if we were to improve the density of this particular site, the best we could get is between 25 and 33%. And if I'm just doing some quick math, that gets us to what, 45 instead of 32.9-ish. Um, and so, okay, we're still not at 70, um, partly because of the natural habitat features imposed um, here by things like the Niagara Escarpment Commission um, that who are saying, hey, you know, you can't um, make the skyline look like houses. It's got to look like the escarpment um, and other kinds of other kinds of things that they've long held um, in order to keep, um, frankly, the Niagara Escarpment intact. Um, there's lots of pressures to um, make it intact. And so um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Beattie. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, I think I'll build on uh, Councillor Francis' uh, assessment of the area. I am very familiar with the area, um, and uh, what you may not see on, on the visuals that have been displayed here is that there are a number of units of higher density to the south. Uh, we are talking about the uh, northernmost uh, portion of this, um, and I think I think I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that it seems to be that there's one particular property at play that is bringing down the overall average uh, of density in the area due to uh, really strains that are beyond anyone's control. We're talking about uh, um, a particular property that has characteristics uh, that are extenuating circumstances and not the norm to what we would do. Um, and I, I also want to highlight the school issue based on the fact um, I was part of some, some planning a number of years ago uh, where the, the board at the time had particular numbers predicting the uptake in schools. And I've had some real, real life experience going back to those sites and finding them tremendously overcrowded and finding that the numbers were wrong four years ago. And it concerns me when we talk about um, expanding the density in an area that is completely landlocked and has no option but to send any overflow of those schools uh, back on a bus and back to uh, outside the community. Um, this is something the community is very much looking forward to, having a walkable school within its area. Um, and um, it, it does raise some concerns based on my lived experience uh, about what the future may have in store. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. 
Okay, I need a mover and a seconder to approve the report recommendations as amended. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Beattie. A. Wilson, not M. Wilson. Okay. Sorry, that carries. I can see it. Eight to four. Thank you. Okay, we're on to discussion items now. Uh, 11.1, licensing short-term rental accommodations, report number PED 17203C, citywide. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? Yes, please. Good afternoon, my name is Ben Spicha. I'm the Senior Project Manager for Municipal Law Enforcement and Licensing and Bylaw Services. So I'm presenting on short-term rentals and uh, presenting the drafted bylaw and report. So house sharing as a principle to accommodate visitors is not new. However, marketing for this has expanded and continues to evolve with the use of popular online platforms such as Airbnb and Vibro. I, I don't want to interrupt, but I am going to interrupt. If you could just bring the mic closer, thank you. In November 2017, staff reported to Planning Committee on staff research to the short-term rental industry and the possibility of the City of Hamilton adopting a similar licensing regime as was being developed in Toronto. In July 2018, staff developed and presented to the Planning Committee a public engagement strategy for public consultation for a recommended approach to Council following that Toronto model. In July 2022, staff developed and presented to the Planning Committee the results of the online public survey, public consultation, and staff preliminary findings for a recommended approach for the licensing and regulating short-term rentals in Hamilton, and the drafted licensing bylaw amendments with respect to short-term rental accommodations, and that the planning staff be directed to report back to Planning Committee with the necessary zoning changes. And this report presents to committee a high-level overview of the results of the summary of staff research, public consultation results, recommendations for how the city may respond to the emerging market of STR, with a proposed STR schedule to amend the city licensing bylaw, in addition to alternatives to the previously proposed licensing regime. So previously, council directed staff to examine and provide a regulatory, sorry, regulatory framework similar to the Toronto scheme. The Toronto licensing regime passed in 2017, but as a result of a zoning appeal and pandemic shutdown, it was not fully implemented until January 1st, 2021. So this map is a heat map. This is available through AirDNA, which is an aggregate. It takes every available short-term rental listings for specific municipalities. So this is Hamilton, and this is a snapshot from uh, November of last year. So as shown by the heat map, STR platforms are active in Hamilton with the highest concentration of STR units being in the downtown area and numerous wards. While numerous municipalities across the world have regulated STRs, no two STR licensing systems are alike. 
balancing the needs of the municipality with the evolving changes in travel. In addition, academic analysis of the STR market is evolving. The economic impact of STR is heavily debated globally. Hamilton, like other municipalities globally, must address the opportunities and the challenges presented by the STR industry. So prior staff research indicated that there was a reduction in short-term rental use during the pandemic. Essentially, STRs were closed down due to the Reopening Ontario Act and other provisions at the time on two specific occasions. Uh, the previous report focused on these pre-COVID 2018 data obtained from AirDNA, which is an STR marketing website, as I pointed out. According to that data, 60% of active listings were entire homes or apartments. 40% were private rooms, and the average daily rate was $112, and the average revenue was $1,685 annually for SDR operators. However, most notable is the 93 properties, which are listings that are one full-time, two entire homes, and three, they have multiple listings. So it'd be anything over, obviously, one listing. So, sorry, multi-listing is two or more entire homes or three or more private rooms. That's that definition of that multi-listing we heard earlier today. And it, is in, it was anticipated at that time that those values would return or exceed that 2018 value. So from November of last year, I took the snapshots. So moving into 2022, based on the Air DNA data, active listings have exceeded pre-pandemic levels, showing a total of 1,200 or 1,250 listings, an increase of 352 from the 2018 data, with 80 percent or 1,000 rentals being entire homes or apartments. 19% or 238 being private rooms and only 1% or 12 as shared rooms. Most notably, once again, is 87% of the short-term rentals were multi-listings and show a general decrease from the 2018 data. However, these represent the maximum commercialization and commodification of home sharing and a removal of long-term housing from the rental market and would be prohibited through the proposed bylaw. While multi-listings represent a smaller percentage of active listings, estimated between seven and 8% for most municipalities, they account for a third of total short-term rental revenue, which research indicating these types of listings are growing more rapidly than any other category. And looking more recent academic research, they probably are about over 50% of the revenue for SDRs for most municipalities as well. So now that I've presented the hamilton Cetric data on SDR, I'm gonna break down some of the definitions as well. So what is an STR? So a short-term rental is a dwelling unit used to provide sleeping accommodations to the traveling public. Overall, municipal re regulatory schemes are adopting the house sharing principle. The principal residence unit refers to an individual dwelling unit on any given property. It is where one makes their home and conducts their daily affairs. This limits the operators to a single STR within, a municip within, a, within their principal residence or the dwelling unit. And prohibiting commercial and multi-listing operators. The objective of this requirement is to improve neighborhood fit by ensuring personal accountability for the dwelling unit being used and to protect the long-term rental housing market by prohibiting STR that would be considered a commercial investment property. So kind of thinking about that principal residence principle, so that would be paying bills, receiving documentation related to identification, taxation and insurance purposes, driver's licenses would be listed on that property and such like that. So owners in single residential properties would not be able to STR secondary suites or laneway houses with this drafted bylaw, only the dwelling unit they actually reside, although the tenants in long-term rental agreements in secondary suites may apply as a separate STR as being their principal residence. And this concept is consistent with other jurisdictions. However, as the bylaw is prepared now, laneway and secondary suites would not be permitted, only the dwelling unit. However, for you... There's also before you another alternative that we're presenting back as well, and had that has a consideration for broader permissions for property owners to include basement apartments and laneway suites that are located on the same property as the owner's principal residence. So the previous report presented to planning committee also shared the results of the public engagement survey. Staff coordinated with an online survey and solicited public comment through one of the super crawl events. They surveyed 1,681 responses and use the Toronto regulatory scheme as the guiding principles. So some of the key takeaways from the survey, there was strong support among residents for allowing STR in the occupant's principal residence. 92% of respondents said a homeowner should be allowed to STR their principal residence. 26% of those surveyed believe that renters should be allowed to also STR their unit. 
And a detailed summary of the online survey can be re received in the previous report, which is PED 17203B. So continuing with the stakeholder or public engagement, uh, stakeholders in November 2018, 79 industry stakeholders were invited to a meeting at City Hall to meet and discuss SDRs. Overall, stakeholders generally agreed that SDRs help local businesses in areas underserved by traditional tourist accommodations, such as hotels and motels. SDRs seen as supporting, were seen as supporting tourism, and they were an effective way of increasing tourist and visitor accommodation supply during event-related peaks, such as major, major sporting events. The majority agreed that house sharing principal residence licensing scheme in residential properties provides a balanced approach to regulating the SDR industry in Hamilton. Some of the public comments as well was around affordable housing. Many people who live and work in Hamilton are currently struggling to find affordable housing. The most common reason for operating an STR unit was to improve affordability for renting or owning a home. There was significant pressure on the rental market. There are public concerns about tenants being evicted so that landlords can operate STR units or to simply avoid the landlord's obligation to the rights of tenants. The principal residence house sharing concept is to protect long-term rental stock. And the last theme that emerged was the negative experiences in residential zones. So we also heard from residents regarding negative experience with STR in residential areas relating to excessive noise, increased garbage parking issues, and safety concerns around unknown guests. So research from Toronto also found no difference to the proportion of nuisance complaints normally found in residential areas. It's an important factor to note that negative experience are more prevalent in the STR operator is not present on, at the, if it's not their principal residence, if they're absentee. So previously, staff also submitted the draft short-term rental amendment to the licensing bylaw and was requested to be returned to planning committee at a later date. This draft was not approved by the previous council, but is before you again today to consider. The draft bylaw amendment was created following public stakeholder comment, review analysis of best practices of other municipalities, and academic research and interdepartmental consultation. So some of the key aspects of this proposed licensing scheme is to regulate online platforms, so that would be the brokers such as Airbnb, Vivro, et cetera and STR host, which would be the operators. Residents can rent principal residents for no more than 28 nights consecutively with a cap of 120 nights annually. Individuals may only license one STR and corporations would not be able to license an STR. Condominium boards would continue to be able to utilize their existing authority to further limit or prohibit STR through a declaration, bylaws or rules. To support that requirement, residents within a condominium complex require the consent or approval of the condominium corporation. And within the proposed licensing scheme, STR operators must provide their name, address, and contact information, provide information about their short-term rental, post the registration number in all advertisements, and prepare a declaration that the address is their principal residence. Operators must also provide emergency contact information to contact the host by email or phone 24 seven. All secondary suites, that being those that are accessory to the principal dwelling unit, must undergo inspection to confirm compliance with the property standards bylaw, electrical safety authority requirements, and the fire code. If requested by the city, an inspection must be scheduled within seven days of the request. They must also provide adequate parking and insurance coverage, and the city will maintain the authority to audit at any STR and request specific evidence from the host to ensure compliance. Considering the primary use of the principal residence unit is seen as one as personal home, an STR providing for less than five guests may not be subject to the stringent building and fire safety standards unless a secondary suite or apartment is being used as an STR. And then through good neighbor requirements, operators are required to provide a guest information package that contains detailed information to contact the operator, emergency and non-emergency services, and instruction to help minimize negative community experiences associated with STRs. So the, moving to the STR broker license, which would be a separate license type, any company that facilitates the booking or payment of short-term rentals will need to be licensed. Brokers must keep STR operators informed, create policies to minimize neighborhood nuisances, and assist city officials. Airbnb currently represents approximately 92% of STR listings. Airbnb has a robust program for police, municipalities, and members of the public on websites for such as uh, there's a portal for police and other bylaw services. They have the ability, they can request to have a, a non-compliant listing be removed directly from the broker. 
Staff are continuing to work with the main STR platforms to ensure a good working relationship going forward for a successful regulatory regime based on those negotiations. And they'd also be required to disclose anonymized info to assist the city to monitor housing availability and understand traveling public trends within the community. So moving to the fee schedule, this would be your appendix B of the report. Uh, this has been slightly upgraded since the last time this was presented to fall in line with the increases to the fees and service charges bylaw. These fees have been updated just around the cost of administering and enforcing these regulations and to be more revenue neutral as well as cost recovery. STR operative fees are reasonable, not onerous and consistent with other jurisdictions within Ontario that do have STR bylaws. So having presented the written recommended drafted bylaw, staff were asked to present back with the alternatives to this licensing, licensing regime. So looking at alternative one, the first alternative allows additional types of secondary dwelling units such as detached, sorry, as a attached laneway suites in, on the same property as the principal residence, subsidizing property owner costs while still ensuring public nuisances are diminished by including these additional units on one STR operator license. However, it is unknown how many properties would fall into this category, but it can be anticipated that it would increase the number of potential STRs within the city. Alternative two then uh, allows broader permissions in the regulations, allowing multiple properties that are not the principal residence to be STRs. However, this number may be capped by council. However, there is a caveat that the, num the alternative, this alternative may exacerbate the issues with housing supply, housing affordability, and as research shows, STRs that are not a principal residence can suffer from absentee property owners, increase the risk of potential public nuisances. Furthermore, as the number of properties permitted to be STR has increased, it will continuously undermine the licensing regime and the enforcement efforts on that part. And I'd also just like to point out for this alternative as well, as you add additional units that, that can be STRs, we would have to be going back and looking at the bylaw how, and amending it as well and looking at those fees once again, because they'd likely be impacted by fire and parking conditions and such. So city staff will monitor STR activity to assess the overall impacts and the effectiveness of the regulatory regime, including impacts on housing availability and affordability where possible and budget and service impacts by tracking the resulting revenue and staffing implications. And as I stated earlier, while numerous jurisdictions around the world regulate short-term rentals, no short-term rental licensing systems are the same. The short-term rental industry presents opportunities and challenges alike. A licensing regime must strike a balance between the needs of the city of Hamilton and the evolving changes in the travel and tourism, meeting the city's objectives of increasing housing supply while also aiding homeowners with their escalating housing costs. I would like to thank all staff, other jurisdictions, industry stakeholders, and the public for their valuable input on this report. I'm free to take any questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and effort. We're going to go to um, members of the committee for questions. I recognize Councillor Denko, followed by Councillor Alex Wilson. Thank you, uh, Chair Wilson. Um, First of all, just on uh, you touched on the public engagement and stakeholder engagement that's been ongoing, I think, since 2018. 2017, through the, 20, through the chair, 2017. 2017. Thank you. So um, in terms of this uh, iteration of council, um, this has actually been in play two terms of council ago. So it's it's been a long build up to this point. There's been significant engagement. There's been how how has that influenced the policy that's before us today. Uh, so kind of, sorry, through the chair, uh, kind of that need to strike the balance between the challenges and the possibilities with an SDR licensing regime has definitely impacted those alternatives that are being presented back. Uh, while we still stick by the recommend, recommended uh, drafted bylaw because it is the most prohibitive and the most likely to return long-term rental stock to Hamilton, which has also obviously become an even bigger concern since originally going through that draft. Thank you. So if you are a, a property investor, uh, there should be no surprise that if you bought a property in the last five years, that this was coming to the city of Hamilton in one form or another, as it has other municipalities. Um, Toronto and Vancouver, I think, have been mentioned. Are, are you aware of others? 
uh, through the chair. So there's SDR licensing bylaws across the globe. You see them in Europe, uh, just off the top of my head, because I've refreshed my memory last night, the United States, Philadelphia has one, uh, Seattle. It's There's numerous examples to work from. And as you said, this specific bylaw that's before us today has been um, influenced and, and uh, tailored based on the public engagement, the stakeholder engagement, but also specific to the needs of the city of Hamilton. Through the chair, that's correct. It was, we were directed to follow the Toronto model at the time, which I think was the more cutting edge at the time. So it's definitely heavily influenced by the Toronto model and kind of what they've gone through. Uh, but also, we've also tried to once again, balance those needs while also keeping in mind the housing long-term housing stock. And obviously, I don't think we could anticipate COVID-19 and that pandemic and how that impacted things like such as the landlord-tenant board. Thank you. Um, a lot of the, the delegates that we heard from earlier talked about, um, you know, augmenting their expenses as the principal property owner. And I think you mentioned in your presentation that was through your public engagement listed as the number one reason for people to um, put a, a short term rental on the market was to help with those, um, you know, family expenses, for lack of a better term. Through the chair. Staff. Can you confirm? Yep, through the chair. So just, yeah, uh, there's definitely the majority of SDR operators within Hamilton, where I would say about half of probably SDR operators within Hamilton are those trying to supplement their income, supplement their mortgage through those various ways. And then there's also the other half, which are corporation dome, which I said is that commodification of housing. So it kind of, you have a couple camps kind of arguing. You have one that want to supplement their income through retirement. You have the corporations who are trying to maximize profit. Then you also have one that are going to argue that Housing should not be an investment, and then we should be returning long-term rental stock, and housing should be a right. So a lot of conflicting arguments that way. So like I said, there's no one stop shop for uh, SDR bylaw. You really need to craft it in a way that's going to fit the needs of your city. Thank you. And, and I think we heard from the majority of the delegates today were uh, that first category, that they're augmenting their income. It's their primary residence, um, which I think is consistent with you know, the public engagement that we've done. Um, just on the on the fee schedule, it is in the appendice, um, but just so committee's clear, what is the, the range of fees? And um, I believe they're set at cost recovery. Through the chair, that's correct. Uh, so just kind of looking at the fee schedule right now, which is appendix B to the report. So you, are you mostly just the operator fees? Just the ballpark, what would uh, the average um, short-term rental license operator be paying an annual fee. Through the chair, I can jump in here. Monica Cirillo, Director of Licensing and Bylaw Services, just for the total of all of uh, all of the operator and or broker fees. You're looking at a range for a first time operator to be about $947 all in. And then a first time partial dwelling operator would be approximately $647 all in. And you're absolutely right, Councillor, that is fully cost recovery. And I believe a portion of that was upfront uh, zoning verification and things like that. And then once they've, you know, so I think it was, uh, was it one to four um, guests was in that $600 range and then the annually moving forward after that upfront, what was it? I think it was around $300 a year. For the chair, that range is correct. Thank you. Um, Last point I wanted to make, Madam Chairman, and question um, was in the alternatives, I guess there's two points here. So alternative one, uh, option one that's presented in the report is fairly similar to the, the main recommendation. And that was a result of consultation with staff uh, when this came forward last, um, last term. So the reason it wasn't passed was um, council wanted to have a little bit more time. There were some additional deliberations and uh, discussion on adding in uh, secondary suites and, and laneway houses. In your opinion, is that, and I think, and I know it says it in the report that it's not a significant departure, but um, is, do you have any further comments on uh, that alternative one versus the original bylaw? Thank you, Councillor. Those, that's your time. Uh, through the chair. Uh Yes, it's not a significant departure from the existing bylaws that's recommended. We were also directed to be as prohibitive as possible in that achieving that goal of returning long-term rental stock. So that's why you see 
only the principal residence and only one dwelling unit. Uh, the one caveat of alternative one, if you turn to Appendix D, is I believe it's section 4.7, no operator shall rent or advertise more than one dwelling unit as a short-term rental on the property where the operator's principal residence is located. So depending on how you would like to set up that method as well with alternative one, you need to amend the bylaw there because you'd only be allowed to choose one dwelling unit on the property, rather if it's not your principal residence. So there's that caveat as well. Uh, I guess you just reiterating, it's not a drastic departure and enforcement wise, it would be quite doable. Thank you. Just, just uh, I know I'm out of time, but to clarify on that on that point, if you had a home, your principal residence, a legal secondary dwelling unit, and a legal laneway house, you couldn't have three short term. You'd only uh, be able to have one. I uh, threw the chair. That's correct. That's the way the bylaw is written right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Just so folks know, we have Councillor Alex Wilson, Councillor Critch, Councillor Wang, Councillor Pauls, Councillor Kazar, Councillor Nan. Okay, Count and Councillor Jackson, who's joined us today. Uh, Councillor Alex Wilson. Thank you, and through the chair, I think I just have one line of questioning. I think it might just be one question, but first off, just really grateful for all the work and project management that's gone into this report. Um, I'd like to specifically focus on the broker fees and this idea of cost recovery. Um, I believe it was said about 97% of current operators work with Airbnb. Um, through the chair, is there a value in looking at that brokerage fee to not be cost recovery? I ask this because as we've heard from many um, delegates today, um, having a ho being a host, having someone visiting, there's an economic activity within the community. I see that. Um, but 100% of the revenue earned by the broker, in this case Airbnb, is not coming to the local economy. It's leaving our local economy. And so um, whether that be a broker fee based on number of units, so for every 50 units there's a fee, or just are there way, what are the options with the brokerage fee, and does it have to be cost recovery? Uh, through the chair, so there's definitely looking at even comparable municipalities in the nearby area. I know the city of Toronto, they have a, I think it's a, just over a dollar for each rental every single night is paid back to the city of Toronto. So we, once again, trying to balance those needs of tourism, we're also looking at housing affordability and that long-term rental stock. We didn't think the 5,000 uh, broker fee was very onerous and it also kind of permits them to have that STR because like a lot of the delegates mentioned this morning, it does serve underserved areas of the city that you normally wouldn't around hospitals, the academic community, things of that nature. So we tried to keep it as simplified that way to try to encourage STR growth as well for those who wish to go about that route. Uh, we've always fully operated on the idea that we would be getting cost recovery from this project. So. It would be, I would assume, at the direction of council if they wanted to move in a different direction from that. There's many different kind of tiered uh, broker fee systems as well. So you could, it's, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but it's based on the size of the home or how many listings you have. There's a range. So as they could increase, the license broker or the broker license would increase as well. Sir Wilson? Through the chair to the councillor, just to add on to Ben's point, we are limited by the Municipal Act in, in the fees that we can charge. So although there may be some discrepancy that we can look to our neighbouring counterparts with, we need to make sure that the money that is coming in is going back into that program. So when we came up with these fees, this is how much we believe that the, the program is going to cost us to operate, and that's how we arrived at that number. Yeah, just I think to draw a line under this, uh, it seems like as part of the uh, report, there's going to be staff time allocated to reporting back to council um, in future. This is a, like a hypothetical question in future reports as we're getting that information as to who's registered with which brokers and we get a better sense of the local flavor. Um, council could at that time of receiving one of those update reports work to maybe modify the brokerage fee mm. um, at that present time while still moving forward today. Would the director, will there be time in that evaluation to make amends? Through the chair to the councillor, yes, there, there would be that opportunity. I am going to draw your attention to one of the uh, staffing requirements that we put in place, and that is for a project manager to ensure that we are tracking the appropriate metrics of this bylaw and that we can report back to council with full transparency as to how is this bylaw working and, and how, are, how is it being impacted in the community. So at any point, council can ask us to bring back in and uh, make a change to whether it be fees or something else to the bylaw. 
Uh, no further questions, just appreciation of all the work staff's put into this through the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Critch. Thank you, um, through the chair. I just heard something in your presentation I want to clarify. Um, was about the Condominium Act. You specifically said that um, condominium owners, condominium boards would still have the ability to limit the, well, if you could just repeat what you said, because I don't want to try and paraphrase it improperly. Uh, through the chair, so the condominium boards would continue to be able to limit and prohibit as they wish through their bylaws and regulations. Thank you. And so my question to you is there's this thing called the private single family residence. Um, are you aware of this little, this de definition um, that's being used in the co by condominiums to limit? Um, uh, through the chair, uh, general layman understanding, yes. Yeah, okay. And so no, there should have been no changes to that. That's gonna continue on. Okay, great, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. My other two questions are, um, one's a procedural question I'll ask at the end. And then first is about the 120 days. So, uh, if I look at the OHIP residency requirements, I think it's 153 days. Um, and so when I see 120 days, I'm just trying to understand the methodology the city used. Um, obviously, you compared it and looked at other municipalities and what they were doing. Um, but was that the predominant methodology you used, or how did you come up with 120 days as a, as a number? Uh, through the chair, they would have conducted a jurisdictional survey at the time comparing other STR bylaws, probably most likely globally, as well as probably more comparable municipalities like the City of London and such. Uh, so usually I believe those nightcaps range from 120 days to 180. I think 180 is the most average cap for an STR license. So I think the, uh, re I can't speak because my predecessor wrote the report that time, uh, but the reasoning would be if it's a short-term rental, it should be limited to a short-term rental, anything beyond that 120 days, you're, it's hard to argue, I would assume, that it's a primary residence if you're renting out your entire home 180 days out of the year. Thank you. Thank you, through the chair, if I understand what you just said, um, to make sure I understand what you just said, you said that on average or the high range limit was 180 days that we found in other jurisdictions, but we erred on the side of 120 um, because we felt that that, A, if I recall your earlier language, that the direction that you received was that we'd be as restrictive as possible. And so that's why we chose that, that perhaps that lower range, um, because it seems like what you're saying is that jurisdictionally 180 is something that you're, you're seeing more often elsewhere. Uh, through the chair, so it's comparable to this area, 180 is more comparable with the city of Toronto and some others, but in places such as New Orleans, which has much larger tourist city, they have a 90 day cap. So it depends on the needs, once again, on the needs of the city. Like I, I would understand it, they erred on the side of caution and chose 120 days because like I said, if you move into those 180 day plus, it's hard to argue it's your primary residence if you're STRing your entire property. And also we the, with the principal goal of returning that long-term housing stock as we were directed previously by a previous council. Okay, thank you, that makes sense to me. And through the chair, I just had a procedural question. Um, so I see there are alternatives for consideration here. And so just want to understand how the voting works on that when we come to it. It's asking now so we don't wait till we're in right in the, the thrust of the vote. Um, alternative one and alternative two are aberrations of the main thing. So would we vote on the main thing and then vote on the alternative? I'm just wondering if, I'm just wondering, I'm making sure I understand how that works so that we're not losing, like for instance, like say the majority of us are not in support of some alternative, right? Um, but we are in support of the main thing. I'm just under, trying to understand how that works. If someone could just say the words. I'll look to LC Kelsey to walk us through the procedural roadmap on that. So when we get to that, that portion of the meeting, if there was somebody that put forward a motion to move the alternative, we would vote on that. Um, if it was defeated, then another council would have the option of putting the original recommendation or the other alternative on, and then we would vote on that. So it's like the consideration of an amendment, an amendment would come okay. first. Kind of similar, but yes, it's not an amendment as on, on the basis that councillors put that alternative as the motion on the floor. Thank you. Is that okay? Thank you. I appreciate that. Those are my questions. Thank you. Councillor Wang. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, question about the decision around um, the broker fees versus. Uh, so why the $60 annual fee? Why isn't that a higher amount for the broker fees, especially when you have a one-time cost of $5,000? Uh, through the chair, so 
Uh, the one issue we had, I added this fee myself actually to the report because if we, it was a one-time broker fee. So if we issued it from the licensing perspective, it would be issued in perpetuity. We wouldn't be receiving their updated corporate documents every single year. So through the renewal process, they get those documents and we'd have their most up-to-date corporate documents from that. So that's more if we do have to go after something, one of the brokers, because they're not removing listings as we asked through the bylaw, we can apply fines appropriately. It's to get those corporate documents more than anything. Just we have a way of getting them back. That's why it's so low. We just didn't want to make it onerous either on them as well. Through, through the chair, just to jump in on, on Ben's point there, the $60 is, is inclusive of the administration cost. So annually when they submit those documents back in, that is how much it costs our licensing administrators to reissue that license. Through, through you to the to Ben and to Director Cirillo. I just think it's really low. <laughs> I wish that there was an opportunity for us to look at it, but I think that based on the project manager that um, compliment, we can potentially revisit that later on, correct? Um, to the director, we are able to revisit that? Through the chair to the counselor, yes. Okay. Uh, my second question to you through the chair. Um, we heard today in one of the delegations that Calgary was one of the um, ideal situations with city of cities to host to. And one of the areas that I thought was really interesting was that they offered it on a tiered system. So it was a little more open and inclusive to all of the different types of host situations. So we are speaking today that most of the time, 50% of the time, we have uh, primary residents and the um, hosts are in their primary residence and then they would rent out different parts. Then there were different tiers in the Calgary model that looked at residents and then additional units. And then there were then a third tier that looked at it as uh, multiple units. And then they all had different prices. Was that ever built into the consideration at all? Uh, through the chair, there was originally in the previous report they did around the operator license, I believe there was a range from for one to four units, which were the smaller license fee. And for sake of interest for the licensing team and enforcing that way, we simplified it down to an entire dwelling unit and then separated as a partial dwelling unit, which would be those private rooms, shared rooms. So made it a little bit cheaper for those individuals who want to operate those types of dwelling units. Okay. I think that um, through you, Chair, I think that, again, it kind of answered my question, which was if we had a project manager that was able, that we could come back and revisit these, then I think that this is something that as the market changes, and we also saw that the trend is moving so quickly. I mean, just in the last year, we've seen a 50% increase in, um, in Airbnb units in Hamilton. So I, I'm kind of curious about how we would implement the project manager and ensuring that we're actually building in these feedback mechanisms that we can properly allocate resources accordingly. After the chair, if you turn to Appendix C, which is the implementation plan, so this would be what the project manager would be laying out. So that'd be setting up the licensing regime and complete. And also, like I said, uh, as the director pointed out, reporting back frequently on those metrics. So you do have a more up-to-date idea of what is happening with the STR market in Hamilton and making those changes as necessary. Because as I said, there's no one fits all bylaw. You have to see with your municipality, how it's operating the industry, what areas are being impacted the most, which ones are being more impacted by specific types of operators. And then you could kind of go from there and make amendments as needed. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Director. Nope. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Pauls. And thank you, and uh, through the chair, and thank you, uh, Ben. I also want to thank Director Monica Chirello and her staff in the licensing and bylaw services for their extensive work that they have done and the research of this policy. A uh, couple of questions, and being down the line, some of the, I think I might be repeating that, so uh, forgive me if um, I'm repeating the questions and, and the answer, of course. In Appendix A, Section 4, Operator Subject uh, Section 410, referencing secondary dwelling units. Is this the intent here to confirm that secondary dwelling units are not being used as short-term rentals? Was that the, the intent?
Director? The chair to the counselor, yes, that is that is correct because in alternative, or sorry, in the recommendation itself, secondary units are not permitted. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if this question was asked, like I said, but uh, forgive me if it has. By what were the metrics used to determine the fee schedule, especially the registration license fee of $5,000? And what cities beside Toronto uh, were the competitors? On the cost recovery, could you? Uh... Through, through the chair to the to the councillor, I can certainly start, but I'm going to defer to Ben on the municipal comparisons and, and where they line up. So the $5,000 fee was arrived at because of the upfront work that is going to be required to get an operator, um, or sorry, not an operator, a broker license in the city. So we still need to proceed with negotiations with them. We still need to do all of our background checks with them. We have to do corporate searches. So it's going to be a little bit more time intensive than an operator license, but I'm going to defer to Ben to see what the uh, municipal comparisons are for for STR brokers around us. Uh, through the chair, so just kind of going back, I believe the City of London also, like I said, has it, or the City of Toronto has that nightly, so they receive just over $1 for every rental each day. So they do have, uh, I believe it is a $5,000 one-time fee, but then they're receiving continuous uh, revenue through that means as well. And then you have more, uh, I think the City of London also has kind of a tiered list, which is I spoke to earlier, which is, based on the size of how many listings you are brokering for. So it increases based on that. So there are a couple options that way. So the one time, and just also trying to once again balance that creating or encouraging tourism within Hamilton with not being owners on the brokers as well. Balancing those challenges as well, I think is worth 5,000, which is one of the most common ones you see through the jurisdictional surveys of the brokers through municipalities. Thank you. Councillor? Um, thank you. Uh did you, uh, it was interesting that a few of the delegation today mentioned Calgary. Did you look at Calgary um, rental, uh, short-term rentals policies? Because uh, I, I had a feeling that they were happy with that and it's working very well. Did you uh, look at that? Uh, through the chair, I did not do the original jurisdictional survey as this has been going back obviously since 2017. I looked at more recent ones with the City of London and some of the American standards just kind of see because they've, especially with the states, they've had their short-term rentals and bylaws in place for quite some time. So it's nice to see where they've been going with it. So I did not specifically look at Calgary, no. Thank you. Councillor? Thank you. And I, I should have, um, I, I'm interested, someone that does short-term rentals, would they maybe... I should know this because I used to be in insurance. Would they have to let the insurance broker know that their house is short-term rental or or not? And would there be any cost? That, did you check that out? Um, uh, through the chair, if you look at Appendix A of the drafted bylaw for the recommendation, they would the hosts and operators would be required to have that host liability and commercial general liability coverage. So they would have to inform their insurance broker. And so that would be a cost to them as well, right? Through the chair, correct. Right. Um, and I guess um, I think that um, Tammy asked that question about tiering. I was uh, uh, wanting to know when you developed the fee schedule in Appendix B, was any consideration given to the pre-use fee schedule or commission-based schedule as opposed to flat fee independent for the frequency of short-term rentals. I guess you looked at that? Uh, through the chairs. So the this is the report, the original report that was presented on July 5th of last year. The fee schedule was part of that. We were required to present back these alternatives to the bylaw. So we didn't really amend the fee schedule too heavily besides adding that renewal fee and kind of simplifying the operator fee. Thank you, Councillor. And thank you for that. And again, thank you for all your hard work and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and through the chair, uh, you said earlier that housing is a right and we don't want it commodified, and I agree with that entirely. Um, but listening to delegations today and talking to constituents, uh, I've heard many examples where short term rentals, if, if they were not possible, would not necessarily turn into long term rentals, helping put supply into the housing market. So what evidence do we have that this bylaw would improve housing availability and affordability in Hamilton? 
uh, through the chair. So the academic research is quite conflicting. You'll see a lot of arguments for that it does impact rental costs, especially uh, there is evidence, academic evidence through empirical research that the more concentrated SDRs in specific neighborhoods, it does put upward pressure on rental prices. But then you also have arguments, uh, I think the 2017 McGill study on STRs that I think was referenced by one of the delegates earlier this morning. There's not a lot of evidence that it does take away from long-term rental markets either, because the, they would never be the bottom of the rental market, that they're not gonna be ending up going back. But one way or another, it's not really conclusive that way as well. Uh, with the specific cap on calendar days and consecutive nights, as they mentioned, if it goes beyond 28 days, you're going to the month to month. Regardless, you're getting to the jurisdiction of the Residential Tenancies Act. So you are afforded specific rights through doing that as well. So our argument would be if they're moving to more of a long term, if they're doing longer than those periods of times, it should return to the long term rental market. So based on kind of the numbers from November and even from today, which I think they said there was 1,300 active listings, a portion of that could end up returning to the rental market and that's better than zero. Okay, thank you. Um, through the chair, um, I'm just curious, public consultation was done over a number of years. Um, I'm curious in how similar or dissimilar that feedback was versus what was heard today from the many delegations we heard through the chair. Uh, through the chair, I think you were going to see, as the presentation highlights, that consultation or the, through the consultation, especially through Supercrawl, most people are in favorable of regulations for SDRs mm -hmm. because with that licensing, you get the fire code inspection, you get the fire inspection, you get the minimum mm -hmm. property standards expectations through the bylaw. So there's the health and safety aspect that way, which I think most people would appreciate, and that most of them are happy with that at least one dwelling unit being STR because it does allow them to supplement their income. So I don't think opinion has changed that much. I think you'll see more opinion being negative in regards to that commercial operators, where you have multiple listings, full homes, and they're rented usually out 365 days a year. I think that's where you'd see more negative expectations, but without obviously another round of public consultation, I can't really speak on that. It's more conjecture. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'll save comments on that for later, but through the chair, um, and I don't know if you said this or not, but from the survey data or the consultation you had, what percentage of those were hosts through the chair? We know? Uh, through the chair, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. I don't have the previous report, but it's in a, a, a PED 17203C, I believe that report would have been, okay. or sorry, B. Sorry, just corrected 7% were hosts. Okay, thank you. So uh, a low number. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe I know the answer to this question, but I want to ask it anyway. Uh, I have a constituent in Ward 12, rural area. Uh, it's farm property. They live on one parcel of land, have another parcel of land uh, with a different title, which they have a, a they host uh, through Airbnb. So I believe under this bylaw, they would no longer be allowed to do that. Through the chair? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. It would have to be their primary principal residence. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Thank you, through you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the overview and all the work on the development of the policy. Uh, just a couple of clarifying questions, um, and I'll preface this by starting that, uh, I think it was on Thursday, I decided to look on the Airbnb app at the neighborhood that I live in to see um, what difference I could observe just in terms of offerings from this time last year. And it was a pretty staggering amount of available units um, that were listed as everything from private room to uh, being described as condos, which were actually, um, you know, a, a flat in a house that had previously been available for long-term rental. Um, it, it, it appears to me uh, that there's a lot of those previous long-term rental uh, units that are now available for short-term rental. So in, in the city's assessment, um, were we able to document anything like that in terms of the transition of long-term rental units to short-term rental units? Uh, through the chair, no, we uh, relied mostly upon the AirDNA, which like I said, is an aggregate of active listings. That's what we use to track kind of the trends. But once again, if through a project manager, they'd be able to kind of look into those types of metrics and answer those types of questions. Great. If we do proceed with enforcement that yep. way. Awesome. And then if um, there was a reference to property management for short-term rentals, which is different than a brokerage, um, 
can you describe the two and how are how is property management factored into this policy, if at all? Mr. Spacha. So just turning right. to the drafted bylaw, the short-term broker means any person who advertises, facilitates the advertisement of or broker short-term rental reservations via the internet or otherwise, and who receives payment, compensation, or any financial benefit due to due to or as a result of or in connection with a person making or completing a short-term rental reservation, uh, collects, assesses, or holds information on the number of nights that reservations of any short-term rental are made or completed. So it would be those processes that they'd have to be involved in to be considered a broker. If they're not, if they're just managing the property, then they are not a broker. Okay, and uh, through you, Chair, sorry, my apologies for forgetting that last time. Um, the property management is managed through a different business license then, um, and or does it is it not an equation in? Uh, through the chair, that would not be considered because we're mostly focusing on the operator. They would, Got it. It would be on the onus of the operator. I appreciate that. Thank you. And then if committee, uh, through you, chair, were to pursue um, alternative one and appreciating our municipal goal being about maximizing, protecting long-term rental, um, are, is staff able to um, provide an estimate in terms of the loss of potential units that would come on to the long-term rental side of things versus um, if we were to enable SDUs and laneways to be um, licensed for short-term uh, short -term rentals, how many are we looking at as a potential loss for, for the long-term? Uh, through the chair, I can't speak to that, what that number would be. I would anticipate the SDR numbers would go up throughout the city because they're, they would unlock, obviously, more, or it depends because then people would also speculate and then also buy property besides we've heard buy property specifically to STR, so they may also make those conversions, especially with the Ontario government loosening up a lot of the planning things around building secondary units. So I could anticipate they would be higher and throughout Hamilton. Yeah. So that could impact obviously long term rental market. Thank you. And it appears to me, Chair, that you know, um, if we were to pursue uh, this policy today and get things moving, that in our report backs that we receive from staff, then we'd actually have some of the data to help us as a municipality understand what is the impact of the short-term rental market um, specifically, and actually have those numbers once this, this kind of regime is in place, correct? Through the Chair, yes, we would have the numbers through the licenses being issued and applied for. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Chair Wilson, and through you, um, let's ask a couple of questions. Uh, during, you, you made mention during the, the presentation and there was uh, some conversation that was taking place during the, uh, the delegations this morning, uh, nuisance calls, noise, parking, garbage, uh, complaints, all, all identified. I'm wondering if um, there was any data that would um, separate out nuisance calls to STR properties as opposed to others that was collected during the uh, process that when, uh, you, we all started in 2017. Uh, through the chair, not at this current time, because we are unaware throughout the city, we have active listings, but as that, the industry is constantly, those listings aren't the same three and six to five, you have summer only STRs and then they drastically changing. Even if you look at the RDNA data, it changes daily what the active listings are because it is convenient obviously. Uh, but if we did have a licensing regime, we'd be able to know which properties we're getting nuisance complaints from. So we would be able to once again, provide council with that information. Okay, thank you. Uh, good answer. Um, my colleague, uh, from Ward 12 mentioned a uh, farmhouse in a rural setting in Ancaster. In Ward 10, I have uh, a constituent that's made me aware of a restored lakeside cottage, which is basically to this day off grid. It doesn't really have any services. Um, these are the type of properties that, to my estimation, wouldn't be uh, usable as long-term rentals uh, and, and may not even be usable to be owner-occupied in some uh, way, shape, or form. Um, I. I'm having trouble understanding what else to do with these properties. Are there other mechanisms through licensing that uh, these properties, I know that there's a B&B &B process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what other avenues would, would owners have for these properties uh, outside of the STR process if this were to be adopted? 
Uh, through the chair, the licensing bylaw also has the bed and breakfast hotel or motel licenses, and those are premises where one or more bedrooms are offered to members of the public who may pay for the use of a bedroom on any basis for seven days or less, and includes an inn but does not include a lodging house. So we do have other license types that may be able to suit their needs as well, better than an STR. Okay, and then just to, to piggyback, I don't know if there's anyone from um, the tourism portfolio uh, here in chambers that would be able to ask the question or answer the question uh, in terms of how does how do these experiential properties that's how it would categorize uh, you know a, a remote farmhouse uh, uh, rustic cabin by the lakeshore um, part of an experiential uh, property offering that ties neatly I think into tourism and being able to attract people for different reasons. Uh, is there anybody in the, in the gallery that may be able to speak to uh, how this plays into our overall tourism mix and if there would be an impact if these properties were removed from that tourism mix? We've got the big boss here, so GM Thorne. <laughs> just going to give the great answer that, yes, Ryan McHugh, the manager of tourism, is on the WebEx, and he could answer that question. Thank you. Uh, yes, so through the chair. Um, so if these short-term rentals uh, were to be licensed and... Uh, you know, we could uh, ensure as Tourism Hamilton that they're safe and would provide uh, a top-rate guest experience. We would view those certainly as our, our in our hotel and accommodation stock. Uh, so for a big, large events such as Grey Cup, where all our hotels are stay are, are full, we look at uh, the addition of short-term rentals uh, as a great asset because it allows more people to stay in Hamilton as opposed to staying in a neighboring uh, community and also they do provide different experiences and different hotels and motels and obviously there are guests that look for that experience so we do look at that as a nice uh, piece of the marketplace and uh, definitely meets a need and if we can again ensure that it's licensed and safe we would promote it accordingly thank you Thank you for the answer and through the chair. Um, with regards to the number of operators that own more than one short-term rental property, um, assuming that one being the principal residence, I'm wondering, do we have data that's available that would show how many operators own more than one additional to their existing uh, principal residence? And I hope that, that I've I've clarified that enough. I'm happy to, to do so. Question clear? Yep, uh, through the chair, so just referring back to the earlier presentation, that little snapshot from last November, that multi-listings would be captured in that data through our DNA. Uh, other than that, I can't really, it's hard to at the, in, disentangle those commercial operators versus those more residential operators that do have more than one property at this time. Like through a licensing regime, we could determine how many, because they, depending on obviously, how it goes forward, if they did have multi-listings on the license, we could answer that question. And I'm sorry, uh, through the chair, I apologize that my, my uh, questions may seem disjointed or out of order, uh, but this maybe ties back a little bit more to the tourism piece. Um, Hamilton is surrounded by Niagara, Halton, Brant, Haldeman, Waterloo regions. Um, wondering if staff can offer any comments as to which of these neighboring jurisdictions have or plan to have or in the process of having uh, similar processes or schemes to what we're uh, looking at here today. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I'm not familiar if those areas are proceeding. I can't remember off the top, sorry, it's just not off the top of my head. Thank you. And it is conceivable, and, and I admit this is more of a comment, uh, if we do proceed down a particular road, then uh, these adjoining municipalities that aren't currently not at the same level that we are, um, simply we may just lose traffic to those areas. Um, but that's more of a comment, not really a question. Thank you. It is. Thank you. We have a guest here uh, today in the form of Councillor Tom Peter Jackson. <laughs> I've told the director how popular he's become at City Hall. Thank you, Chair Wilson. Uh, thanks, Chair Wilson. Um, so, and I listened to a lot of the delegates in the ante room uh, where, the, um, where the volume was turned up. Uh, sorry, I wasn't physically here. I'm here for this item and another item. So I just want to ask uh, through you to a special project manager, Spijek, or Director Cirillo, 
Um, I just have one main issue, and that is over the good neighbor policy. My community over the years had two awful experiences with Airbnbs. Uh, I don't believe they were principal resident owned, which is obviously a recipe for potential problems. And they just reached a, po a point, Ben, where I had to um, uh, uh, escalate um, my uh, request through upper management, through Director Sorello and uh, police involvement to eventually lead to the shutdown of these two Airbnbs because they were three in the morning, loud noise, um, um, quasi-criminal type activity, uh, large groups coming in and out, and the two neighborhoods were just fed up with it. And uh, since then, uh, quality of life has been returned to some semblance of normalcy again. So through you, Chair Wilson, to either Ben or Monica, please, I need some level of assurance in terms of exactly what kind of strict enforcement for the extreme element that are being irresponsible. What, what measures will be carried out, please? Uh, through the Chair. So if that property is licensed as an STR, we'd be able to pull that active listing until they're back into compliance as well. We can also respond through our more traditional means through noise compliance and other public nuisance response. Excuse and then we also have the leverage of obviously if they're licensed and we can revoke it if needed. Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Ben. Director, please, possibly some additional information. Through the chair to the councillor, some, some additional, I think, um, comments that may settle any concerns you may have. Right now, the police have the ability to go on and actually work with Airbnb to remove these properties from their website. The city does not have that ability. With a license, we're able to then collaborate with the, you know, with the police in order to remove those active listings. And then further to Ben's point, following our typical um, licensing process, we can- I'm uh, just listening to the, that's, that's okay. Uh, the, the... Excuse me, there's someone online. If you would mute yourself, thanks. All right. Through, through our traditional uh, licensing process, we can also look to suspend and or revoke a license as well through our licensing tribunal. Well, I, the director and the special project manager, Chair Wilson, have uh, raised my comfort level. Again, apologize for the jadedness of where I'm coming at this from, but those two neighborhoods, it was way too long for months that there was a severe and serious disruption to their quality of life and it should never have happened. Thank you, Chair Wilson. Thank you. Seeing no first time speakers remaining. Second time, Councillor Danko, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Wilson. And uh, just to follow up on Councillor uh, Beattie's questions about the, the standard bed and breakfast license provision that's already available. So I'm clear if there are property owners that own multiple properties, they have a short term license uh, rental in their primary residence. Um, through the Airbnb, or sorry, through the bed and breakfast license that's already available through bylaw, they would be able to license an additional property that is not their primary residence. Uh, through the chair, yes, they could uh, go through the application process for that bed and breakfast license as a secondary unit, as long as it meets the, obviously the qualifications of the right. application. Thank you. Thank you. And just one follow up question. It was it was touched on, but I'd like to give uh, uh, Director Cirillo a bit more opportunity to comment on the safety aspect of this. Um, the, there, there's a fire inspection that's required. Uh, we would make sure there's appropriate access and egress. Um, just wonder if Director Cirillo would be able to uh, elaborate a little bit on, on how licensing would help ensure that units that are on the market to the public are in fact safe. Thank you. To the chair, to the councillor, you're, you're absolutely correct when it comes to a fire inspection. That would be something that's first and foremost. If it's an entire dwelling as well, we would be doing an officer inspection with MLE. We would expect drawings as to what the layout of the, the uh, property looks like. Um, we would be working with... Um, did, am I missing one? Fire and property standards are, are, are our main focus, but being able to actually get into the establishment to ensure the health and safety of those that are staying there is uh, first and foremost for our department. Thank you, and I believe that includes um, ensuring that there are fire safety plans uh, available to the actual renters, just like there are in hotel rooms. 
through the chair, that is correct. And, and I, I must admit, I, I missed a couple too, where we would require emergency contact information to be provided 24 seven of how the operator could be uh, reached, hotel lo or sorry, hospital locations, non-emergency lines, um, as well as uh, if they're from out of country, how to access our emergency lines through 911 as well. Thank you. And just finally, um, if there is an incident, uh, they would also be required to have uh, the short-term rental unit listed on their insurance as a business use of their home. So that those tenants, or sorry, those renters, uh, if there is a, you know, a liability issue, would have uh, coverage through that insurance. Director? Through the chair, that's correct. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have. Did you wish to add anything to that, Director? No, no, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Alex Wilson. I have no questions. I'm on the debate list, so I'll let other folks go. Uh, Councillor Kazar, yours were a debate or a question? question. Oh, yes. I get yeah. yeah, I should have asked earlier, but it was brought up around hotel capacity and comment around Grey Cup. It's good to have SDRs available. But outside of significant events like that, uh, what is our local hotel capacity and was that considered in this policy? Through the chair. Uh, through the chair. I uh, don't know the number of, sorry, just I could direct that to Director Cirillo. Through the chair, I'm actually going to pass that one on to Ryan and Tourism. He'd be able to speak to that. Oh, very good. Uh, so through the chair, uh, so the number of total hotel rooms in the city of Hamilton is currently 1,555 hotel rooms. And that number uh, has increased in recent years and will continue to as more hotels come online. Uh, in terms of uh, the occupancy rate, uh, currently our hotels are at an occupancy, occupancy of approximately 60 to 65 percent, uh, which is historically a bit lower than the high 60, 70 percent that the city experienced prior to COVID uh, restrictions in 2020. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Yes, sir. Further speakers? Questions? Okay, we're uh, going to engage in, uh, I think, a prior. Oh, Councillor Paul's uh, qu questions? Yeah. Yes, I have one more question uh, yeah. as we're talking that just came up to me. In Appendix A, Section 7, uh, subsection 7 by reference to a schedule uh, inspection, I assume those inspections would be uh, take place before the short-term rental is occupied, so it's consistent with the reasonable language it reference to whereas. Like, I'm just wondering, because I, I know I had an incident that someone was renting a room and it wasn't acceptable, but uh, they couldn't go in there and inspect it. So when would the inspection happen? Uh, through the chair, that would be before the license is issued, so that we have a certificate of compliance inspection. So that's the min ensuring the minimum standard through the property standards bylaw, and then it's also kind of acts as a nice uh, inspection to inform fire or the electrical safety authority if there's other issues that are found from that level as well. And that's done uh, triannually. Thank you, Councillor. So if, if someone rents their basement or uh, a room and it's not acceptable, it is acceptable. But I, at the time of the inspection, and then somebody rents it and goes downhill, can somebody go in there and inspect it again while someone's living there? Uh, through the chair, so uh, as the bylaw states, I think is they have the operators required to allow that inspection upon request by officers and licensing and bylaw within seven days. Within seven days. Okay, thank you, that's my questions. Thank you very much. No further questions. Um, on behalf of committee, thank you to staff. Uh, this has been on the docket for a while. Appreciate your time and effort. If I could have a mover and a seconder to receive this presentation, moved by Councillor Alex Wilson, seconded by Councillor Nan.
Thank you, that vote carries 12 to nothing. I need a mover and a seconder to receive the written submissions. Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor um, Cadison. Written submissions. No. Thumbs up from Councillor Nan. Thank you, 12 to nothing. We're now on to the report itself. May I have a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendations in the report? Okay, we'll have, I'll recognize Councillor Danko. So I'll put the uh, the report on the floor, but I have one amendment and then I would move uh, the alternative at the appropriate time. So I don't know if you wanna go through a debate list first or um, how you wanna handle that. I think if you put it on the floor, you, if you put, shouldn't move the amendment. I'll move the amendment. So you'll put the alternative or alternative one on the floor or is it an amendment to the original staff report recommendations? It would be an amendment to both. Um, <laughs> that doesn't sound good. That's an evil laugh. So, like that. <laughs> why don't Why don't we do? No, we have to do the amendment first. If If it's actually a um, yes, if you're amending this the recommendation, this the original staff recommendation, that it would be an amendment. If you're doing something different, well, then it would just be putting that on the floor. It'd be alternative one with an amendment. Okay. Okay, do you have a seconder for that? Councillor Nan. Okay, thank you. So uh, committee members, uh, alternative one as set out in the report is on the floor uh, for your consideration. Are there any comments or questions or debates on this matter? Did you wanna speak to it? Please, and, and also the amendment. Dingo. Uh, so I, I think every, everybody's uh, uh, read alternative one. This is basically the same as the staff recommendation. It just includes uh, secondary suites and laneway houses as alternatives for uh, short-term licenses. So um, I think listening to the delegates today, that makes a lot of sense to me because it's still limited to your principal residence um, and you can only license one of those three. So if, you know, the example used, if you had a principal residence that had both a secondary suite and a laneway house and your principal residence, uh, you'd only be able to license one of those options. Um, recommend, uh, recognizing the concerns about uh, this, the the, Purpose of this legislation is to increase the supply of long-term rentals. Um, I think at the same time, we wanna also ensure that, uh, that we're encouraging legal secondary dwelling units um, and also perhaps a pathway to laneway houses. And I think by including that as uh, permissible for short-term rentals um, helps with that goal because um, you might have uh, portions where you uh, are renting out your primary residence, you um, have an intention to legalize a secondary dwelling unit, uh, that can be expensive, that can be a long process. Um, by having access to um, funding through short-term rentals, that might allow more people to have secondary dwelling units that are, that are legal and recognized by the city. Um, they might be between tenants, uh, where, uh, you know, having, um, you know, a space where they they're want to put their secondary dwelling unit on the, uh, the short-term rental license uh, market. And also, I, I think we heard um, from a number of the delegates primarily that were renting out a portion of their home that is separate, that has a separate entrance, that is, uh, they don't have contact with, with the, uh, the short-term rental license clients that are using that space. And really that is a secondary dwelling unit. So I think by including that, um, it ensures that that secondary dwelling unit is also included in, in the whole entire 
uh, secondary dwelling unit licensing process. So um, with that in mind, I, I think uh, alternative one is, is a good compromise uh, because it allows a little bit more flexibility, uh, a, a little bit more um, um, ability for property owners to, to utilize their property in the way they think is appropriate, um, but at the same time limits it to the principal residence. And on the, um, on the uh, change, um, I would, along with that, um, delete the requirement for the 120-day um, cap on the number of nights. And again, just on the amendment, uh, we heard from a number of the delegates that that was a real sticking point for them, especially people that are renting out a portion of their own home um, that are using that to augment their, their mortgage or their, their household expenses. I know I've spoken to a number of um, short-term rental license uh, purveyors in, in Ward 8, and that was their main concern. They're renting out a portion of their home, they're using it to help pay their mortgage, um, and by limiting, or arbitrarily, I'll say, limiting it to 120 days, they felt was, was a major impediment to their ability to have a successful business and, and help them in the way that they, they are currently operating those properties. So um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, that's, uh, I think, what's on the table, and well, you can take it back. Thank you. So there is um, an alternate alternative one is on the floor with a modification to suspend the 120 day uh, period on the that which is on the floor. Councillor Pauls. You're muted. My request was for the last time to speak, but I'll ask you a question uh, through the chair. Are we voting on the amendment now or uh, staff? Yeah, we are voting on. It's not officially an amendment. It's just, it's really, it's just a, a we're thinking of it as a new recommendation. Okay. That, I just that, wanted to that was clear, my fault. No yeah, problem sorry, Councillor. That was my fault. I was doing it uh, procedurally, trying to mimic what I am familiar with. So alternative one is on the floor and that's what we're considering right now. Again, uh, with a modification to the 120 day. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. No problem. Councillor Alex Wilson. Thank you, just a point of clarification on what's actually in front of us. Are we striking the 100 days and replacing it with nothing? Um, or is the intention to strike the 120 days and replace it with a different number? Because I think like that's, that's a very different understanding. Someone who rents out their building 365 days a year never once lives there, but that's their primary residence. Um, so just a clarification of what's actually in front of us before debating. I'll ask the mover. Councillor Danko. Yes, my intention was to remove the 120-day cap, um, but that I don't think changes the requirement that it's still their primary residence. Um, so happy to enter some debate, and I'll just, I think, operationally there is a difference. I understand what's written in the bylaw, but in terms of enforcement, I, I'd look to staff maybe to provide some expertise, um, expertise on that and would suggest that 180 days seems like a great interim measure, especially as we're getting more reports for reviews if, we're, if our intention is to increase it. But before we get into kind of that, I just really want to thank all of the delegates for sharing their experiences. I know we still have some with us. I've been emailing today with Ward 13 operators who've had some very specific questions. Um, and I think all of us as colleagues, like we've really furthered our understandings of this issue throughout the conversation today. We've been asking questions. And one of the things stands out, because I think we're about to get in some debate, there might be some disagreement, but what there hasn't been disagreement around the table today is the need to do this. With the exception of one delegate, everyone in their remarks said, we do need licensing. We welcome licensing. It's just what that looks like and how exclusive it is, is the question at hand. And so I think we really need to hold that in our mind because you know, there is no question that we need to move forward and move forward urgently. Um, we've heard that there's a small number of operators with multiple highly commercialized properties, and these are the driving, these are the ones driving growth in SDR listings. There is a dramatic need to get into this and get into this today. And how could we not? If you run a business in our city, you require a business license of some form. If you handle food, you have food handling requirements. Housing is the only exception where we do not regulate and we do not protect folks outside of the RTA. 
This is unacceptable. And so what this licensing does is it helps close that gap. It ensures basic fire safety protections, basic property standards protections. We've heard that often folk, times vulnerable folks in transition are the ones who really require short-term rentals. We need to make sure those aren't fire traps. I think we've heard from the operators today that that's a welcome change. No one wants to be renting out a fire trap. Um, and so it's, again, this question of how do we move forward? Um, and I... I think I want to hold this principle that we are in a housing crisis caused by the commodification of housing. And I do not see de I do not see further commodification or allowing of commodification of housing is going to help us get out of it. That said, I understand a principle of fairness. We have operators here who would be impacted with the main recommendation as opposed to expanding it to the secondary dwelling units on a principal rec residence, and there is a big transition for folks in the system. I think this is something we need to keep evaluating as we get those report backs um, and think about what that right balance is, what the right fee structure is, whether it's an in-residence partial rental, whether it's a full house. Like, I'm really excited to kind of keep this conversation going, but I want to say I really, really support what staff has done in bringing forward the original motion. Happy also to support Amendment 1 because I think that's the right compromise, as the mover said, but I am happy to support motion one with the 120 days, or if we want to move towards maybe 180 days or another reasonable exception, I think it does take away from the spirit of the recommendation to have no cap um, as what does that mean to be a principal residence otherwise if you're not living there. Thank you. I'm going to recognize Councillor uh, Critch in a moment, but to Elsie Kelsey, um, the way in which um, that which is on the floor has been packaged. Uh, is it possible to sever the two, meaning voting on alternative one and then voting on alternative one with the 120 day as a debate? I'm, I'm looking at Councillor Danko, who is the mover, so. What I, the way I was looking at it is if one of the councillors put an amendment to that emotion to add in a number of days cap. I, look, it would be that I feel that like Councillor Danko is on the floor with the 120 being removed. So if another councillor wanted to make it 180, that would just be amending I the that first. Danko's motions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies, uh, Councillor Crutch. Thanks. And I uh, just about 100% agree with what Councillor Alex Wilson said. Um, also, okay with this idea. Um, have the same feelings about housing commodification. My concern about removing the 120 days entirely, Councillor Tanko, is just that, and to staff ask a question, is that what I heard, um, and I apologize for not knowing your name, but last name, Ben, um, but what I heard Ben say was, if we take the time period off entirely, what we do is we eliminate the notion that it's a short-term rental. And so then the definition of the idea of a short-term rental evaporates entirely, and now we're into a situation where it's a perpetual or a long-term rental. There's no real distinguishing difference except this becomes a principal uh, dwelling uh, rental program, um, essentially. That's my understanding, and that's why, and that's why I think he was leaning toward, if I understand, 120 days. Um, but like having no time restriction, I think would. So I want to ask staff that question: like, what's the impact of um, removing the time restriction? Because we do have another time restriction here, the 28 days that kind of that is operating. Uh, but I understand there's a loophole around that. So I just want to understand: these are the two temporal arrangements for the word short term. How would changing those temporal arrangements impact the overall bylaw or proposition you have before us today, Dr. Sherlock? Through the chair to the councillor, I, I can certainly give you our, our, our reasoning for putting those caps in place, and that was to make sure that we were capturing short-term rental. Our, our concern was that if we didn't have caps in place, whether that be the 28 consecutive days or the 120 days, people might be there too long, in which case it does filter into a long-term type rental. We also raised the concern if if it is a principal residence and they're there for over 120 days, is it that person's principal residence? So I just wanted to, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it certainly allows you to understand where we were coming from when it came to putting these caps in place. Thank you. Councillor Critch. Thanks. Did you consider things like um, the OHIP residency requirements? So, I mean, that's 153 days. Did you consider that as part of your thinking in this at all? Through the chair to the councillor, I wouldn't be able to speak on that, but I, I don't. 
I'm going to say we, we looked more to the RTA and numbers that would uh, pertain to long-term and short-term rental, not necessarily OHIP or other provincial numbers. If you could just unpack RTA, please. Oh, apologies through the chair to the councillor, Residential Tenancies Act. Thank you. I'm in respect of the recommendation you made today, which has been thought through, you thought through the, the number of 120 days. I get that and I appreciate your, your thoughts. Um, in the place we find ourselves now where we're thought, thinking about um, having, a, having a number of days or not having a number of days, what's kind of the upset limit in your mind, do you think, for us to maintain the short-term rental spirit of this bylaw um, and also have a number of days? Thank you, Director. Through the chair to the councillor, I would certainly look to our municipal comparisons. So I would suggest between 120 days and 180 days if we were to keep a cap on it. Thank you. Can I put forward an amendment? Am I allowed to do that now? Um, I think we're going to exhaust our speakers on that which is before us, or, or is someone allowed to do that? I'm looking to Elsie Kelsey. Sorry, I missed the beginning of that, but we're still really on the discussion of the amendment, if that answers the question. So we're going to, um, Councillor Kretsch asked the question, if uh, they're able to put forward um, an amendment to the amendment, but not, it's not an amendment. No, the amendment to the proposition that Councillor Danko put forward, as you suggested, I, that somebody might be able to do. When can I put the amendment forward? Well, I would say that I don't feel officially an amendment to Councillor Danko's motion has been put forward, so you could put forward your amendment if you wish now on the number. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like oh, to no. move that to amend um, what Councillor Danko is suggesting to have it be 180 days instead of no days. That's the thing I'm moving as an amendment. Sir Spadafora. Councillor Spadafora is seconding that. Elsie Kelsey, if I could just ask um, on behalf of committee, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I, I have a feeling that Councillor Kazar had a question pertaining to, to um, Councillor Danko's, but now that's been bumped because uh, Councillor Critch now has something. Is that okay? It could go either way. Do you wish to? Okay. We're cool. All right, we're cool. So, so is someone able to speak to Councillor Crutches? Yes, is there anyone who wishes to have a question or comment on it? Uh, and if you're okay, I'm gonna recognize Councillor Kassar and then Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Chair. So yes, on this topic is what I wanted to speak to. My understanding on the 120 days or no limit on days, is especially given the fact that we're now considering including secondary suites of laneway housing, is it, it certainly is possible for someone to be a host and rent out short term um, their space 365 days a year and still be there. So unless I'm misunderstanding it, I, I don't see the same concern as my colleagues that if they're... Uh, if the host is renting for most of the year, say 365 days, that that's still not their primary residence. So uh, I, maybe I'm oversimplifying or I'm not understanding it, but if we are allow, if this proposal under this uh, option, alternative one, there is a, a secondary suite, it is theoretically possible for someone to be renting that 365 days a year and that person to be living there as a host as a principal resident. So I'm just looking for clarification if uh, my understanding is correct through the chair. Thank you, I'm gonna to look to Director Cirillo. Through the chair to the councillor, I apologize. Do you mind repeating your question? Not a problem. Theoretically, I believe it's possible for a host to rent out their 
part of their home, a secondary suite or a room, 365 days a year to different people with the 28-day max and still have that be their primary residence. Therefore, a limit of the number of days they could rent isn't a factor in determining if it's a primary residence or not. Thank you. Is that clear? Through the chair to the councillor, correct, under alternative one. Yes. That's what I wanted to clarify. Um, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. Thank you. And through you, Chair Wilson, um, my, my questioning is, is similar to my colleagues. Um, thank you for, for seeking that clarification, uh, Councillor Kassar. Um, we've heard from a number of, of folks this morning Many of the users of uh, short-term rentals are here doing what I would call uh, unpredictable circumstances. Um, medical, sometimes family-related, sometimes professional. Um, and and I, I struggle with putting a, a cap um, on, uh, on those stays. And I think that actually speaks to the 28-day limitation on there. Um, so I just want to see clarification if if any of the uh, proposals that we're about to vote on changes the 28-day cap or if through uh, amendment one or option one, forget my, my terminology, uh, plus the amendment from the proposal from uh, uh, Councillor Danko, if this changes the 28-day uh, cap on consecutive stays. Either the movers can answer that or Director Cirillo. Who would you prefer? Director Cirillo? Through the chair to the councillor, no, 28 days would still remain. So without a cap, you could technically have someone in there 28 days out of a day, back 28 days out of a day, back in 28 days. Thank you. Order. Sorry, and just to clarify back to uh, Director Cirillo, then the, I'm, I'm sensing that's the workaround then if somebody gets to the end of their 28-day period um, and for extenuating circumstances, medical, family, professional, whatever, um, they just reset the agreement and continue on for another 28-day uh, period through the host provider uh, platform. Thank through you. the chair. Director. Through the chair, that would be... Correct, it would definitely be an option 28 and then off a day if there were no caps completely. If there was that cap, it would be up to 180 days or 120 days, which whichever one is on the floor. And then we would, they would not be able to be permitted to rent out after that. Okay, I'm just trying to, again, make sure that we're, we're sensitive to some of the users of these, uh, these properties that are coming in, again, under unpredictable extenuating circumstances. And when, when the clock runs out at 28 days, if they're in the middle of, of something that is particularly stressful, uh, I would want to be sensitive to, to that. And so I'm, I'm still trying to, to know if there's an opportunity through a, a different amendment or what the, the process would be here around this table at that period um, to take another look at how we cap this or if we're simply allowing the the platform user uh, the, the platform supplier to uh, to simply reset at day 28 and begin again on day 29 and I don't know if this is a legislative question I'm, I'm seeking the guidance of the the chair perhaps um, if there's uh, any other option or conversation that could lead to a change in that 28 day cap. Um, I guess I'm not sure uh, if you would like to pursue that. I think that option would be up to you to put forward as a member of this committee. Um, or you could uh, go with that which is before us and has been mentioned. You put that as part of what the service project managers seeks to e evaluate once the project unfolds. The option is yours. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I'm unsure of how to proceed uh, on that issue. Um, I suppose that um, as long as there is an available option and, and Director Cirillo has identified one uh, that does allow for some form of minimal disruption, 
um, that I'd be comfortable at this point in, in continuing along that line. Um, when we speak to the uh, amount of time that a, a unit can be in, in service, for lack of a better term, um, I'm supportive of uh, Councillor Danko's uh, lifting of any restriction um, due to the fact that uh, I, I, I don't see an issue with uh, someone having up to 365 days of usage from, uh, let's say, a secondary dwelling unit or a basement unit um, whilst they still live in that unit. Uh, so I'm supportive of uh, lifting the restriction for 120 days and, and having it set at no restriction. Thank you. I'm going to recognize Councillor Spedafora as a first time speaker. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just looking for some clarity for myself. So the as you're renting um, to a person, the max they can stay is for 28 days. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Through the chair to the councillor, correct. Perfect. So the 120-day cap that was in there was to ensure that the person who was using this as a rental could only rent it out for 120 days total within the year? Through the chair, correct. Okay, then... I'm going to, unfortunately, Councillor, not be able to second your motion. Um, I, 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 I misunderstood. I, I agree with Councillor B that I think we don't want to be taking an opportunity away from someone who is following our rules and our license and our bylaw and investing that money to meet our um, guidelines and then take the opportunity for them to make revenue away from them. So... Uh, thank you for clarifying. Thank you. So um, I believe I saw Councillor Alex Wiss Wilson uh, step forward uh, in their willingness to second Councillor Kretsch's. Um, I have a speaker's list. I'm just seeking clarification from LC Tamara Bates on, on my uh, back to Councillor Danko. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So on the amendment, um, perhaps I wasn't as clear as I could have been, and I do appreciate the, the debate and the discussion because I think it's important that we get this right. Um, on the issue of renting out your principal residence for 365 days a year, that's not possible because you still have to prove that you live there. The, um, the definition of the principal residence is, is in the bylaw. Um, so I don't think that's a concern. There's there's the cap on 120 days or 180 days. Um, nobody would be able to rent out their entire principal residence for 365 days a year and the still claim is the principal residence. So, so that doesn't apply. Where I see this having the biggest impact, and this is what we heard all morning uh, from the delegates, is in the scenario when uh, the principal residence owner is renting out a portion of their home, whether that be a secondary suite or a laneway suite or just the basement or, or whatever portion of their home. Um, and under the current bylaw that's capped at, or sorry, what's on the table, that would be capped at 180 days. And so what I've heard from residents, you know, that in Ward 8 that operate Airbnbs, uh, what we heard from the delegates is that cap is a real, um, restriction or constraint on their ability to earn a, a revenue from the secondary uh, short-term rental. And if it's capped at 180 days, or if there's no cap, that unit is still going to be rented as a short-term rental. It's not gonna enter into the long-term rental market because it's just gonna sit empty for the balance. So I, I think Again, what we heard from the people that are operating these businesses is they, they need that flexibility to be able to, you know, maximize the investment that they're making in their property um, by being able to not be arbitrarily constrained on when and how often they can rent their own property. And we still have the, the restriction in place, the 28 days, so it's it's... It's not like you know one person's going to live there for 365 days a year. There's still controls to make sure that it's not uh, effectively a long-term rental where, when it should be. 
um, because it still has to be a separate person every, you know, separate rental uh, agreement every 28 days. So I, I feel very confident and covered that just by having no cap, um, the point of the bylaw is still going to achieve the goals that we have. And it also, I, I want it to be successful. I want our short term, um, uh, our short term rental providers to have successful businesses. Because if this bylaw ends up being not successful, we're going to end up having to repeal the whole thing. And that was the, 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 the nightcap the number of nights was the number one thing that people brought up as being, um, you know, something that would that would constrict their ability to have a, a successful business. So we, I think, we want them to be successful. We want that, you know, we t we heard about all of the uh, the uh, the economic benefits. Um, so I, I think we can achieve that and and get to the same goal. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize Councillor Nan as the first time on this item. Uh, first time on the amendment. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, so with the the number of day cap topic, I think part of the complicating factor is the rental of an entire home versus a portion of the home. And I think if we are able to find a way to discern that, we might be in a place that carries the balance of concern that I'm hearing among my colleagues around this table. In so much that, you know, when I've heard from residents in Ward 3 who are absolutely committed to a participating in a fair licensing process, uh, who only uh, short term rent out a portion of their home when their family from outside of Canada is visiting to take care of their grandchild and was only able to do that for two months out of the year, for the remainder of the year, they're supplementing their income through uh, short term rental of that space if they're not using that space for home office use. Very specific example. However, I think it's one that helps shed light on the balance of issues that we're trying to contend with here. Um, so it's commentary, and I guess maybe I could put that in the form of a question to staff that uh, could it be that we place a cap if it's specific to the entire home or the entire primary residence versus a portion? because I believe that might help alleviate some of the concern that's being expressed here. Thank through, you, Director. Through the Chair to the Councillor, just so I'm clear in your question, if it's a secondary dwelling or laneway house, we're looking for a cap, or is it a partial portion of the dwelling itself that you would be looking for a cap on? Through you, back to you, in the sense that what we're exploring now as the, the main direction is that uh, as a primary residence owner, I have the ability from the contemplation at the floor right now to short-term rental, short-term rent out either a portion of my home, a secondary dwelling unit, or a laneway, or my entire house. But I have to pick one of the four above. And so... I guess in the case of the laneway house, which could be technically an entire secondary dwelling unit uh, or my primary house is, uh, you're nodding, so you think you know where I'm headed. So let's hear from, from you through the chair because I'm starting to lose it. Yeah. Through the chair, I, 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 based on the conversation that is going around here, if that is something that we want to look at, I, I would say that yes, we would be able to carve out different caps depending on usage, but that may take additional staffing time and or resources because mm -hmm. that would be a variety of different licensing licenses that would be issued depending on what we would be proceeding with. So I guess my short answer to your, to your question would be if, if we're looking at changing it up so much, I, I would almost want to take it back, mm -hmm. talk to staff about it, and then bring it back to council. Thank you, Director. Councillor Dan. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. I'm, I was trying to lessen the complication versus uh, add to it. And my goal here for committee is to get us to a place where we can um, enact a policy uh, that can be ratified by the next council because there is such a desperate need to license short-term rentals 
Um, there are some nuances that I think we need some time to flesh out, and I'm, I, I'll leave it there, Chair, that my goal is to end this meeting with something in place, uh, recognizing that there is a balance of an issue that we need to address in terms of um, ensuring that primary residences are not being uh, rented out under the short-term license uh, consecutively for the entire year and taking those units potentially out of uh, long-term. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, you know, I have Councillor Pauls, then Councillor Wilson, then Councillor Kazar on the list. Councillor Pauls. Thank you. And this is getting uh, deeper into the mud here. I want to... Um, uh, go back of what uh, Councillor Beatty was saying, and maybe I, this could be clarified by staff. Um, I'd rather have no limitation, like Councillor Danko says, for 120 days. Uh, there's no need for that. But I, I'm concerned about the 28 days. I heard said that after 28 day, the days, the person could leave and then come back. What's the difference? Or if I'm renting short term, I put it under my name and then I could put it under my family name. Like, I think that should be removed as well. Can you explain, can the same person rent by evacuating one day and come back? Thank you, Director Srilo. Through the chair to the councillor, with the 28 day cap, the same person could come back for 28 days leave for a day and come back for 28 days, theoretically. Right. For 360, so, sorry? Excuse me, Councillor, not the director. For 365 days, if that cap was fully removed, if, like our recommendation of having a cap, it would be 28 days consecutive with a break and then 28 days for up to 120 or 180 days. So in my, as I see it, there is no need to put the 28 days because a person could just leave or say, how do we police that? How do we go and say, yeah, you didn't leave that day? That person could go out all day long and come back at midnight and start again. So in my opinion, uh, this is my opinion, I feel like the 28 days should be removed completely and the 120 days should be removed. And the reason is this, all the delegates, those were the sticking points that they made. Those are the points that they do not want the city to demand things. They will do the uh, licensing fee, no problem, but it's those days. So if I agree with Councillor Danko, we shouldn't have the 120 days, but I also think the 28 days, it's impossible. It's impossible to, uh, to police it to find out how. And also, when you get insurance, you can say, I'm a short-term rental. Do you have to call the insurance all the time and say, oh, I don't have anybody for two months. Can you give me a rebate on my insurance? It's impossible to do. So that's my reason. And um, th th those are my um, thoughts. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Alex Wilson. Thanks so much. I'd love to try and draw a line under some of this, but before I start, I'm just hoping I could go to Director Sorello with a bit of a question, which is, Please. why are we doing this? Is it to crack down on fraudulent people regarding their primary residence? Is it to um, regulate, you know, this business? Or is there reasons that we are trying to regulate short-term rentals as they pertain to the broader market? Uh, to Director Sorrell, through the chair. Through the chair to the councillor. Thank you for the question. And it's certainly a broad question, so I'll keep my answer as short and tight as I, I possibly can. There's a lot of competing factors that we're looking at when we are bringing forward a bylaw like this. We're looking at health and safety for those of them, those that are staying in these properties. We're looking at a housing affordability. We're looking at tourism. We're looking at economic development. Um, but first and foremost, from a licensing and regulatory point of view, we look at it from a consumer protection and a health and safety um, reason for doing so. The one thing I just want to do flag is, is I want to remind that it is a short-term rental bylaw. So if it's beyond 28 days, it is no longer short-term, and then the bylaw doesn't apply to it. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you. And just one other clarification. I know we've heard this, but I the conversation around the room, I think, could benefit from this being clarified again. So you can be a landlord who just rents out your unit. You can be a short-term rental operator, like an Airbnb is the most common. You could be an Airbnb. You could be a rooming house. Am I missing some of these? 
through the chair. You could also be a lodging home. You could be a B and B, a bed and breakfast as well. We also license those categories, or we're simply just a landlord. Thank you so much. So what we're saying here is not that these businesses cannot exist. What we are saying is that they cannot exist necessarily as a short-term rental. And what we are doing is we're defining the boundaries of what a short-term rental is. Um, given that affordability is one of the guiding reasons that this first came two council terms ago, um, why other cities have justified moving forward short-term rental licensing, I just really struggle, especially now that we've expanded and we're only having a conversation now in the context of allowing secondary dwelling units on principal properties as well, how is this helping with affordability whatsoever to remove the cap? To folks' questions saying, well, we're making it harder to make money. Yes, we are drawing a line where we believe as council is reasonable because we are trying to say that after a certain moment in time, you, this should be a long-term rental. Your backyard laneway suite should be a long-term rental. And if it is economically viable via Airbnb to rent out for 12 months of the year, your backyard dwelling suite to folks who are visiting and doing tourism, I'm not saying there's no value to that, but I'm saying that we have to draw the line somewhere in finding that balance between these competing priorities. And we have completely undermined any affordability protections if we do not have some form of limitations on what is short term, because that's the point. We are trying to limit how profitable this can be. That's that's what we're doing here today, in my opinion. Um, and so I think that whether it's 120 days, whether it's 180 days, we can find that right balance so we can say this is what the right balance is, um, open to where that balance is, and we can also evaluate it. There's a phased in enforcement in the motion. We're not doing any enforcement for five months. This is a chance to work with folks. We'll be getting reports. We can evaluate this. But if it's 365 days of the year, we've done nothing to placate any affordability concerns, in my opinion. Thank you. Can't, excuse me, order in order. Pardon me. You can leave the chamber if you're going to use that language. It's not permitted. I won't say it again. Councillor Kassar. Thank you, Chair. So I'll just continue on with Councillor Alex Wilson's point. I guess the one thing that I don't um, see in, in what was just said is if a host has a short-term rental, uh, whether they rent it out 120 or 180 or 365 days a year, it's a short term, it's available for short term rental and it's not providing additional housing for uh, long term rentals. Uh, I, I agree, absolutely agree. We need to have more affordable housing. I just don't see how putting a limit is actually going to generate more units if the host desire is to have short term rental for supplementing their income or all the other reasons that have been been shared today um, through the delegation. So that's one thing I'm struggling with because we share the goal of having more affordable housing. I just don't know that this is how we do it by putting a limit on the number of days. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to put myself on the speaker's list if I could look to Councillor Danko to take the chair. Thank you. I don't mean to, to muddy the waters. Um, I'm having, having deja vu about uh, questions that were asked with respect to the vacancy home tax, questions that were asked with respect to the licensing of uh, certain properties in wards 1, 8, and 14. Well, how will, we, how will we know? Well, we won't know until we inventory and license. Uh, but if we inventory and license, how will we know? Well, we won't know unless we, it, it's a self, uh, it, it's the worst kind of Groundhog Day. Um, if we do not uh, provide some sort of short-term licensing, we will not be able to uh, discern whether in fact we create more um, long-term rental units on the market. Our objective, in my opinion, is the reason for the 120 or the 180 days is so that it doesn't become viable for a short-term rental for 365 days. Because if it becomes financially viable for that purpose, uh, then it will remain a short-term rental. It will not remain a long-term rental. And that gets back to uh, the question of why are we doing this? If we want to have a discussion about the extension of licensing of rental properties, we can have that discussion, but it has to wait for about two years until a pilot completes itself. This is about trying every lever that is at our disposal 
to try and generate more long-term rental market units on the market because we are in this crisis. And we're seeing the unintentional consequences of having a corporate takeover with local people uh, party to it. They're not, they're not driven by nefarious means, but it is part of a new economy. We're trying to put a limit through a mechanism to ensure that it becomes a long-term rental. But we are also enabling people to allow to have a short-term rental. We're not precluding that option. We're not precluding from someone to make some amount of money and provide some degree of accommodation. But you can't have, in my opinion, both. You either make it, this is about trying to put long-term um, units on the market, or it's about a hospitality plan. If we're, if we're not clear on why we're doing this, then in, we should not do it. But my objective is we are in an affordability crisis. There has been a corporate takeover of rental properties. One of the unintended consequences are we are shrinking rental units. That's my objective. That's why I, uh, I'll go for alternative one. I'll go for a project manager who is going to come back with uh, data and co what's consequence, unintended or otherwise, to fully, to more fully inform our future steps. Did it achieve what we thought it could? If it didn't, let's pull back, let's change, uh, let's do something. But to do nothing and to do something that um, without those kind of constraints, it will not achieve what we're hoping to do. So those are my comments. I will not uh, support um, uh, anything that will make it more difficult to try and push um, us into achieving those objectives. Thank you. Chair, it's back to you. So we have something on the floor, I believe from Councillor Kretsch, because it's, oh, forgive me, Councillor Tadison. So I just wanna ask um, through the chair, what percentage of STRs are actually on principal residence where people actually live and are renting out accommodations, whether they're short, whether they're, um, you know, a laneway suite or bedrooms? What percentage? I thought that was like small, like 20%. Through the chair to the councillor, I, I wish I had that information. That would be the information we would be looking to collect once the, the, the bylaw would be in place. Councillor Tedison. Just wrote down so much. I'm just trying to find where I thought it represented a smaller proportion. And then there was two, there was two that was 50 and 50%. 50 was that the distinguishing? You can, I have chair an answer, to, but you go ahead, please. Sorry, through the chair to the councillor. I'm being told that was a comparison between commercial operators and uh, personnel. Yeah. The 50%. Okay. I think I'm going to stop right there and just um, let your comment. Questions, councillor. Uh, councillor Wayne. Thank you. And um, I'd like to... Just refer back to AirDNA because uh, that's what Ben had also referred to. When we look at AirDNA, it's 1,354 active rentals as of today, of which 79% are entire home. So, um, and I know that through Delegate Emily Power presentation, 50% of those were um, owner operated, they were there. Yeah, so I think that that's where. But this is where the information kind of gets a little bit hazy for me because I think that when we look at what's happening in a snapshot of today, the, move, the goalposts are moving so quickly that I think that um, we ought to be putting some sort of licensing in place. But I'm also for the opportunity of just putting it forward 
and then putting the project manager in place, getting the data, and rejigging this at a future date. Uh, especially because at this point, we don't have enough data to really start to put all the nuts and bolts and the finer points together. So my goal is to look at it be a little more broader and then refine as we have more data. So I'm in favor of Councillor Danko's um, recommendation, which is SDUs included, but 100% um, uh, no cap on the no cap on the nights. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Wilson. I've said this before, so I'm not going to take a lot of time. I just really am confused um, about that, comp like this kind of line of thinking about the full days. If I could make $120 a day, as we've seen, as an Airbnb host, and I can make, say, $2,000 a month in rent, after a certain point in time, one of those things becomes more profitable than the other, and I would do the short term over the long. Um, the answer as to why would people do this is because it makes more money. Um, so that's part of our considerations if we're trying to influence consumer trends. So thank you. Thank you. So we have Councillor Kretsch, uh, if you could, because it's been a lengthy, good, very healthy debate and discussion, if you could reiterate what is on the floor for all of us. Yeah, what I'm uh, suggesting is that we go with alternative one. Um, instead of having a no days of a cap, we have 180 days of a cap, which is about 60 days higher than the cap proposed by staff. Is that, is that clear? And then Councillor Alice Wilson is suggesting that. Okay. And that's seconded, seconded by Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Okay, everybody clear on that? Councillor Beatty? So to make sure that we are voting on the amendment first to Councillor Danko's original motion. And the amendment is the cap of 180 days. Alternative one, 100. Just 180 and not alternative one then? Correct, this is the amendment to Councillor Danko's motion, which is basically alternative one, but with no cap. And then Councillor Kretsch had said, Yes, to take <laughs> Councillor Danko's motion, but with 180 days cap. Okay. Councillor Beattie, clear? Meaning that if um, Councillor Crutch's amendment fails, we go back to Councillor Danko's original proposal, which is alternative one with an unlimited cap. That's my understanding procedurally, and it's been confirmed by LC Kelsey. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Vote is up. Defeated by a vote of four to eight. Thank you. So, Councillor Danko. Do you want to reiterate yours one more time? Sure, it's uh, alternative one, which includes secondary suites and laneway houses as alternatives for short-term uh, rentals, and it eliminates the 120-day uh, cap on the number of nights that it can be rented. Thank you. Councillor Pauls on the on Councillor Danko's amendment. Yep. I, I'm just wondering, would the councillor also include, if not, I would like to put the amendment on, the 28 days? Because in my opinion, it is hard. I'm to um, put no restriction on the 28 days for the same person, because I, my understanding is the person could just leave for the day the, the, and just come the back. The question has been asked, and um, you, you'd, um, I'm looking to the mover. He's not willing to entertain that. If you wanted to put forward that as an amendment, uh, you, you're, you're um, okay. well I would like to put that. Yes, I would like to put an amendment to eliminate the 28 days. And the reason is, 
they will do it anyway. There's no way of policing that. Counselor, we cannot. Councillor Pauls, beg your pardon. I, I think you can put it forward, but okay. you need to duly move it and you need a seconder to do so before you can speak to it. Okay, would somebody like to um, second that amendment? And because you're virtual, on your, on your behalf, I'll canvas the room. Okay. There's no one uh, coming forward to second your amendment, Councillor. All right, that's fine. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have something on the floor. Councillor, did you have a question? That carries 10 to 2. Thank you. Thank you to all members uh, and to staff, particularly for your heavy lifting and providing us the clarity that we were seeking at numerous points along the way, and to all members for a really constructive debate. Thank you. Um, so do we have to move the report with as amended, or we're cool? We're good? All right. Yahoo. On to 13, notices of motion 13.1. Councillor Danko, this is, um, you're presenting a motion on someone's behalf, demolition permit for 820 Rymel Road East. Thank you, uh, Chair Wilson. This is moving us on Councillor Jackson's behalf, although he is uh, joining us this afternoon, uh, seconded by Councillor Spatafora. I believe this is just a, a routine demolition, but since Councillor Jackson is here, uh, maybe he can speak to it if he needs to. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Boy, that was a seven hour wait to get rid of a dilapidated house in the ward. But thank you, Councillor Danko. Thank you, Councillor Spatafora. Thank you, Chair Wilson. Yes, um, this uh, just quickly to say the neighborhood, I've met with the community recently before Christmas. This has been a vacant home for over six years, three ownership changes. Plan of subdivision just recently submitted. The neighborhood is tired of this location at 820 Rymel East being a haven for vandalism, loitering, and damage. And so they just want peace of mind and the safety of the community. And the owners have requested through me, working with staff, to bring this motion forward, hoping with your support we can get on with demolishing this building in advance of the subdivision plan. Thank you, Chair Wilson. Thank you, Councillor Danko. And thank you, Councillor Spatafora. I was just part of our evil plan to get you to stay with us for a while. Um, Councillor Denko, um, are, are you seeking to waive the rules on behalf of Councillor Jackson? Yes, my apologies. I, I believe that is the procedure. Yep. My, my apologies. I should have sought clarity on that. So uh, before we can consider uh, the request to issue the permit, we have to waive the rules because it was it's outside the, the notice period. So if we could get, um, uh, if you could vote on that, yay or nay, to allow for the rules to be waived. Technically, we need a reason for waiving the rules as well, and I'll just state that is because this is a, a vacant home and it's in danger of uh, people uh, accessing the property and also fire danger. So thank you for the pleasure of my members. I, if you do uh, seek to waive the rules, I, I will be asking you in the future, uh, what's the rationale? Uh, so thank you for providing that. Councillor Pauls, are you in favor of waiving the rules? Thumb up or thumb down, please. Could you indicate with your thumb? Okay, you got it? Okay, thank you. Yep, received. It's thinking. 
survey says. Can we, um, can we do? Okay, this is a vote on the waiving of the rules. Thank you. That carries 10 to nothing. And on the motion itself to, um, on the motion itself. Thank you, that carries 10 to nothing. Sincere thanks, Chair Wilson and com committee members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. We're on to 14, uh, general manager's update and slash other business. GM Thorne, and uh, if I could, do you, do you have an update to provide? Because I know um, my long preamble is, I know that Councillor Kretsch has another um, uh, meeting in about seven minutes, and he would like to ask his questions in advance of his departure. Could Through you? the chair, I'm happy to go to the question first. I just have one other quick update, but I'm happy to go to the councillor's question first and then come back. I really appreciate that, thank you. Uh, for folks, this is if you have some questions that you'd like to pose in public session, an update or seeking further information for a future meeting, this is the time to do it. So, Councillor Critch. I'm going to try and uh, say a bunch of stuff, and at the end, you could just say yes or no, and that way we'll save you from having to say anything at all. So could you just confirm that I have this right? So in December, um, there was a city council meeting on December 7th. On December 8th, um, there was a committee of adjustment meeting um, where there was a property heard on uh, Hunter Charlton Avenue West. Um, long story short, um, what happened was... Uh, the recommendation for the committee of adjustment was accepted. And in the world of appeals, um, the clock starts ticking on December 8th, and there are now 20 days left to uh, make an appeal. And those appeals, of course, have to go through the process that everything else would go through, right? They come through the planning committee, go to city council, council would ratify the appeal, legal staff would, would take um, the appeal. So far, am I on the right track? Okay, I can nod. So those 20 days. Well, let's do the math for fun, right? December 8th plus 20 days is December 28th. But ahoy, the city shuts on December 23rd, and there are no council meetings between December 7th, the day before the committee adjustment, until January 25th. So now we're actually in a situation where it's impossible based on the city's own calendar for us to appeal any decision that came forward on December 8th at the Committee of Adjustments. We put ourselves in a, a temporal, not to be too Star Trek about it, but we put ourselves in a real temporal incursion here. And so I just want to confirm that that's true, that that's you're also your understanding. GM Thorne. Uh, yes, through the chair, I can't confirm you have all the exact dates, but the principle of what you're saying, yes, is true, that there are there, there is a time limit in terms of how many days before you can appeal, appeal a committee of adjustment decision, and if and uh, in this case, there was not a council meeting within that time frame. Uh, I would just note that the, the, the thing that's new here um, is that with the recent provincial legislative changes, there are no third-party appeals, so, so residents are not able to appeal a committee of adjustment decision. Righto, thank you. Councillor Kretsch? Right, so thank you for confirming that. I just want to say that on the record because I think I'll be wanting to speak at council um, and Cameron get some legal advice about this conundrum we found ourselves in because we are in a bit of a conundrum where we've set ourselves up so that none of the decisions that were made that day could possibly be appealed. Um, not great. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, uh, GM Thorne. Thank you. Is that the, uh, yep, okay. Thank you. So we're back. Uh, thank you, GM Thorne, to general manager's update. 
Yes, through you, Madam Chair, I do have just uh, two quick items. Uh, first, uh, a, a staffing item. I just want to sort of welcome and congratulate three staff who've taken on uh, new roles in the department. One of them is here. Uh, Anita Fayback has taken on the role of Director of Development Planning in the Planning Division. Uh, Ken Coit, the Director of Heritage and Urban Design in the Planning Division. And uh, Binu Kora, uh, who was here earlier but has had to leave, uh, Director of Development Engineering in the Growth Management Division. So I just want to welcome and congratulate those uh, three folks who we've been lucky to have with the team for, for a number of years now. And uh, and also in these new roles. Um, and then one other update, and Council will be aware of this, a communication did go out earlier, but uh, just, just to remind you and remind the public, we did have some process changes that kicked in as of January 1st. Uh, I won't go through the details of those. We presented the details uh, uh, a couple of months ago, but in order to meet the new uh, very significantly reduced approval timelines contained within Bill 109, uh, staff did uh, present to Council on some process changes, some new fees that, and structures that would take place and kick in as of January 1st. So those are now in effect. Um, the province has messaged that it's their intention to extend the deadline for having to issue fee refunds until July the 1st, um, although that's not yet changed. So uh, what we have done is we have implemented as of January 1st as directed by Council, so that is now in effect. Um, you will start to see some uh, of the any rezoning that comes in after January 1st. We will be endeavouring to meet those new timelines, uh, and so we will be able to speak to that when those come forward in terms of what timelines were achieved. We'll be monitoring that over the six months, next six months to make sure that we are meeting those timelines. Um, and you may start to see, as was mentioned earlier, some more applications coming forward, uh, potentially for denial, uh, potentially for approval withholding provisions, um, as discussed previously. You, you may start to see more of the zoning applications coming forward on that basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for GM Thorne? I see none. Thank you very much, and uh, please extend our congratulations and thanks to those members who are um, of your of your team who are uh, who, have, who have earned those positions. Thank you. Um, may I have a mover and a seconder to move into closed session respecting items 15.1 and 15.2 pursuant to section 9.3 subsections E, F, and K of the city's procedural bylaw 21-021 as amended. We usually have a motion to accept oh. the general manager's update. Sorry, beg your pardon. I'm not going to reread that, but could we have a motion to, to accept it? Councillor Wilson and Councillor Spadafora, thank you. Yes, thank you. You can uh, vote on receiving the general manager's update. Thank you. Councillor Pauls, can you vote on the general manager's? Um... Yep, thank you very much. Okay, nine to zero. And as I was uh, saying earlier, we are moving into closed session. Um, I referenced the subsections of the procedural bylaw and the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matter pertains to litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the, the municipality or local board, advice that is subject to solicitor solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, and a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried out or to be carried out by or on behalf of the municipality um, or local vote. Uh, can we have a vote on going into close to, no? What? Oh, yes. Uh, boy, I really forgot that. Okay, we're going into closed session. Moved by Councillor Tattison, seconded by Councillor Spadafora, please. Yes, 
nine to nothing. Thank you. Members of the public, the meeting will continue following the closed session portion of the meeting. When you see the members of the committee rejoin the meeting, the committee will wait up to five minutes upon reconvening in open session before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and the media time to return. We are.
Thank you, members, members of the public. Still the planning committee meeting of January the 17th, 2023. We're back in open session. Uh, may have a, we're on 15. Point one, appeal to the OLT for lack of decision on zoning bylaw amendment ZAC 22-025 for lands located at 1019 Wilson Street West. That is report LS21023A. Um, it is moved by Councillor Kazar and seconded by Councillor Danko. Um, that A, the closed session recommendations A and B to confidential report LS21023 A be approved and remain confidential until made public at, as the city's position before the OLT and B that the balance of the confidential report remain confidential. Please indicate your vote. Councillor Francis is a thumbs up. Bye. Carried 10 to zero, thank you. Moving on to 15.2, appeal to the OLT for OPA amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications for lands located at 405 James Street North. That is report LS23012. It is moved by Councillor Kretsch, seconded by Councillor Kazar, that the directions of two staff in closed session respecting report LS23012 be released to the public following approval by Council and B that the balance of the report remain confidential. Please indicate your vote. Thumbs up from Councillor Francis. Yes, mine's not. Thank you, carries 10 to zero, thank you. Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Francis that we are adjourned for the day. Thank you very much. If you could vote. While you're voting, I'd like to thank all the staff who assisted this uh, council in its deliberations, which were rich and deep and good. And thank you to members. And particular thanks to Elsie Kelsey and to Elsie Bates. Thank you. Except for me. Now go home. <laughs>